Right, Nana. Hello, friends. So, welcome back. Uh, decision making revision. We are already done with it. Now, let's go with transfer pricing. Okay. We're gonna look into some concepts. Uh, Fata fat. We'll just brush it up, and after that, we'll do some problems as well. Okay. Uh, so, because it's a super rapid revision, so we're gonna do things at a very good space. So, this is purely for rapid revision. Okay. So, keep that in mind before we proceed with the session. Okay. Chalo. Now, coming on to transfer pricing. First of all, let's uh, look into the history of it. Earlier, there used to be a centralized way of doing business, which means everything is basically decided by head office. Therefore, uh, uh, you know, branches, departments, divisions, these guys, they just need to follow the orders, whatever the head office says. So because of this, what used to happen was uh, there was no motivation for the managers because most of the managers were inefficient. Why? Because they just need to follow the orders and they can't take their own independent decisions. Uh, so they don't get anything extra, whether they do the work or they don't do the work. Anyway, in both the cases, they'll be getting the same salary. In that case, uh, so whether you work efficiently or inefficiently, if you're going to get the same money, same pay, same salary, there will be motivation for you, obviously, right? Of course, there will be few people because of ethical concerns, they'll do it irrespective of the salary that you pay. But majority of the people aren't like that. So they don't have motivation. And this was hurting the profits of the company. Okay. And for this problem, the solution was decentralization where head office says that, see, it's okay. Hereafter, I'm not going to involve in your day-to-day -day activities, which means the technical word for that is I'm going to give you divisional autonomy. Divisional autonomy means giving them independent powers, almost like an individual company. Okay. So where I'm not going to involve in your day-to-day -day activities, rather you are given independence to take your own decisions or able to understand what head office will do is. We will just measure your performance based on some parameters that can be profit, that parameter can be sales, that parameter can be cost. Like I'll give you standard cost and your actual cost will be compared with standard cost and accordingly your performance will be measured. So the parameter can be anything or you able to understand. So we'll give you one parameter, whether it is profit or sales in this example, which I've told you, who will give that head office. And accordingly, if the performance is good, then bonus or incentives are given. This bonus or incentives or the motivation for the divisional managers to perform efficiently. Is that clear? This leads to a concept called transfer pricing. Now you can ask me, how can this lead to a concept called transfer pricing? Because the logic is very simple. If you have a supply and division over here, supply and division is not going to sell anything to the external market. It just buys from the supplier and transfers that to the receiving division. In that case, if you want to measure supply and division performance based on profit, now the question is, where is the question of profit for supply and division? Because receiving division sells to the outside market. So there will be sales for receiving division. There will be cost for receiving division. So you'll be able to calculate profit. But for supply and division, where is the question of calculating profit? Because there is no sales as such. It is just transferring its uh, output to the receiving division, which is within the company. Therefore, now what you say, with the help of transfer pricing, which is nothing but kind of a selling price for supply and division, you're going to transfer your output to the receiving division, not at cost, but at a selling price, which is nothing but TP. Now, because of the concept of TP, supply and division will get something called sales and it will have its own cost and you'll be able to calculate profit, which means you'll be able to measure the performance and everything holds good or able to understand. So that's the whole concept. So there will be two divisions, supplying and receiving. Supply and division will sell its output to receiving division at a price called transfer price. This transfer price is revenue for the supply and division and the same transfer price is cost for receiving division. You got the point. So the price at which intermediate product of supply and division will be sold to receiving or purchasing division is called transfer price. This division can be called as receiving or it can also be called as purchasing division. You got the point. So that's the thing. So let's move on to the next one. Examples of interdivisional transfers. Normally we feel that uh, when this so-called interdivisional transfer is happening between supply and division and receiving division, we always feel that only goods will be transferred internally. But you need to understand that it is not just goods. Okay. It is not just goods. It can be what Nana services as well. Apart from services, it can be intangibles, which can be like patent, know-how, royalty. It can be interdivisional loans as well. But when it comes to our syllabus, we have only goods and services. We don't have intangibles as well as interdivisional loans. But you guys need to have an idea. Okay. These are all the possibilities of interdivisional transfer. So just keep that in mind. That should be fine. Right. After that, what else we have got? Utility of transfer pricing. Okay. Utility of transfer pricing. So what do you mean by that, sir? 
ultimately what are the uses of transfer pricing that's what we're gonna see now the first utility of transfer pricing is performance evaluation of course because of tp only you are going to have something called selling price for supply and division because of that you're gonna have you're gonna I mean, it's going to be possible to calculate profit for supply and division and therefore you are able to evaluate the performance. So, performance evaluation is obviously the first and most utility of transfer pricing, right? That's the main use of transfer pricing. Apart from that, because you're going to pay bonus to your employees, they're going to be engaged more because the compensation has got increased. Therefore, employee engagement will be better. Resource allocation also will be better because now there will be more cooperation between the supply and division and the receiving division. As a result, uh, optimum allocation of resources will happen which means they will use the resources in the best possible way with minimum wastage and apart from that of course you have got taxation and profit remittance are also utilities of transfer pricing what do you mean by that see very simple uh, yeah here let's say in us you have a head office in uk you have one substrate in india you have another substrate in UK, the tax rate is 40%. In India, the tax rate is 30%. Let's say the UK subsidy is supply division and Indian subsidy is purchasing division. Now, in the interest of the group as a whole, you would like your transfer price to be high or low? Well, the answer is, as a group, you want to pay less taxes. So, if your UK subsidy earns more, you have to pay 40% out of it. Whereas, Indian subsidy, if it earns profit, you'll pay only 30%. So from the group point of view, you would like to have Indian subsidy earn more because eventually you will pay only 30%. Indian subsidy is a purchasing division, which means purchasing division buys the intermediate product. So which means the buying cost has to be less in order to have more profit at Indian subsidy. That buying cost has to be less means the TP has to be less. Therefore, eventually the TP should be low. So here what we are doing, we are utilizing transfer pricing for taxation issues as well. So that's why it is called one of the utility of transfer pricing. So basically what happens? As a group, you want your tax payment to be less. Tax rate in India is less. Therefore, Indian subsidy should, should earn more profit. Because Indian subsidy is a purchasing division. Purchasing division always tries to buy the intermediate product. So the intermediate product price has to be less, which means TP has to be less. Therefore, TP has to be low, right? The last utility of transfer pricing is profit remittance. So what do you mean by profit remittance? You can call it as profit remittance or profit repatriation. Means say, for example, let's say you have KFC. Uh, we've got a lot of branches of KFC in India, right? All the profit that they, you're going to earn, they want to send it back to their mother country. That is US in this case, right? So sending your profit back to your mother country is nothing but we call it as profit repatriation. Now, so how transfer pricing will help you when it comes to profit repatriation? Let's try to understand that. Now, let's say you've got US where the head office of uh, KFC is there and you've got two main branches of KFC. Let's say one is China, the other one is India. Whatever the profits that KFC earns from China, it's very easy, say for example, for them to transfer it back to US. Now, don't find logics over here. I'm just trying to give you an example, okay? Whereas, if at all the KFC earns a lot of profit in India, then uh, it's very strict. I mean, the rules related to profit repatriation are very, very strict in India so that it becomes relatively difficult for the KFC management to repatriate the profit from India to US. So, they know that profit repatriation from China to US is easier when compared to profit repatriation of India to US. Therefore, they want the Chinese subsidy to earn more. And let's presume that Chinese subsidy is supply and division and Indian subsidy is purchasing division. They want Chinese subsidy to earn more profit because so that they can repatriate the profit easily to US, which means Chinese subsidy is a supply and division. Therefore, they want TP to be high so that the revenue for supply and division, that is Chinese subsidy division will be high and therefore they will earn more profit and therefore, from China, they will easily repatriate the profit to US. Are you able to understand? So, in this case, TP needs to be high or low? TP has to be high. So that the revenue for Chinese subsidy will be high because TP is revenue for the supply division and the profit of Chinese subsidy will be high. And therefore, once they have earned very good amount of profit because the repatriation rules are not strict, easily from Chinese subsidy, it will be transferred to what? US. That is the mother country. Got it? So, those are all the, you know, concepts of utility of transfer pricing so that we are done with it now let's move on 
Now, next one, what we're going to see is transfer pricing methods. There are basically three transfer pricing methods over here. One is market based, cost based. The other one is negotiation based. Uh, under cost based, again, you have got marginal cost based, standard cost based, full cost, as well as cost plus markup. Okay, right. First, let's look into market based transfer price, which means if your transfer price is equal to the market price, what will happen? What are the pluses? What are the minuses? Okay. The plus point is, first of all, if your TP is equal to market price, then it is unbiased. Why? There's no biasedness. Why? Because this transfer price is determined by the market forces of demand and supply. Therefore, there is no question of biasedness. So you will not be favoring somebody. You will not be, uh, you know, uh, unfair to somebody or you able to understand. So it will be equal. It will be fair to everybody because it is determined by market forces. This is the first advantage, right? If you fix your TP based on market price. Second, there is no ambiguity, no confusion because market price is visible to everybody. So there is no confusion whatsoever. If you fix your TP based on market price, right? Third, market price is competitive. So performance of individual divisional managers can be improved. How? Well, the logic is very simple. Suppose you have got supply and division and you have got receiving division. Supply and division has fixed TP of 15 rupees for its intermediate product, which receiving division is buying right now. Whereas there is an external vendor who tries to sell the same product that supply and division transfers to receiving division at a price of 12 itself. Then what will happen? Receiving division will stop buying from supply and division and it will start buying from the external vendor at 12 rupees. Now, supply and division cannot transfer at 15 rupees to receiving division. Neither it can sell outside as well because in outside the market price is 12. So nobody will buy from supply and division at 15. So in that case, what is the only choice that is left for supply and division? It has to increase its efficiency. Are you able to understand? Now supply and division is made competitive. Now supply and division has to compete with the external vendor. And it has to eventually, presuming that the quality of the product is same, eventually transfer to R at a price of 12 only because there is no other way. So which means if you fix your TP based on market price, then performance of the individual division managers can be improved in case they are inefficient. In our example, you have supply division and receiving division because supply division is transferring at a price of 15 because in the market it is available at 12. Therefore, supply and division is inefficient. Therefore, their performance will increase if you fix TP based on market price, which is 12. If you fix your TP based on market price, which is 12. In that case, eventually what will happen? Supply and division has to transfer at 12 itself. But it wants 15, which means it will not earn sufficient profit. Therefore, ultimately it will concentrate on its cost. It will try to reduce its cost, which means it becomes efficient. That's the logic. Anyways. Now coming on to negative points. First of all, we said here in the positive point that market price is, uh, I mean, if you fix your TP based on market price, it is completely unbiased, but that's, that need not be the case. Sometimes it can be completely biased, even market price. How? When there is predatory pricing, where you try to price your product less than your total cost, which an intention to kill your competition, that is predatory pricing. You try to price your total, uh, I mean, you try to price your product less than the total cost with an intention to kill your competition. In that case, if you take that particular market price as a TP, it will be biased. Price discrimination. Sometimes for uh, soldiers, you will try to sell it at a different price. For senior, senior citizens, you will try to sell it at a different price. For uh, women, sometimes you try to sell it at different price. You cannot consider those market prices because they are discriminated, right? That will not give you fair TP. You got the point? So you cannot fix your TP based on such kind of discriminated market price. Are you able to get me? Next. Sometimes your market price can fluctuate widely and frequently. Uh, morning 20, evening 22 rupees, next day 25, something like this. Now, which market price will you take? Now, that's again a confusion. So that can be a negative point sometimes. If your market price keeps on fluctuating widely and frequently, in that case, you'll be pretty much confused to take which TP, I mean, to fix which TP as your market price, sorry to fix which market price as your TP. Got the point? And finally, for some intermediate products, market price may not be available at all. You are manufacturing an intermediate product, which is unique in the entire country itself. And there is no market for that intermediate product, but that intermediate product can be converted into a final product by the receiving division. And for that, there is a market. Now for, for the intermediate product, which is very unique, which is manufactured by only your company, if it is unique, where is the question of finding a market price for that? 
So if there is no market price, how can you fix your TP? If the TP is based on market price, it doesn't work. So all these are negative points and all these are positive points if you fix your TP based on market price. Got the point? I hope this is clear. Right. Next, very, very, very important thing. Now, many students are getting confused with respect to this particular concept because maximum minimum TP, almost like 50 to 60% of the problems in your TP chapter is based on this only. And for your kind information, if you can learn this, you can fix maximum minimum TP for any problem. Sir, is it that simple? Just half a page? Not even half a page. One fourth of the page? Yes, it is that simple. Once I finish it off, you'll understand. How to fix minimum and maximum TP in any situation? This attempt, we are actually expecting minimum and maximum TP to come in the examination because last time uh, the question was asked based on international transfer pricing. So we are expecting that to come. Anyways, well, the answer is very simple. If you want to fix your minimum TP, you should always think from supply and divisions point of view. Every sentence that I've written here is very important. You will not find these things in books. Therefore, try to understand this carefully. If you want to fix your minimum TP, you should always think from supply and divisions point of view. Why? Because supply and division is the one who has spent the money to manufacture that particular product. Therefore, you need to ensure that supply and division gets more than what it has spent. Suppose it has spent 10, your TP should be minimum more than 10. Suppose it has spent 20, your TP should be minimum more than 20. Are you able to understand? So therefore, minimum TP is nothing but whatever the money that supply and division has spent. Got the point? Maximum TP means you need to think from receiving division's point of view. Why? Because Purchasing division or receiving division is the one who is going to buy. So we must ensure that the receiving division has got sufficient money to buy. For example, the receiving division has got only 100 rupees in its pockets. You cannot fix TP as 120, then it cannot buy because it does not have the capability to buy. Sometimes, let's say a receiving division has got 120 rupees in its pockets and you have fixed TP as 120, but outside from an external vendor, it is available at 110 then receiving division will pay maximum 110 only. Why? Because it can be bought at the same price from 110, I mean from the external vendor. In that case, even if you fix TP at 120, it's not going to work, which means when it comes to maximum TP, it is the money that receiving division possess or the external buying price, whichever is less will be your maximum TP. How much money that receiving division has got? Let's say it is 140 or Outside from vendor, it is available at 120. In that case, 120 will be your maximum TP. Are you able to understand? Suppose the money that receiving division possesses is 160 and outside vendor, it is available at 180. Now, supply division cannot say I can fix maximum TP as 180 because it can come out with a logic saying that outside it is available at 180 so that I'm also keeping TP as 180. Then receiving division will say, yes, outside it is available at 180. I can accept that, but I've got only 160 with me right now. Even, even if I want to, I don't have money. I have only 160 with me. What can I do? Maximum I can pay 160. Then maximum TP will be 160 only. Therefore, the money that receiving division possess or the external buying price, whichever is less, is nothing but your maximum TP. Okay, so very simple. That's it. We are done with everything. If you can understand this logic clearly, you can solve any problem in this entire chapter. So always remember, this is very important. Every single sentence is important. You got to think like that only. In any problem, if you have been asked to fix minimum TP or maximum TP, what do you have to think? Okay, fine. Minimum TP means we should think from supply and division's point of view. Whatever the money that supply and division has spent, our TP should be more than that. There it's a matter. Done. That's it. Now coming on to maximum TP. Okay, I need to think from receiving division's point of view. How much is the money that receiving division has got? Below that, I need to fix TP. Only then he will buy. Or how much is the money that receiving division has got or external buying price? Whichever is less. Got it? So finally, this is the essence of the transfer pricing concept. Minimum TP is nothing but cost that has been spent by the supply division. Maximum TP is nothing but money that receiving division possess or external buying price, whichever is less. You got the point? Yeah. So the concept remains the same only. I'm just trying to improvise it a bit here. Minimum TP is equal to Total relevant cost of the supply division. I already told you minimum TP is nothing but cost spent by the supply division. That cost can be relevant cost. Relevant cost means what? Sometimes it can be variable cost plus opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is also cost. Na? Opportunity cost is also cost. So ultimately, what is the concept I've told you? Minimum TP is nothing but total cost for the supply division. Now, total cost for the supply division can be either variable cost or marginal cost or variable cost plus opportunity cost. Plus, it can be fixed cost also. Marginal cost means that is the logic over here. 
When fixed cost is also changing, we'll call it as marginal cost or you will understand. When fixed cost is not changing, only variable cost is changing, then also we can call it as marginal cost, but then marginal cost will be nothing but variable cost or you will understand. Which means the logic that you have to understand here is any cost that changes will come out of this. Normally variable cost will be changing. If fixed cost also changes, that also you have to add here. Plus opportunity cost, if there is any opportunity cost. I hope you guys know the concept of opportunity cost. The benefit that you're going to foregone from a lost opportunity is nothing but opportunity cost. So minimum TP is nothing but total relevant cost of the supply and division, which usually is either variable cost or variable cost plus opportunity cost. Are you able to understand? Pretty simple. Maximum TP, I hope I've explained you the concept already. NMR. NMR is nothing but the money that receiving division possess. Net marginal revenue is nothing but the money that receiving division possess. Now you can ask me, how is that, sir? Very simple, Nana. Suppose receiving division sells its product at 120 rupees in the outside market. It spends its own cost. That is the own cost of the receiving division is nothing but we call it as further processing cost as 80. Then how much is the money that receiving division possess? 120 minus 80, 40. 40 is the money that it has got to buy from the supply division. This 40 is nothing but NMR. Are you able to understand? Because the selling price of 120 is called as revenue. That is R. This is called as cost. Revenue minus cost is nothing but net revenue. Are you able to understand? Revenue minus cost is nothing but net revenue. You got the point? And incremental net revenue is nothing but net marginal revenue. Marginal revenue means incremental, additional. So that's why it is called as NMR. Simply what you have to understand, NMR is nothing but money that receiving division possess there in some matter. Right or external buying price, whichever is less. I hope I have explained you the concept already. So this is it, guys. If you can remember this, all the problems you can fix your minimum TP as well as maximum TP. There ends the matter. Chalo. Now let's move on to the next one. Different types of centers. Okay. Normally, I think uh, this will be covered in a different chapter, but this is the right uh, time to cover this particular concept. What are the different types of centers? We have cost center, profit center, revenue center, and investment center. What do you mean by this, sir? If you have a division, a supply and division as well as a receiving division, how can you treat that particular division? For example, of course, we are going for decentralization, divisional autonomy only. There are different types of divisional autonomy. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm going to give powers to the individual departments. Yes, there is no doubt in that. In that, there are different types of powers. Extreme power like investment center, relatively less power like cost center. So what is that? Let's try to understand. If you treat a particular division as cost center, it means that that division has got power with respect to cost means it can take decisions with respect to cost and it is responsible to the extent of cost only. How will you measure the performance of such a kind of a division? I'll give it standard cost and I'll see what is the actual cost being incurred and actual cost will be compared with standard cost and accordingly variance will be calculated and accordingly performance will be measured accordingly bonus will be given. Can you give any examples for those divisions treated as cost center? Yes, the example is purchasing division. Or you can also call it as procurement division. Purchasing division or procurement division. Got it? That's the example for cost center. Profit center means you are responsible to the extent of profit, which is nothing but indirectly you're responsible for sales as well as cost because both of them will influence profit. And you have power with respect to sales as well as cost as well, because both of them will influence profit. Okay. And your performance will be measured based on target profit. Generally, most of the production departments will be profit centers. Most of them. Most of the production departments will be profit centers. And finally, revenue center, same logic. Your power will be restricted to the, to the extent of sales or revenue. And you're responsible to the extent of sales or revenue as well. And your performance will be measured based on sales targets. Like for example, I'll give you a target of 1 lakh sales per quarter or 1 lakh sales per month or whatever it is. If you achieve that, you'll get bonus. If you don't achieve that, you don't get bonus. As simple as that. Okay. Examples or uh, sales department, marketing department. Generally, they, they will be treated as a revenue center and their targets will be given based on sales, sales turnover only. Okay. And finally, you have something called investment center, which is an extreme form of decentralization. Means maximum power will be given. Are you able to understand? You have power with respect to profit, some capital budgeting decisions as well. And your performance will be measured based on ROI. Now, the biggest question is when a particular division will be treated as an investment center. Well, the logic is very simple. Let's say in US, there is a holding company and they have a subsidiary in Hyderabad in India. 
they do not know about the realities of the substry or the local challenges the kind of market the kind of people here in hyderabad to do their business therefore what the holding company in us does it does is that it feels that we need to give extreme power to the head or the manager or divisional head of the substry such that they'll be able to do business well in hyderabad because we are totally have no idea with respect to what the local challenges in hyderabad are in that case i will treat this particular substry as an investment center where i'll give him power to take some capital budgeting decisions as well and i'll measure his performance based on return on investment so this is a kind of typical example where a particular division or a substry or a branch can be treated as an investment center you got the point so that's the concept guys this is very important how the case studies can come is that say for example in a question he can give you a particular department and he can say that this particular department is treated as a profit center and now it has been decided to convert that into cost center these are all the reasons give your opinion like that he can ask you a question and then you have to give your opinion whether the decision to convert that particular division from profit to cost center is justified or not with your reasons are you able to understand like this he can ask you interpretation based kind of a questions that's why you need to know the logic are you able to understand i hope this is clear yes right fantastic now let's look into the concept of relevant cost already have uh, i have discussed this relevant cost concept as part and parcel of decision making division as well but one more time we'll see so based on decision making we can classify cost into two relevant irrelevant relevant means you consider it while taking decision irrelevant means you ignore it while taking decision for example variable cost is always relevant because it changes explicit cost means where there will be real cash payment like salary electricity that will be what relevant cost are you able to understand uh then uh, what else yeah let's get to opportunity cost you know what is opportunity cost right benefit foregone from a lost opportunity that is relevant cost or irrelevant cost relevant cost okay then uh what else yeah sunk cost where is it yeah here it is sunk cost will be relevant cost or irrelevant cost irrelevant cost i hope you guys know what is sunk cost historical cost a cost which has already been incurred is sunk cost correct so we are aware of that as well remind you guys can just uh, read these examples yourself once you have got my power notes hot copy you can just read this you uh, know examples yourself or you will understand chalo so sunk cost is nothing but historical cost or cost already incurred okay now let's move on to the next concept that is key factor or limiting factor or critical factor i told you that uh, when decision making revision was being done i told you that i'll cover this as part and parcel of transfer pricing and now we are covering it over here so what is this key factor or limiting factor or critical factor okay let's try to understand this first anything that has the ability to limit your production we call it as key factor or limiting factor or critical factor in other words to put it very simple scarce resources that's it raw metal availability is limited machinery's availability is limited laborers availability is limited is nothing but critical factor or, lim or limiting factor which is nothing but we can also call that as bottleneck which is nothing but we can also call it as bottleneck there is no doubt in that are you able to understand how to apply this particular concept well very simple let's take an example over here a b c selling price is given variable cost is given if you look at the contribution per unit and if you take your decision based on contribution per unit you will prefer a first followed by b and followed by c correct ah but let's presume that raw metal is a limiting factor and look at the situation over here a consumes 2 kg of raw metal b consumes 1 kg of raw metal and c consumes 0.5 kg of raw metal in this case let us see what happens now let's find out contribution per unit of raw metal 40 by 2 30 by 1 20 by 0.5 and you can see contribution per raw metal is 20 30 and 40 and the ranking has exactly become opposite c has got the first rank a has got the last rank why because even though a is giving you contribution of 40 it is consuming 2 kg therefore per kg it is giving only 20 even though c is giving you a contribution of 20 it is consuming only 0.5 kg which means for 2 kg equivalent over here it will earn how much four times that of a correct almost 80 that's why here contribution per raw metal when compared to a it is double over here or you will understand can you see that yeah so for 1 kg it will be 40 for 2 kg you can say it will be 
or you will understand so double to that of what a earns so therefore c has got the first rank so what you guys need to understand here from this example is that whenever you have a limiting factor in this case it is raw metal you should never ever take decision based on contribution per unit rather you should take decision based on contribution per limiting factor in this case it is contribution per raw material it can be contribution per labor or it can be contribution per machine hour. So that is the summary what i've given <coughs> if there is no limiting factor no scarce resources raw metal labor hours you know machine hours, everything availability is very good then you take decision based on contribution per unit that will give you maximum profit because most of the times question will ask you what should i do to earn maximum profit that's what question will ask you if there is limiting factor then take decision based on contribution per limiting factor this will give you maximum profit are you able to understand if there is no limiting factor take decision based on contribution per unit that will give you maximum profit if there is limiting factor take decision based on contribution per limiting factor that will give you maximum profit that is the summary that's it if you remember these two sentences it's done and dusted are you able to understand all right and all of you yes right nana so i hope this is clear right okay only just these two sentences you got to remember that's more than enough right buddies so we'll wind up the session over here in the next session hardly there are uh, one or two concepts that is left over we'll cover that and then we'll go for problems fatafat within one one hour 15 minutes we'll finish off as many problems as possible for revision from this transfer rising chapter you got it and then we'll go for next chapter revision right guys thank you so much bye bye uh, stay tuned to our youtube channel guys revision classes are going to get uploaded you better subscribe to it and uh, if you can share the videos and help the other students as well that would be great from my side right guys thank you so much bye bye right friends uh, so welcome back i think this is where we have left in the last session right so uh, the summary of the limiting factor concept the summary of the limiting factor concept is where we have left in the last session right now let's move on to the next concept that is make or buy decisions okay so what we'll do now is that we'll finish off the remaining concepts and then we'll get into solving sums uh, because it's a rapid revision we need to solve as many sums as possible uh, in a in a time span of one hour or you will understand one hour one hour 15 minutes that's what we are going to plan anyways so look at this make or buy decision how to take a make or buy decision very simple you always need to compare variable cost of manufacturing with external buying price to take a make or buy decision now always try to keep in mind that uh, why, why am i comparing variable cost of manufacturing with external buying price why because uh, it is based on the presumption that fixed cost is constant it is based on the presumption that fixed cost is constant and fixed cost is irrelevant when it is constant it doesn't change so whether you decide to manufacture or you decide to buy from outside your fixed cost remains what the same therefore it is not relevant for decision making therefore we will ignore it are you able to understand so it's a, it's a simple logic right but suppose suppose fixed cost changes then variable cost of manufacturing plus the fixed cost that is changing should be compared with external buying price and accordingly only decision should be taken this keep it in mind okay now coming on to product a variable cost of manufacturing was 40 external buying price is 35 so your decision will be to buy coming on to b variable cost of manufacturing is 50 external buying price is 65 so your decision will be to make why because making is cheaper here 80 and 90 so 80 is cheaper which means it's better to make or manufacture so 95 percent of the cases your variable cost of manufacturing will be less than external buying price why because external buying price is a selling price for the external vendor so his selling price means he'll have its own his own cost plus profit markup right so definitely your variable cost of manufacturing by using common sense should always be less than the selling price of your external vendor the logic is very simple but sometimes if your variable cost of manufacturing is greater than the selling price of the external vendor which becomes cost for you then it means that you are really pathetic you are uh, absolutely inefficient in manufacturing in that case it's better to buy rather than manufacturing that's how the logic works you got it so here i've given you the start point in about decision making right it is based on the presumption that fixed cost is constant therefore it is irrelevant so which means if fixed cost changes then that should be added here in decision making process and then you compare this with this are you able to get me right sure so with that we are done with the uh, limiting factor and also make or buy now let's get into the concept of indifference point right so what is this indifference point concept this concept is very important for two chapters one is transfer pricing as well as decision making 
decision making revision we have already done it we have brushed up all the concepts so now but as i told you uh, sometimes this will be covered as part and parcel of decision making chapter but i've covered it as part and parcel of transfer rising chapter right anyways now let's try to understand this particular concept what is this concept of indifference point so let's start with the definition first it is a level of sales at which total cost of the two options will be same and also as a result total profit of two options will be same and therefore the person taking decision will be indifferent between both the options will be indifferent between both the options means he will not show any difference like say for example if there is option a and option b he will look at these options in a similar way option a or option b both are nothing but same for him so that's how the logic works now the biggest question here is uh how the person is actually taking decision well the person taking decision will be indifferent between both the options which means he is basically taking decision based on profit say for example there are two options he is looking at the profit of two options and both the options gives him same profit therefore he feels that either option a or option b both are nothing but same for me that's why uh, it becomes indifference point what becomes indifference point that sales level becomes indifference point the sales level at which profit is same please try to keep that in mind right anyways let's look into the definition one more time what are the keywords in the definition it's a sales level that is the first thing you need to remember second of which total cost of two options will be same so it specifically mentioned that it is two options which means you can find indifference point between two options say for example a and b suppose there are three options a b and c can you find indifference point between all the three not possible because specifically it is mentioned in the definition that you can find indifference point between two options so if there are three options eventually what happens is that you need to find indifference point between ab bc and then ac and accordingly you need to take the decision that's the way you need to find indifference point if it is for if it is for more than two options and uh, profit of two options will be same so this is another keyword because i told you that the person taking decision will take his decision based on profit you got the point okay now let's try to go a little bit deeper let's dig deeper into the concept so basically this is how it looks like let's say there are two options option a and option b okay option a sales will be equals to option b sales because it is a level of sales at which total cost of two options will be same so sales is same for both the options total cost is same for both the options naturally profit also will be same so if you dig this further deeper and then you will understand that yes sales is same total cost is also same but total cost is made up of two elements that is variable cost and fixed cost and they are not same for example if you see variable cost of option a is not equals to variable cost of option b and fixed cost of option a is not equals to fixed cost of option b but once you total them up the total cost is equal to both the options which means what basically happens is say for example if variable cost is less for option a then fixed cost will be high if variable cost is high for option b then fixed cost will be less so the set off will happen and thereby eventually the total cost will be same or you will understand that's how the logic works so sales is same total cost is same so profit is also same but variable cost and fixed cost are not equal so how to understand this sir let's try to understand the basics a bit see say for example sir if variable cost is high fixed cost will be less yes if variable cost is less then fixed cost will be high yes sir variable cost and fixed cost both will be high not possible sir variable cost and fixed cost both can be less so not possible why sir why because if you want to reduce your variable cost you need to invest in fixed cost means if you want to reduce your variable cost say for example there is something called capital intensive department in capital intensive department what happens it will be full of machines that's why it is called capital intensive so you've invested a lot of capital so there is a lot of fixed cost and therefore because machines are manufacturing automatically your variable cost will be less because machines will manufacture at a cheaper cost so therefore fixed cost is high and variable cost is less so to reduce your fixed cost you need to invest in uh, sorry to reduce your variable cost you need to invest in fixed cost you need to buy machines invest in fixed cost and then only uh, variable cost of manufacturing per unit will be less similarly if suppose there is a labor intensive department obviously there are no machines so you haven't invested much therefore your fixed cost will be less but as the products are being made by labor automatically the variable cost will be high so therefore what you got to need what you need to understand here is that if you want to reduce your variable cost you need to invest in fixed cost so naturally high fixed cost option will automatically be low variable cost option are you able to get my drift high fixed cost option 
will automatically be low variable cost option because only if you invest in fixed cost your variable cost will be less reduced that's how the logic works you got the point anyways so that's it that's the concept so we have seen the definition we have understood the depth that uh, total cost is same but uh, individual elements of cost is not same that is variable and fixed cost and then we have understood the logics behind the relationship between variable and fixed cost as well but now how to use this particular concept how to apply this particular concept in a sum that we'll try to see so application of idp concept that is indifference point okay let's try to understand that so i've given you stepwise procedure so uh, so that it will be very easy for you to understand so let's start with that step one first you need to estimate your actual sales say for example you want to do a business how much is the sales that you are expecting for example let's say you want to open up a hotel there are two ways of opening up a hotel or a restaurant let's say it's a restaurant okay one is like kfc or mcd you can go for high fixed cost because as you can see in kfc and mcd most of the food is being uh, made by the machines and less of labor or you can go for our traditional or local restaurant type where there will be more of the labor and less of the machines so obviously when you go for kfc type what will happen fixed cost will be high okay and variable cost will be less if you go for kfc kind of uh, you know manufacturing the tiffin or food or whatever it is if you go for our own desi style then fixed cost will be less and variable cost will be high now let's say you want to open up a restaurant and you are confused you don't know which option to go for should i go for heavy machines option or should i go for low machines options like the desi style you are confused the solution for your confusion will be given by indifference point how step one estimate your actual sales let's say you are thinking that 60 lakhs of turnover will happen this particular year you are expecting that much of sales will happen for your restaurant now what you do calculate indifference point sales as second step how to calculate indifference point sales change in fixed cost divided by change in variable cost that's very simple logic right because that's the basic purpose of the whole concept of indifference point there are two options what is the only difference between two options fixed cost is different variable cost is different therefore naturally the formula to calculate indifference point will be change in fixed cost divided by change in variable cost it's pretty simple now what you do in the third step you compare your actual sales with indifference point sales which means the second step sales should be compared with first step sales once you do that there are three possibilities for you what are those three possibilities either your actual expected sales will be less than indifference point sales or your actual expected sales will be equals to indifference point sales or your actual expected sales is greater than indifference point sales so there are three possibilities okay now if your actual expected sales is less than indifference point sales that means that your sales is less because you are selling less that's why you are actual expected sales is less than the difference point sales your market is less so when your market is less when you're trying to sell less number of units and your market is really less you would like to go for that particular option which has got low fixed cost why because already your sales is less if you go for that option which has got high fixed cost then eventually what will happen maybe you might end up in a situation where you may not recover your fixed cost as well so therefore because your sales is less your market is less therefore go for that option which has got low fixed cost so that you will earn more profit or at least earn profit first of all if you go for high fixed cost option in this kind of a scenario you may not even you know reach break even point that is also possible are you getting the logic right now if your actual expected sales is equal to indifference point sales that's fine then your sales level is nothing but indifference point level which means your total cost will be same sales will be same profit will be same so you can choose either of the options because both the options will give you same profit got the point but if your actual expected sales is greater than indifference point sales then it means that your sales is big your market is big right so when your market is big you will go for high fixed cost option why sir well the logic is very simple listen carefully if your sales is big and greater than indifference point sales it means that basically you would have crossed BEP it means that basically you would have crossed BEP so when you have crossed BEP it means that already your fixed cost is recovered correct huh? when you have crossed BEP it means that already your fixed cost is recovered because then only it is BEP right all your cost has to be recovered including fixed cost so once your fixed cost is recovered there are only two types of cost fixed and variable fixed is already recovered so what is left over variable so we'll go for that option which has got low variable cost incidentally low variable cost option is nothing but high fixed cost option therefore go for high fixed cost option that will give you maximum profit that's how the logic works you got this right okay now let's move on to the next one 
The next concept is transurprising methods to resolve performance evaluation conflicts. Sometimes what happens is that there will be a fight between individual divisions and neither of them will come to a, a common acceptable transfer price. They'll keep on fighting. In those kind of situations, head office will involve and they will resolve the transfer pricing conflict which stops or abrupts the interdivisional transfers which is beneficial from the company's point of view but individual divisional managers are not accepting or are not making that happen because of their own selfish interest. Probably it is hurting their division's profit. Are you able to understand? So there is there are two solutions to solve this sort of a transfer pricing conflict. They are dual rate transfer pricing system, other one is two-part transfer pricing system. What is that? Let's try to understand. Dual rate transfer pricing system means there will be two rates. In supply and divisions book, there will be one rate. In receiving division's book, there will be another rate. How is that possible, sir? Very simple. See here. Supply and division in his books, he will put TP is equal to variable cost plus markup. Let's say variable cost is 10 rupees. He will put markup of 2 and he will put in his books that he has sold at a price of 12 to purchasing division. But purchasing division in his books, he will write intermediate product purchase cost is nothing but transfer price, right? For purchasing division. He will write it as 10 rupees only. Sir, how is that possible, sir? How can you write 12? How can you write 10? For this you need to understand the basics of transfer pricing in majority of the case i mean in majority of the cases when it comes to interdivisional transfer the real transfer will not happen it is just a mere book entry or a system entry really supply and division will not receive money really receiving division will not pay money so it's just an understanding they'll just you know put an entry in their system that's it and therefore, this sort of a logic works only when there is real monetary transaction that is happening, then this sort of a logic doesn't work. It seems stupid, right? How can this guy put 12 as revenue? How can this guy put 10 as cost? It doesn't work that way, right? You understand the point? So because the real transaction of money doesn't happen, this works. Are you able to understand? So now supply and division is happy because he has got good revenue. Purchasing division is also very happy. Why? Because he has got it at a lesser cost. So both of them are happy. They'll agree for interdivisional transfers and the company also will be happy. Of course, there is a negative point in this kind of a dual rate transfer pricing system where if you do reconciliation tomorrow, there will be a headache. There will be a confusion that you need to sort it out because of this two different transfer pricing. Got the point? But ultimately, the transfer pricing conflict is resolved and interdivisional transfer will happen between supplying division and purchasing division. This is one point that you have to remember. The other solution to resolve the transfer pricing conflict is two-part transfer pricing system. Now, what is this two-part transfer pricing system? You've got two divisions. One is supplying division. The other one is receiving division. Let's say their total capacity is 50,000 units. Let's say, okay. And external sales is 40,000 units and internal transfer is 10,000 units, which means external and internal sales is happening in the ratio of 4 is to 1. Let's say variable cost is 20 rupees per unit and fixed cost of the supplying division is... 1 lakh. Just a second, Nana. Right, Nana. Let's continue. Okay. Now, so initially, I gave you a small example with a little bit of data so that it will be easy for us to understand this two part transfer pricing system. So, there are two divisions supplying and receiving. The total capacity of the supplying division is 50,000 units. In that, uh, external sales will be 40, internal sales will be 10,000, which means it is in the ratio of 4 is to 1. Variable cost of the supplying division is 20, fixed cost is 1 lakh. Let's, let's put the data this way. Now, the logic behind two-part transfer pricing system, why it is named as two-part is, one part will go for compensating the variable cost incurred by the supplying division. Who will compensate? Receiving division. The other part will go for compensating fixed cost. See, normally, when you fix your TP as variable cost, supplying division will not accept. Why? Because it wants something more than variable cost. Variable cost is something that is incurring, I mean, that is being incurred by the supply division. And if you say that I'll pay the same amount of money, then supply division does not have any motivation to manufacture. Why? Because I incur a variable cost of 10, you pay me 10, then what's the ultimate use of doing all these things? Instead, I can just sit back and watch, you know. So therefore, supply division says that give me something up and above the variable cost so that I can recover my fixed cost to some extent. Are you able to understand? So therefore, two-part transfer pricing system says that there will be two parts in the compensation that receiving division is going to pay to supply division, one part will compensate variable cost, 
the other part will compensate the fixed cost. Now the question is variable cost part is very easy. Okay, 20 rupees is the variable cost incurred by the supply and division. You pay 20 rupees. So this part compensation is very easy. But fixed cost part compensation is not very easy. Why? Because the total fixed cost incurred by one, I mean, by the supply and division is 1 lakh. So will receiving division pay entire 1 lakh? It doesn't work that way. So what receiving division does is that it looks at in this example, there is an external sales to internal sales ratio of 4 is to 1, which means receiving division says you are selling 4 units outside and 1 unit inside. So out of the total fixed cost that you have incurred, recover 4 parts of your fixed cost from the outside sales and one part we will compensate. That's the fair way of doing calculation, right? So fixed cost is 1 lakh, divide the fixed cost in the ratio of external sales and internal sales, which is 4 is to 1, which means 80,000 should be recovered by the supply and division from the external sales and 20,000 will be paid by the receiving division. Therefore, total transfer price is equal to variable cost part compensation plus compensation towards fixed part. How many units are being transferred internally? 10,000 units. Are you able to understand? That's it, right? 10,000 units. So, which means 10,000 into 20 rupees per unit. So, one part which compensates variable cost incurred by the supply and division, that will come to 2 lakhs. And the other part will be towards fixed cost compensation, which came around 20,000 over here. So, 2 lakhs plus 20,000, your total compensation will be 2 lakh 20,000, which includes two parts, 2 lakhs, which is a variable cost part, and 20,000, which is fixed cost part. And this can also be called as lump sum consideration method. Okay. Right, anyways, keep that in mind. This two-part transfer pricing system can also be called as lump sum consideration method. Keep that in mind. Okay, so let's move on. And finally, we have come to the last concept that is international transfer pricing. So with this, we'll be winding up all the concepts. Okay, there is not, nothing much in international transfer pricing. Okay, uh, normally while solving sums only, you'll be able to understand. It's just about, uh, you know, the interest in the group as a whole. Are you able to understand? So, what is the purpose behind international transfer pricing? There has been a lot of MNCs and uh, these multinational companies, they find resources in one country like raw material, they find cheap labor in one country like China for example, they find ease of doing business, China is the example for that, demand for finished goods or products, India is the reason. So, which means they come and establish their business in India, not because of first three points, but because of the fourth point, because in India, if you can manufacture something, you can sell in India itself. You need not look out for external market, but that's not the case in other countries. Okay. So when they try to establish a manufacturing sector, say for example, they, they need to look, again look for outside that particular country where they have established to sell their particular goods. But in India, in India, you don't have that kind of an issue, you know. So therefore, these are all the four reasons why MNCs will establish their business. Once MNCs have established their business because they are in multi countries, you know, uh, they are in multiple countries. So there will be a, a situation called international transfer pricing. And the reason for transfer pricing is two things. One is taxation and profit remittance. I have already discussed about taxation and profit remittance when I was teaching you or when I was revising you utility of transfer pricing. So I, I won't be repeating that part over here because this is a rapid revision. We don't have time, but ultimately this much is enough right now. Okay. Because of this MNCs are establishing their business in multiple countries. And this leads to something called international transfer pricing. That much is enough right now for you. Once we start solving sums in that, you know, we'll try to revise that particular part as well. Are you able to get me? Right, guys. So that's it. We will uh, stop the concepts over here. Its concept is done. Next is decision making. Okay. Uh, decision making revision. I've already brushed up the concepts over here. Now, next, we will go for problems. We'll finish up the problems in one, one hour, 15 minutes. Or able to understand so which means how fast it will go you can imagine but that's the way it works that's what we call it as rapid revision or able to get me right buddies so let's go for problems now let's move on <clears throat> okay guys now we're gonna take the first problem that has been given in transfer pricing here it is so division A uh, produces goods at a cost of 10 per unit and transfers the goods to division B, which has additional cost of 5 per unit. Division B sells externally at uh, 16 per unit. The company has a policy of setting transfer prices at cost plus 20%. Uh, you are required to calculate profit of each division and overall profit the company made and write a brief analysis of the results. Okay. Now this problem is pretty simple. Uh, you just calculate profit for division A, which is given already. Uh, it's cost plus 20%. We get 12. 
minus cost you get your profit and for receiving division also it's very simple already the sales is given in the question which is 16 minus two types of cost one is its own cost which is 5 that is given in the question other one is intermediate product purchase cost which is nothing but the revenue of the supplying division which is 12 and you get your profit so it's a very simple calculation but what is more important for us is the analysis now if you can see the profit of supplying division is 2 and the profit of receiving division is 1 loss. Overall profit of the company is 1 profit, which is positive. Okay, uh, 2 minus 1. Now, so coming on to this particular thing, we have lots of challenges over here, lots of analysis. First thing is, uh, if this uh, setup continues, always division A will earn profit and always division B will face loss. Why? Because you have fixed your TP based on cost plus markup of 20% and therefore, Division A will always make profit no matter what its cost is because cost plus 20%, whatever the cost, ultimately it will earn profit. And this cost plus markup will eventually increase the input cost or intermediate product purchase cost for the receiving division and eventually it will always face losses. Now because of this, there are two problems. One, Division A manager will become careless, he will become lethargic because no matter what his cost is, no matter how efficient he is, no matter whether he takes any steps to reduce the cost or control the cost of his particular division, which is Division A, he will be getting profit in all weather conditions. So therefore, he will become inefficient in that way. Coming on to Division B also, Division B's manager also may become inefficient. Why? Because uh, he will lose his confidence <clears throat> because no matter what, whatever he do always he'll be facing losses therefore what will happen is that he will also stop you know being efficient and that will be a double blow for the company and that will create goal congruence this is problem number one uh, sorry it will create goal conflict second thing is if you look at the internal markup and external markup if you look at the internal markup it is 20 percent which is 20 percent is what is allowed for division a to charge right from division b whereas if you look at the external markup on the finished good that this particular company is selling it is only 6.67%. I hope you know the calculation. Total cost, which is 10 rupees for this division and 5 rupees for this division. Total 15. And the profit that the company is charging is 1 rupee. So 1 by 15 into 100, which is 6.67%. So based on this analysis, we can come to two conclusions. One, either the internal markup is correct or the external markup is correct. If internal markup of 20% is justified, then you revise your external selling price, thereby increase your external markup to 20% as well, then it will be justified. Or if you say your external markup is correct, then revise your internal markup, bring it down to 6.67%. Are you able to understand? Next. Also, we can also do one more analysis. That is, uh, we can allow division B to buy from outside, okay, from an external vendor. Because of this, there are two advantages. If you buy from external vendor, right now division B is buying at a price of 12. So when it buys from external vendor, it can be more than 12 or less than 12. Say for example, it can be 14 or it can be 10. Are you able to understand? Suppose if it is less than 12, that is 10, it means that the division A is inefficient. Are you able to understand? Because in the external markup, the selling price of the external vendor is 10 rupees, whereas division A is charging 12 rupees. In that case, division B will continue to buy from outside at 10 rupees. Thereby, Division A neither can transfer internally because Division B will not buy, nor it can sell externally because externally it is available at 10 rupees. Thereby, Division A has got no other option but to increase its efficiency, up the game, and that is in the interest of the company. So, that's good. Second thing is, suppose the external buying price is 14, then that reflects that Division A is highly efficient. The problem is with Division B. Either Division B is inefficient in managing its own cost or Division B's selling price is very less. These two should be the reasons or able to understand. In that case, division B will either revise its selling price or it will increase its efficiency, thereby reduce its cost and thereby it is again in the interest of the company. So in either of the cases, ultimately the company will get benefited or able to understand. So whether it is, uh, you know, 10 rupees where your external buying price is less than the internal transfer price or 14 rupees where your external buying price is greater than the internal transfer price of 12. Got it? So that's the analysis for the first part of the question. Got it, guys? Chalo, let's move on to the next one. So this is done. All this analysis are also finished. Behavioral consequences also we have covered. Okay, now. So I hope you guys are aware of these transfer raising methods. Okay, there are three. Market-based, cost-based and negotiation-based. Under cost-based, we have again four. Marginal cost, standard cost, full cost and full cost plus markup. We'll see them one by one. Okay, now. <clears throat> Coming on to market-based based transfer price, I hope these you guys can study. So it's not, uh, it is nothing much over here. Okay. 
because you are trying to fix your TP based on market price, uh, it will be unbiased because nobody can influence the same. Okay, that is one point. Second, there is no confusion because the transfer price is nothing but market price and it is clearly available in the market. And because the pricing is competitive, what will happen? Both the divisions will ultimately increase their efficiency, right? Which we have seen in the earlier problem as well. So if you try to fix your TPS market price, then your divisions has to com compulsorily match with the efficiency of the external market. And that's good from company's perspective. So all these are positive points if you fix your TP based on market price. So one is uh, there is no unbiasedness, there will be unbiasedness and uh, there will be less ambiguity, there is no confusion because market price is clearly available. And the third one is your divisional individual divisions performance will increase and it has to compulsorily match with the performance or efficiency of the industry as a whole or market as a whole. And that's good for the company. Now coming on to the disadvantages, we have told that uh, the market price is completely unbiased because it is determined by the market forces of supply and demand. But in all the cases, it need not be completely unbiased. For example, there is a distressed sale market. Okay, there is a predatory pricing situation where you try to reduce your selling price wantedly to kill your competition. That's what we call predatory pricing. In those kind of situations, obviously, your market price, that market price, if you fix as a TP, then it's absolutely wrong. Are you able to understand? So that's a negative point for TP. Also, sometimes market prices can fluctuate widely and quickly. It can fluctuate so much, it can fluctuate fast. In that case, which market price will you take to fix your TP? That's another confusion and that's a problematic scenario. Also, sometimes the kind of intermediate product or the goods that you manufacture will be so unique, will be so special that you are the only one who is manufacturing such a kind of intermediate product in the entire country. So thereby you will not find market at all. So when there is no market for your intermediate product, there is no question of having a market price and thereby what will happen in that particular situation, you cannot fix your TP based on market price because there is no market price available. Why? Because you are the only one manufacturing such a kind of intermediate product. Is that clear? Right. So that's it guys. Okay. Now let's have a look into this particular sum. A manufacturer of cornflakes has two divisions, one producing the cornflakes and another packaging division that manufactures cartons. The production division purchase all the cartons from the packaging division. Cost of cartons from outside vendors would be. So you've got number of cartons and the cost over here. Production cost incurred by the packaging division for similar volume of cartons, 5,000. And uh, you know, this value is also given. And as you can see, the volume, Total cost excluding the cost of cartons means what? This is further processing cost. Okay, which means it is the cost of the receiving division. Okay, receiving division only. Sale value, that is the final sale value of the receiving division is also given. An appropriate transfer pricing policy is being framed as the corporate management accountant. Transfer pricing based on first one, shared profit relative to cost method, second one market price method. And also he has asked you to show profitability of each division under both the methods. And finally discuss the effect of both the methods on the profitability of those divisions. Okay, so let's do this. Right, Nana. So what is that he has asked you? You need to fix TP based on two different methods. Okay, one, one is shared profit related to cost method. So what do you mean by this? You need to share your profit in proportion to the cost. So from this, what you have to understand is that first, I need to calculate total profit for the company as a whole. Once I calculate total profit for the company as a whole and total cost, for the company as a whole as well as the individual divisions then only i can share profit in relation to cost so that will be your step one where you want to calculate the profit of the company as a whole and the total cost of the company as a whole so once you are done with it you can fix your tp based on shared profit relative to cost method and market price method there is nothing much because this is a copy paste that's it you will take the market price you will copy paste it that will be your tp and once you are done with fixation of tp you need to calculate profitability under uh, you know both the methods for both the divisions under two different levels of uh, cartons that is 5000 other one is 8000 so if you can see that's what we have done here calculation of total profit and total cost for the company so first we started with 5000 units revenue there will be no revenue for the supplying division so i have put dash over here and receiving division has got the real revenue that is nothing but total revenue for the company as well and cost both the divisions have got cost at 5000 units level copy paste from the question and I've got total cost because I need this for calculating TP based on shared profit relative to cost method. And I've got profit for the company as a whole. So similar stuff, I have to do it for 8,000 units as well. And I've done it for 8,000 units as well. You got it? Now, if you look at how do I fix TP based on shared profit related to cost method for 5,000 units, TP is equal to variable cost plus share of profit, obviously. 
So you need something up and above variable cost for the supply and division to get motivated to manufacture and internally transfer. So variable cost is 75,000 that is there in the question. Share of profit is nothing but as you can see this is the cost of supply and division which is 75,000 divided by total cost that is 195,000. So that much of proportion how much is your cost proportion that much proportion of the profit you will get share right. So 75,000 is the cost of the supply and division out of the total cost into total profit this much of share of profit he will get. So total TP will be 76,923. Same logic applies for 8,000 units as well. Now can calculation of TP based on market price is very simple. Okay, you just copy paste, copy paste the numbers from the question. So once you are done with calculation of TP, now we need to calculate the profit at both 5,000 units level and 8,000 units level. First, we'll calculate profit based on shared profit related to cost method. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna take the revenue. You know that revenue is nothing but transfer price, correct? For supply and division and receiving division, it is there in the question, copy paste. Reduce cost, you'll have two types of cost for the receiving division, but only one cost for the supply and division. Okay, which is variable cost for the supply and division. But for receiving division, you'll have the TP, which is intermediate product purchase cost. Also, you'll have its own cost, which we call it as further processing cost. And you calculate the profit, got it? Same stuff you follow for 8,000 units and the same way you have calculated for shared profit related to cost method, you can calculate the same for market price method. Is that clear? For 5,000 units as well as 8,000 units. So the calculation will be pretty simple and straightforward. Okay. Now what is most important in this particular question is the second part analysis where you got to discuss the effect of both the methods on the profitability of the division. So this is very important for us. We'll focus on that right now. Okay. Now. So if you can observe all these numbers over here, right, especially look at the profits based on shared profit related to cost method at 5,000 units level, the profit is 1923 and 3077. Correct. Keep this in mind. Now, if you look at market price method also at 5,000 units level, okay, the profit is pretty much same. It is 2000 and 3000. Okay. Here it was 1923 and 3077. So it's exactly the same. No problem whatsoever. But if you look at 8,000 units level, here the profit is 12,308 and 27,692 based on shared profit relative to cost method. Whereas if you look at market price method, it is 15,000 and 25,000. So there is a lot of difference. Are you able to understand why such a difference has happened? So that we need to analyze. Well, if you analyze that, let us look at the analysis. What we have done at 5,000 units, we have calculated the cost of supply and division. Supply and division total cost was 75,000 that was for 5,000 units thereby cost per unit is 15. Whereas at 8,000 units level the supply and division cost is 80,000 and it was for 8,000 units therefore the cost per unit is 10 only. So there was a drop in cost of 33.33% for the supply and division. Whereas when it comes to receiving division its cost at 5,000 units level was 24 per unit and its cost at 8,000 units level was 22.50 which means it has got dropped by only 6.25 percentage. So which means what is happening over here is my supply and division profit has got dropped by one third and my receiving division's profit has got dropped by only 6.25 percent which means at 8,000 units level my proportion of cost of the receiving division is more when compared to supply and division. So therefore when you try to fix TP based on proportion of cost more the proportion of cost more will be your profit share. Therefore receiving division has got more share of profit when compared to the supply division. So ultimately supply division has got punished for saving lot of cost. Are you able to understand? Chalo, have a look into this. You got the logic over here. So that is what has happened here. That is what the explanation this guy has given here. Okay, this whole paragraph. You understand the point? So the logic is very simple. What he tries to explain you is that when you try to share your profit based on shared profit related to cost method. So what will happen is that when supply and division <clears throat> has reduced its cost by one third, that is 33.33%, its cost has got reduced and therefore its proportion of the cost when compared to the total cost proportion has got further reduced. Therefore, it has received lesser share of profit. Therefore, its profit has got reduced, which has come to 12,308 as per 8,000 units. Are you able to understand? Whereas coming on to production division, because it has, its cost has got reduced only by 6.25%, its share out of the total cost, its cost share out of the total cost is more. Therefore, it has received more share of profit. 
and thereby its profit has got increased and that is the reason as per shared profit relative to cost method it is 27000 is the profit for production division and 12000 is the profit for package division versus 15000 and 25000 as per market price method so we will explain this and we will leave it like that we are not going to pass any judgments because that has not been asked in the question now this is very important for you always try to understand when something has not been asked in the question you guys should not give too much of answers and that will irk the examiner and thereby that will give you definitely few loss of marks is that clear i hope that's clear okay chalo let's move on to the next question <clears throat> Let's move on to the next question, guys. So, Division A transfers goods to Division B. Division A incurs a marginal cost of 10 per unit. Division B incurs marginal cost of 5 per unit. Division B sells finished product externally at 20 per unit. To, move, to promote goal congruence, what should be the minimum TP that Division A should charge? Assume there is no external market for this intermediate product. Now, always understand something, Nana. I'll give you a simple trick. So, you have two things. One is minimum transfer price. Other one is maximum transfer price. Minimum transfer price, always think from supply and division's point of view. Okay, maximum transfer price always think from receiving division's point of view. Why? Because supply and division is the one who is going to incur the cost. Therefore, minimum selling price, you should give the uh, importance towards supply and division and you should fix your minimum TP more than the cost that has been incurred by the supply and division. When it comes to maximum TP, always think from receiving division's point of view because receiving division is the one who is going to buy the goods. Therefore, you need to see whether receiving division has got sufficient money to buy the goods that is nothing but NMR, net marginal revenue, which is nothing but how much is the money that receiving division has got. Okay. Generally, the concept goes this way. Minimum TP is equal to relevant cost of the supply and division. Relevant cost can be anything. It can be variable cost or it can be variable cost plus opportunity cost. Maximum TP is equal to the money that receiving division has got, which is nothing but NMR, net marginal revenue or external buying price, whichever is less will be your answer. Why? Because if you think from receiving division's point of view, what will be his thought process? I will purchase either, I'll give you maximum price, either with respect to the money that I've got or whatever the money that I pay to the external vendor. Suppose I'm trying to buy from external vendor at 50 rupees. And internally, supply division says that I will charge you 55. He will say, I'll not buy you from 55. I mean, I'll not buy at 55 from you. I'll buy from outside at 50. It's as simple as that. Are you able to understand? So the concept is very simple. When it comes to supply division, the minimum TP is the relevant cost, which can be either variable cost or marginal cost or variable cost or marginal cost plus opportunity cost. Coming on to the maximum TP, which you need to think from receiving division's point of view, which will be either NMR, NMR is nothing but the money that receiving division possess, net marginal revenue or the external buying price, whichever is less. Got it? Chalo. Now, so to promote goal congruence, what should be the minimum transfer price that division A should charge? Assume there is no external market for the intermediate product. When there is no external market means there is no sacrificing of external sales. When you don't sacrifice external sales, there is no benefit lost. When there is no benefit lost or contribution lost, there is no opportunity cost. Therefore, your minimum TP, which you need to think from supply and division's point of view, will be variable cost. In this case, the variable cost is how much, Nana? 10 rupees. So, 10 rupees will be your answer. If division B can buy uh, the intermediate part externally, in one case, 14 per unit, division B means receiving division. 14 per unit in one case, 18 per unit in another case, from the outside vendor, what should be the maximum TP that division A can charge to remain competitive with the external vendor? Are you able to get me? Now, very simple, see here. Maximum TP. You need to think from whose point of view? Receiving division's point of view. I told you it is NMR, that is the money that receiving division possesses, or external buying price, whichever is less. Now let's take the first situation where external buying price is equal to how much? 14. Now let's calculate NMR, that is the money that receiving division possesses to buy from the supply division. Receiving division sells externally at 20 per unit, and receiving division's own cost is 5 rupees. So it sells at 20 rupees externally minus it has its own cost, which is 5 rupees. So the money it has got in its pockets is 15 rupees. So 15 rupees, that is NMR or 14 rupees, whichever is less. So the answer will be 14. Now, in case, if your external buying price is 18, that is this scenario. Anyway, its NMR will not change, which is 15. So whichever is less, the answer will be 15 in the second case. Okay. So the maximum TP will be 14 in the case of the first one. The maximum TP will be 15 in the case of the second one. Are you able to understand? I'm going at a very brisk pace. Why? Because we have to revise as early as possible. Are you able to understand? In the shortest time. That's why. So this is a rapid, rapid, rapid revision for people. Okay. Who wants to cover the entire chapter within one and a half hour. 
अप्रोक्सीमेटली ओके राइट चलो नेक्स्ट कमिंग ऑन टू द नेक्स्ट वन अज्यूम दैट इंटरमीडिएट गुड्स ऑफ डिविजन ए कैन बी सोल्ड एक्सटर्नली ओके एट ट्वेल्व पर यूनिट हाउ डज दिस ऑपरचुनिटी कॉस्ट अफेक्ट द ट्रांसफर प्राइस रेंज वेन डिविजन बी कैन प्रोक्यूर द पार्ट एक्सटर्नली एट फोर्टीन पर यूनिट ओके नाउ द लॉजिक इज वेरी सिंपल Division A is selling the product externally at twelve per unit. Variable cost of division A is how much? Nana ten per unit, which means its contribution is two per unit. So minimum TP is nothing but relevant cost of the supply and division, which is nothing but variable cost plus opportunity cost. That is equal to variable cost is ten plus opportunity cost is two, which is nothing but contribution lost. That is equal to twelve. That will be your minimum TP. Maximum TP you need to think from external divisions perspective. So when you think from external divisions perspective. uh it has got its own uh, money that is nmr which is 15 which we have already calculated and external buying price is how much 14 so whichever is less means the answer will be 14 so maximum tp is 14 and minimum tp is 12 that will be your answer for third part of the question got it guys right guys let's move on to the next example that is this one okay so all of you guys keep your uh, study metal with you okay uh, everything i'm uh, doing it from the new study metal okay keep that with you so that it will be easy for you to follow right so a company has two divisions a and b making products a and b respectively one unit of a is an input for each unit of b b has a production capacity of 45000 units and a ready market other information available regarding division a or you got capacity which is 50000 maximum external sales is 30 Fixed cost up to thirty thousand units. Okay, beyond thirty thousand, it increases by fifty thousand for every ten thousand. That is given. Variable manufacturing cost per unit fifty five. Variable selling cost for external sales is ten. Variable selling cost for special order or transfer to B is five. So this is a point that you have to note always. Uh, external sales, whatever the selling expenses that you incur on external sales will be high when compared to the selling expense on internal transfer. Selling price for the external market is eighty. Uh, for special sales, it is seventy. So B can buy the input A from outside at a slightly incomplete stage at 45 per unit, and will incur subcontracting charges of 30 per unit to match it to the stage at which it receives the goods from Division B. Division, uh, sorry, it receives the goods from Division A. Division B is willing to pay a maximum of 75 per unit. Division A supplies its entire demand of 45,000 units. Uh, okay, in case if the entire demand of 45,000 is met, then Division B is willing to pay 75. Otherwise, it will pay only 70. Division A has also received a special order of fifteen thousand units. Either you can accept that in full or reject. Uh, Division A may choose to avoid variable selling cost of five per unit on transfer to B or special order, that is internal transfer or special order, by incurring a fixed cost of fifty thousand instead. Right. So you have two options. What is the best strategy of Division A? Show the profitability of that option. What will be the range of TP B under if the best strategy is chosen? Okay. now very simple logic if you want to choose best strategy it is that strategy which gives you maximum profit or maximum contribution right now because there is no limiting factor in this particular question we can easily say that we need to find contribution per unit to give this particular answer that is the best strategy because that option which has got highest contribution per unit will be the best strategy as simple as that now how to find contribution per unit very simple now let's calculate contribution per unit for a various options of division a one is external sales is one option special order is another option coming on to internal transfer you have two options less than 45000 because he will be paying only 70 is equal to 45000 he'll be paying what 75 and then we need to calculate contribution so it's very simple and straight forward manufacturing variable cost copy paste from the question coming on to selling and distribution on external sales you'll incur 10 whereas on internal transfer or special order you have two choices which is given in the question either you can incur 5 rupees or you can incur what 50000 now how to decide which one to go for here you need to apply the concept of indifference point so that's where your concept has to click in your mind now chalo see here so decision regarding 5000 or 55 rupees per unit which is nothing but 5 uh, sorry 50000 or 5 rupees per unit uh, selling and distribution cost with respect to internal transfer or special order for this you need to apply the concept of indifference point okay how why because in one option you need to incur a high fixed cost and variable cost will be nil which is low in another option your fixed cost will be nil but your variable cost will be high so when you have this sort of a situation it is an ideal situation where we need to apply indifference point where in one option fixed cost is high and variable cost is low and in another option fixed cost is less and variable cost is high 
Now, if you can see indifference point, the formula is pretty simple. Change in fixed cost divided by change in variable cost per unit. That is obviously the concept. Two options having different fixed cost and different variable cost. So naturally, the formula will be change in fixed cost divided by change in variable cost per unit. So in one option, so what is change in fixed cost? 50,000 minus zero and change in variable cost zero minus five rupees per unit. And you got your indifference point as how much? 10,000. So if it is less than 10,000, if it is less than indifference point, go for that option which has got low variable cost. Are you able to understand? Uh, sorry, go for that option which has got low fixed cost. Is equal to indifference point. Go for that option which has got uh, either of the options should be fine for you. And greater than indifference point. Go for that option which has got high fixed cost. This is generally the concept. So you should know the indifference point concept. Is that clear? So less than indifference point. Always you'll go for that option which has got low fixed cost. Because your sales is less, you cannot take risk by going for that option which has got high fixed cost. Because you may not recover that high fixed cost. Okay. Therefore, you will go for that option which has got low fixed cost. Uh, is equal to indifference point because that is the point at which either of the options will give you same profit. So, whichever option is okay for me. Greater than indifference point because my sales is so huge, my fixed cost would have been recovered completely. Therefore, I will go for that option which has got low variable cost. Incidentally, low variable cost option is nothing but high fixed cost option because if you want to reduce your variable cost, you have to invest in fixed cost. That is a relationship. Anyways, so finally here, this is the situation. Now we need to analyze the situation over here. Your external sales is how much? 30,000. Your total capacity is 50,000. So there is a balance in capacity of 20,000. In this 20,000, what you will do? Either you will go for a special order of 15,000 or you will go for an internal transfer of 20,000. Are you able to understand? In the balance 20,000 capacity, presuming that you will do an external sales of 30,000. So, which means in both the cases, it is greater than the indifference point of 10,000. Therefore, I'll go for 50,000 fixed cost option instead of going for 5 rupees variable selling cost option on my internal transfer as well as special order. Therefore, 50,000 option is chosen. And therefore, here when you are calculating your variable cost, you did not take 5 rupees here and you have left it blank. And finally, we have calculated our contribution per unit, which came 15, 15, 15 and 20. And therefore, this is the highest option. Which one? Internal transfer of complete 45,000 units to the receiving division. So therefore, finally, the best strategy will be internal transfer of 45,000 plus what you will do with the balance 5,000 units. These two options are mutually exclusive. Either you will do internal transfer, which is equal to 45,000 or you will do internal transfer, which is less than 45,000. So once you have selected an option to do internal transfer of 45,000, automatically this gets eliminated. Then only two options are available for you. One is external sales, other one is special order. Special order is like either you accept in full for 15,000 or you reject completely. Here I've got only 5,000 unit capacity left because 45,000 I'm going for internal transfer. Therefore, this option is also not possible. That's why I go for external sales. So finally, the best strategy is go for internal transfer of 45,000 units and external sales of 5,000 units. Got it? Sure. And then you can just calculate profitability of that best strategy option. So 45,000 units into 20 rupees we have calculated here. Multiply with, you'll get the total contribution. And 5,000 units of external sales, you got the contribution over here, which is 15. You multiply that, you get your total contribution. Reduce your normal fixed cost, which is 4,30,000. Plus every 10,000 units increase in capacity, it will increase by 50,000. So earlier your capacity were 30,000. Now it is 50,000. So 30,000 plus 10,000 units incremental for that 50,000. Another 10,000 units incremental for that another 50,000. So totally 1 lakh will be the additional fixed cost in addition to 4 lakh 30. Total fixed cost will be 5 lakh 30. Plus you have chosen based on indifference point that you are going to incur a fixed selling cost of 50,000 instead of variable selling cost of 5 rupees per unit and therefore that 50,000 also you need to include over here and finally you get a profit of 3,95,000. So that is the answer for the first part of the question. Coming on to the second part of the question, what will be the range of transfer price be under if the best strategy is chosen? Very simple. How to fix your TP? You need to have minimum TP as well as maximum TP. Now coming on to minimum TP, pretty simple. See here. Minimum TP is nothing but I told you so many times variable cost plus opportunity cost. Now, what is the opportunity cost over here that we need to understand? Now, see, Anana, what is the option that you have chosen? Internal transfer of 45,000 and external sales of 5,000. This is what you have chosen. What are the alternatives that is available? If you have not chosen this particular option, you could have gone for external sales of 30,000 units, special order of 15,000 units and internal transfer of 5,000. That is one option available or you could have gone for external sales of 30,000 
and instead of special order you could have gone for internal transfer which is less than 45000 that option is also available in this case it will be 20000 so these are all two alternatives available apart from the best alternative which you have chosen now why did you go for best alternative because it is giving you 20 rupees contribution for 45000 units and 15 rupees contribution for 5000 units whereas the alternate options are giving you only 15 rupees for the entire 50000 units therefore you went for this particular option which means by going for this particular option you have lost a contribution of how much 15 and that becomes your opportunity cost are you able to get me right which means next best alternative opportunity cost concept is that only na whatever the contribution or the benefit that you have lost from next best alternative when compared to this particular alternative, there are two alternatives which is going to give you the same contribution of 15. Are you able to get me? So therefore, minimum TP is nothing but variable cost plus opportunity cost and you add the opportunity cost 15 and your minimum TP will be 70. Okay, coming on to max on TP. It is nothing but external buying price in this case. If you look at the question, he can buy from outside at 45 plus he has to incur 30 rupees. So total cost will be 75. If you keep anything more than 75, he'll buy from outside. He will not buy from you. Therefore, the maximum TP has to be 75. And some of you might have got a doubt, sir, what about the incremental fixed cost? Here you have calculated na, incremental fixed cost of 1 lakh because it is additional. Na, why didn't you add it when you are calculating what? Minimum TP. Now, we did not add it. Why? Because in all the options, your, your fixed cost is going to be 5,30. So it is not incremental. It is normal for all the options. This option, it is 5,30 because you are using the entire 50,000 capacity. This option also, it is 5,30. This option also, it is 5,30. So when all the options, it is 5,30, there is no such thing called incremental. So in one option, suppose it is 4,30 and in another option, it suppose it is 5,30, then you'll be adding it as incremental. Whichever option that you choose, anyway, you're operating in all the options at 50,000 capacity only. So there is no such thing called incremental over here. So I have written here, see, division A will work on full capacity irrespective of the options. Therefore, manufacturing fixed cost outlay will be the same, which is 5 lakh 30, right? Therefore, the impact of additional outlay of fixed cost, which is 1 lakh on minimum TP will be nil. That's the reason I did not consider that. You got the point, right? Shallow. So we are done with this particular problem. Let's move on. Next one is proposals for resolving transfer pricing conflict. What do you mean by this? See, sometimes you'll have a transfer pricing conflict where the divisional managers will not accept or agree for any transfer price whatsoever. They'll keep on fighting because the logic is very simple. Every individual divisional managers wants his profit to be more. So therefore, he will not accept any decision which will reduce his profit, even though it is in the interest of the company. So this sort of a situation where individual divisional managers are not agreeing for a decision which is in the interest of the company we call it as goal conflict situation so to solve this sort of a situation we have two solutions with us to resolve transfer pricing conflicts which affects the goal congruence one is dual rate transfer pricing system other one is two part transfer pricing system now when compared to what has been explained over here i'll try to explain you in a very simpler way Thereby, you can answer this case scenario also. This case scenario also, the solution for this case scenario is a dual rate transfer rating system as well as two part transfer rating system. So, we'll cover that as well. Okay. Chalo, now see here. So, what do you mean by this dual rate transfer rating system? You'll have two rates, two different TPs. What are they? Supply and division in its books, it will write TP is equal to variable cost per markup. Let's take an example that variable cost is 10 rupees. And let's say markup is 2 rupees. It will write in its books as 12. Which one? Supply and division. Receiving division in its books, it will write TP as 10 rupees only. So there will be two TPs. That's why it is called dual rate. 12 rupees is one rate, 10 rupees is another rate. So now supply and division is happy. Why? Because it has got markup. So its profit will look healthy. So it is happy. It will get incentives. Receiving division is also happy because its cost is less thereby its profit also will get increased so it will also get incentive so he is also happy so therefore the transfer raising conflict is resolved and this sort of resolving transfer raising conflict we call it as dual rate tp system coming on to two part tp system what will happen is that here if you look at the title it is two parts as a receiving division i will give compensation to the supply division and my compensation will be of two parts one part I'll compensate for the variable cost that is incurred by the supply and division. Another part I'll compensate for the fixed cost that is incurred by the supply and division. 
normally supply nissan will not accept the transfer price which is equivalent to the variable cost why because it wants something up and above its variable cost because there is something called fixed cost which has to be recovered are you able to get me and that particular problem will be covered in two part transfer pricing system and that will be one of the reason for conflict okay so let's say supply nissan's total capacity is 50000 i just give you example to make you understand this concept easily so let's say total capacity of your supply division is 50000 and let's say external sales versus internal transfer is in the ratio of 4 is to 1 so you are selling 40000 units externally and 10000 units internally let's say your variable cost per unit is 20 whose variable cost supply and division's variable cost and fixed cost is 1 lakh okay now look at the situation your fixed cost is 1 lakh right your external sales is to internal transfer is 4 is to 1 which means four parts of your fixed cost you recover from outside from your external sales and one part of your fixed cost you can recover from inside that is internal transfer which is 20000 therefore finally tp is equal to two parts one is compensation towards variable cost other one is compensation towards fixed cost variable cost is nothing but 20 per unit into 10000 units fixed cost compensation is 20000 which you have calculated here okay and finally 220000 will be your lump sum consideration this two part transfer pricing method can also be called as lump sum consideration or you will understand where one part which compensates variable cost incurred by the supply division another part which compensates the fixed cost or you will understand so this we call it as two part transfer pricing system okay got it guys right guys let's move on to the next concept that is international transfer pricing chalo see here why there is something called international transfer pricing that is due to mncs or able to get me pretty simple now why there is a concept called multinational companies uh, why the companies have got their establishment in multiple countries it is either because of availability of resources for example raw metal is available in a particular country thereby i'll have an establishment over there or cheap labor is available for example china or ease of doing business that is also china okay in india it got improved recently demand for finished goods this is one of the reasons why india is attracting FDIs, okay. Please try to understand. We are not getting foreign direct investments just because we have ease of doing business or cheap labor. Our labor is not as cheap as China, to be very honest. Not even as cheap as Philippines. But why are we getting a lot of uh, you know uh, investments? Why are we getting it attracted? Because if a particular company makes an establishment in India and it manufactures cars or bikes, for example, it can sell in India itself because there is that much of sufficient domestic demand. in india itself that is one of the major reasons why we are attracting lot of foreign investment anyways so now why do we need tp here when it comes to international transfer pricing there are two reasons one is taxation other one is profit remittance taxation means you guys already have an idea so when there are group companies where you have a holding company in us and subsidiary in india and china uh, they want to uh, set up the international transfer in such a way that uh, they tax overall tax payment for the group as a whole should be at its minimum profit remittance rules means for example you have kfc over in india and it has got lot of establishments ultimately its parent company is in us and whatever the profit that you, that it has earned in india it wants to remit it back to its source right which is nothing but in the us so that we call it as profit repatriation or profit remittance or you will understand so whichever country where the profit remittance or repatriation rules is easier in that country they will ensure that the profit is high accordingly they'll fix the tp that is the whole concept over here same logic applies to taxation as well whichever country where the taxation is less in that particular country they will ensure that either whether there is a supply division or receiving division doesn't matter in which country where they have less taxes in that particular country whatever the division they have got they would like that particular division to earn more profit such that they will pay less taxes coming on to profit remittance rules whichever country where they have easy rules with respect to profit remittance they would like that particular country's division to earn more profit such that they can transfer the profit to their source company which is in us in an easier way or you will understand that's how the whole logic of international transfer pricing goes chalo now let's try to solve the first example a car manufacturing company has two manufacturing divisions in different countries Division A in India manufactures engines for the cars. It has to manufacture. It has the capacity to manufacture ten thousand units in each year. The variable cost of production is eight thousand. It can sell eight thousand engines externally to customers within India. 
at 11,000 per unit. The other division, Division B, is in Italy that requires 5,000 engines every year to assemble them further into cars. It purchases these engines from a vendor in Italy at a price that is equivalent to 9,000 per unit. If Division B were to purchase these units from Division A, the transfer price would be 10,000 per unit. Since no selling expense need to be incurred on internal sales, variable cost on such transfers would be 7,000 per unit. If Division A accepts, accepts the internal order from Division B, it will have to curtail some of its external sales. Given that the tax rate is 30% in India and 40% in Italy, determine if the company will benefit overall if Division B purchase from Division A. That is a question. Obviously, it will benefit easily, you can say. Why? Because <clears throat> if you can see, Division A is not losing anything. Anyway, we'll see the calculation. You'll understand. See it. First of all, let's calculate benefit to Division A. Then we'll calculate benefit or cost to Division B. Then we'll set up both of them and we'll see what is the overall benefit from the company's point of view. Existing external sales of Division A is 8,000 units. It is selling to outside. Okay. So if the internal transfer of Division B is accepted, then Division A has to sacrifice 3,000 units of external sales. So thereby the sales mix will be external sales of 5,000. Earlier it used to be 8,000, but 3,000 has to be sacrificed because only then you will be able to transfer internally 5,000 units. So after the sacrifice of 3,000 units of external sales is done, the sales mix of the supply and division, that is Division A, will be external sales of 5,000, internal transfer of 5,000. Now, contribution that it is getting from external sales, it, it is selling at 11,000 and its variable cost is 8,000, which is 3,000. On internal transfer also, it will be 3,000. Why? Because even though you are selling at 1,000 less, your cost also will get reduced by 1,000. Thereby, your contribution remains same. So from this, what you guys need to understand is, even though Division B has, sac has sacrificed 3,000 units of external sales, it has got compensated in the same way from internal transfer of not only 3,000, but 2,000 units extra. So therefore, gross benefit for Division A is equal to 5,000 into 3,000, 5,000 into 3,000. Whether it is external sales or internal transfer, its contribution is same. Earlier, it used to get only 8,000 units, which is external sales, and it used to get 3,000 as contribution per unit. But now, it is getting 10,000 into 3,000. Therefore, additional 2,000 units contribution, as a what, into 3,000. So there is a gross benefit of 60 lakhs. Whenever there is a gross benefit that is inflow, you need to pay taxes at 30%. Thereby, your net benefit will be 42 lakhs. Okay. So ultimately, for supply and division or division A, there is a net positive benefit of 42 lakhs. Now coming on to the receiving division, if you can see, additional cost for receiving division because it is buying from division B will be 1000 rupees extra. Because earlier, it was, it was paying only 9000, but now it has to pay 10,000. Therefore, for every unit, it has to pay 1,000 extra for 5,000 units. So, therefore, it has to pay 50 lakh extra. So, we cannot say there is a total loss of 50 lakhs. Why? Because when there is loss, you'll be having tax benefit because that loss will reduce your taxable profit. To that extent, you'll pay less taxes. So, the tax benefit is 40% in that particular country. Therefore, the net loss is only 30 lakhs. So, for Division A, there is a net benefit of 42 lakhs. For Division B, there is a net loss of 30 lakhs. So overall benefit for the company will be 12 lakhs positive. Since there is a positive net benefit of 12 lakhs, Division B should purchase engines internally from Division A will be your final answer. Got the point guys? All of you, I hope this is clear. Right guys, let's move on to the next question. So this is question number one over here in test your knowledge. G is transferring division and R, the receiving division of the company, R has a demand for 20% of G's production capacity, which has to be first met as per the company <coughs> company's policy. See, 20% is of the 100% capacity, okay, because the capacity is 100%. State with reason which division G or R enjoys more advantage in each of the following independent situations, assuming that there is no inventory buildup. First one, G transfers to R at a transfer price equal to full cost. There is no markup. This will be your TP. G's production level is 60%. Always remember, fixed cost will be related to the level of the production that you're operating right now. So even though your capacity is 100%, you're operating at a production level of 60%. So fixed cost will be equivalent to that particular capacity, which is 60%. External demand is 40% of the total capacity. All these percentages are percentages of the total capacity. Okay. So total capacity is 100%. Out of that, he is operating at 60%. Okay. Out of the total capacity, 40% is the external demand. 
and out of the total capacity 20% is what the internal transfer they are planning to happen so which division will have more advantage is it the supply division or the receiving division now here you are transferring at uh, tp which is equal to full cost thereby supply division that is g will be at more advantage why because g is recovering its full cost full fixed cost because of additional internal transfer of 20% chalo see here g is at advantage because even though the current production level of g is 60% to which fixed cost is related okay because that's the production level that it is operating right now it is selling only 40% to the external market therefore only that portion of its own fixed cost is getting recovered due to external sales and the balance fixed portion is not getting recovered so by transferring 20% of its own production capacity i mean of its total production capacity to division r on full cost plus basis what is the advantage g will be able to recover all of its fixed cost or able to understand so ultimately the division that will be at its advantage is g now coming on to the next one market price if g is transferring to r at a market price and g's correct current production level is 80% and its external demand is only 60% you can easily guess again g will be at its advantage so what is the reason behind that g is operating at production level of 80% but only able to sell only 60% to the external market by internal transfer of 20% of its production capacity to r that to at market price it is not only recovering its fixed cost but also it is getting some markup so ultimately g is having absolute advantage next marginal cost if you transfer internally at marginal cost when your production level is 100% and your external demand is what nana 80% so who is at advantage obviously in this case obviously r is at advantage why because r is getting at the least cost possible always the least cost possible is marginal cost and with respect to g it is transferring 20% capacity to r but it is recovering only marginal cost so it is not recovering fixed cost it is not getting any sort of markup so whether it transfers the 20% at marginal cost or it doesn't transfer it doesn't make any difference for g so g will remain the same therefore g is not getting any sort of advantage r is getting advantage have a look at this g is operating at current production level of 100% external sales demand is only 80% which implies that only 80% of its fixed cost is getting recovered by internal transfer of 20% of production capacity at marginal cost division g is not able to recover its fixed i mean total fixed cost on the other hand division r is able to get its intermediate product from division g at marginal cost itself which is the lowest possible price which i have told you so from this whole setup ultimately division r is getting the advantage not division g because division g is neither recovering its fixed cost nor it is getting any sort of profit markup coming on to the last setup that is market price okay if you transfer your internal product at market price if when you are operating at 100% production level okay and your external demand is 90% who will be at advantage again g not or why you can say sir 20% it has to transfer internally so the capacity that is left over is only 10% which means it has to sacrifice external sales of 10% yes but really it is not sacrificing anything why because it is transferring at mar market price only na so even if external sales is sacrificed at 10% internally also it is transferring at market price only so ultimately division g will not lose anything instead it will gain because of that sacrifice it is able to utilize the additional 10% of its capacity now what will happen 80% will be your external sales and 20% will be your internal transfer at market price only so in fact virtually it is using 100% of its capacity at market price earlier only 90% of its capacity is being sold at a market price therefore g will be at its advantage so g is currently operating at production level of 100% external sales is 90% internal transfer is 20% so for that g has to sacrifice 10% of its external sales but since internal transfer price is also market price g does not lose anything instead g is able to sell additional 10% of its capacity at market price therefore from this whole setup who is at advantage g is at advantage got the point right guys let's move on to the next problem so uh, <clears throat> b limited makes three products x y and z in divisions x y and z respectively the following information is given so you have direct material excluding material x for divisions y and z which means this is further processing cost of y this is further processing cost of z okay direct labor variable overhead per unit selling price to outside customers 
existing capacity, maximum market demand, additional fixed cost that would be incurred to install additional capacity and uh, maximum additional units that can be produced by additional capacity. Right now, so uh, maximum external market demand of units is 5000, 5500 and 5000. Okay, additional fixed capacity that would be incurred to install additional capacity is given. How much additional capacity is also given? Y and Z need material X as their input. Material X is available in the market at 23 per unit. Defectives can be returned to suppliers at their cost. Division X supplies the material fee free from defects and hence is able to sell at 25 per unit. Okay, so it is able to sell at a premium. Each unit of Y and Z requires one unit of X with slight modification. If Y purchase from outside at 23 per unit, it has to incur 3 rupees per unit. So the total modification cost, I mean total cost inclusive of modification is 26. If Y purchase from division X, it has to incur in addition to the transfer price 2 rupees per unit to modify it. If Z gets the material from division X, it can use it after incurring a modification cost of 1 rupee per unit. If Z buys material X from outside, it has to either inspect and modify it at its own shop floor at rupees 5 per unit or use idle labor from division X at 3 per unit. Division X will lend its idle labor as per Z's requirement even if Z purchases the material from outside. The transfer price are at the discretion of the divisional managers and will remain confidential. Assume no restriction on quantities of interdivisional transfers or purchases. You are required to discuss with relevant figures the best strategy for each division and the company as a whole. That is the question. See, understand one thing. So, best strategy means obviously there is no limiting factor over here. Obviously, we can say capacity is a limiting factor, but obviously we're going to find out contribution per limiting factor, which is nothing but contribution per unit. So ultimately, our first step is calculation of contribution per unit. How many columns are we going to get? Now that will be a challenge. So particulars, X, Y and Z, three broad columns. Below that, X will be making external sales. X will be making internal transfer. Under internal transfer, you'll have internal transfer to Y, internal transfer to Z. Are you able to understand? So X, Y, Z. Under X, external sales, then internal transfer to Y to Z. Are you able to understand? Under Y, it will buy from uh, X, it will buy from outside. So for that, two columns. Under Z, it can also buy from X, it can also buy from outside. Are you able to understand? Like this, you need to frame the columns, first of all. Once you're able to frame the columns, rest is all about having your mindset and then solving the sum. Okay, once you have read the sum clearly, your answer will be, I think it should be quite simple. Anyways, now... So now see here guys, so that's what I've written, the division X, Y and Z, under division X, you've got external sales and internal transfer, under internal transfer, you've got internal transfer to Y, internal transfer to Z. When it comes to division Y, it can buy from outside, that is external vendor, it can also buy from inside, so two columns. Coming on to division Z, I've written only buying from inside, although there is a possibility to buy from outside, what is the reason behind that, I'll explain you later, because obviously it's better to buy from inside than to buy from outside that I have visualized it the moment I've read the question. That's why I've written one column. If you are not able to visualize it that way, you can write one more column also. It's okay. It's it's fine. Chalta hai. Now, obviously your target is to ca calculate contribution per unit. So obviously what you will do selling price minus all variable cost will give you contribution per unit. Simple. Let's start with selling price. Division X is uh, making external sales. So obviously it is 25 given in the question. When it comes to internal transfer, it is 24. Why it is 24? The logic is very simple. Division Y can buy from outside vendor at 26. How? 23 it can pay plus 3 rupees will be the modification cost. So the total cost that will be incurred for division Y is 26. Which implies that for internal transfer or for internal buying from division Y, it will not pay anything more than 26. Correct? Right? Logic is very simple. It can buy from outside. So external buying price is 26 which is 23 plus 3 rupees of modification cost, which means from internally also it will not pay anything more than 26. That's obvious. So if it buys at a price of 25 and it requires a modification cost of 2 rupees, even from internal transfer also, then its total cost will become 27. So it will not accept 27 when it can buy at 26 from outside. Therefore, to keep the total cost at 26, the transfer price cannot be more than what? 24. That is the reason we have written the selling price or the transfer price as 24 then only it is 24 plus 2 rupees modification cost it will be 26 because from outside it can buy at 26 which is 23 plus 3 are you able to get me right that's the thing 
So as you can see, the intermediate product purchase cost from outside it is 23 plus 3, 26. From inside 24 plus 2, 26. Are you able to get me? Now coming on to division Z, you can transfer internal at division Z for 25. How sir? Very simple. See here. Coming on to division Z, it has got three options. Option 1, 2 and 3. First option is it can buy from outside at 23. It can incur a modification cost of 25, uh, sorry, 5 rupees and thereby its total cost will be 28. That is one option. Straight away this option is gone because it is very costly. Second option is it can buy internally from division X at a price of 25 plus incur a modification cost of 1 rupee. Thereby its total cost will be 26. Third option is it can buy from outside at 23 plus use direct labor from division X at 3 rupees per unit. Thereby, its total cost can be 26 itself, which is similar to the internal transfer. But to make this option work, that is option 3, first of all, division X should, go, should have some sort of idle labor. But there is no idle labor in division X that you can easily understand from the nature of the question. In that case, this option is also not available. So, therefore, only option 2 is available. That is the reason it can buy only from division X. Therefore, here I have written only one column for division Z that is buying from division X only. I did not write another column where it can buy from outside. I hope you have understood this particular logic. And that's why you have got 25 over here. Apart from that, remaining everything is normal. Direct metal copy paste from the question. Labor copy paste from the question. Variable rates copy paste from the question. With respect to intermediate product purchase cost, these three figures are nothing but these two figures. Are you able to understand? Because your internal transfer price is nothing but your, yeah. Transfer price is nothing but your intermediate product purchase cost. So division Y buys from division X at 24 plus it spends 2 rupees for modification cost. So 26. If it buys from outside, it is 23 plus 3 rupees modification cost. Division Z buys from division X at 25. Okay. Division Z buys from division X at 25 plus incurs a modification cost of 1 rupee. Therefore, its cost is 26. Apart from that, no other thing is required. I mean, no other thing requires your attention because everything is copy paste from the question. You got it, guys? Chalo. Finally, what is your best strategy, obviously? For division X, first it will go for external sales because there is a lot of contribution, which is 11. Then it will go for internal transfer to division Z because it is getting maximum contribution, which is 11 again. At last, it will go for internal transfer to division Y. That is what division X will do. Division Y and Z, there is no much of a strategy over here because all its uh, production is being sold outside only. So all its sales will be sold externally. So there is nothing much to think here when it comes to division Y and division Z because everything that they manufacture will be sold externally. There ends a matter. So best strategy for division X right now, you cannot answer. You can ask me why, sir? Why? Because we haven't made any decision with respect to the additional capacity. Unless you have taken a decision with respect to additional capacity, whether you are going to invest in additional capacity or not, you cannot say what is your best strategy because best strategy includes the number of units that you are going to you know, sell outside or transfer inside that you cannot answer without taking a decision with respect to additional capacity. Are you able to get me? So now we need to take decision with respect to additional capacity. How are we going to take that decision? Now see here. Existing capacity is 6,000, 3,000 and 3,000. Additional capacity that you can add is 6,000, 2,000 and 2,250. It is there from the question copy paste. So total capacity after you have added additional capacity will be 12,000, 5,000 and 5,250 for the respective divisions. Okay. Now, so for division X, what will happen? What it will do with this 12,000 capacity after the additional capacity has been added? The first preference will be external sales because it has got 11 rupees as contribution. To the extent of 5,000 units, it can sell externally because that is a demand which is available outside. Second preference will be internal transfer. Are you able to understand? To division Z because it gets 11 rupees again here as well. And how much it will transfer to division Z? How much is the external demand of division Z? That much I will transfer internally because division Z will buy only to the extent of its external demand, right? Division Z can sell 5,000 units externally, which means it will buy 5,000 units internally. And last preference will go for division Y because it gives only 10 rupees. How much is left over out of 12,000? 5,000 is gone here. 5,000 is gone here. 2,000 will be going for internal transfer to division Y. Is that clear? Now, coming on to these three, how it is going to happen? Now, listen carefully. This is the existing capacity, correct? 6,000. 
from this 6000 from this existing capacity of 6000 okay external sales will go for us just imagine first in first out basis okay fifo method so first capacity is your existing capacity not the additional capacity from this existing capacity of 6000 5000 external sales will go are you able to understand still how much is left over in your existing capacity of 6000 1000 is left over that 1000 will be utilized for internal transfer to division z plus remaining 4000 will go from this 6000 correct your total transfer internally to division z is how much 5000 are you able to understand how are you going to work out this 5000 from this 6000 1000 is left over right plus from this additional 6000 you will be utilizing 4000 that's what i've written here 1000 from existing capacity easy 4000 from additional capacity ac and then from additional capacity 2000 is left over that will be utilized for internal transfer of 2000 this is very important this is the only challenging part in this entire question how this 12000 will be utilized from this first 6000 existing capacity 5000 external sales will happen and 1000 will go for internal transfer and from this 6000 4000 will go for internal transfer to division z so 4000 plus 1000 from existing capacity you got the point that's what i've written here and from this 6000 the balance 2000 will go for internal transfer to division y last preference because you get only 10 rupees contribution from this when it comes to division y and division z nothing much to think everything they will do it will go for external sales only so entire capacity will be utilized for external sales external sales nothing much to think over here okay now once we know this we need to take a decision whether we should invest in additional capacity or not how to take that decision very simple if i invest in additional capacity i need to invest in additional fixed cost that is cost for me how much is the additional contribution that i am getting because of additional sales because of additional capacity compare both of them additional contribution that i get from additional sales because of additional capacity minus additional fixed cost that you have incurred are you able to get me so that's what we are doing here see here additional contribution that you are getting from additional capacity this is the most challenging part how did i calculate the 64000 this is my additional capacity 6000 reverse working how are you utilizing the 6000 last 2000 you are using for internal transfer to division y so 2000 into 10 10 rupees is the contribution if you transfer to division y plus in this 5000 only 4000 you are utilizing from additional capacity so 4000 into 11 plus 2000 into 10 you got the point that's how i got the calculation over here got it and you have got this additional capacity coming on to y and z it's pretty simple okay your additional capacity is 2000 which means 2000 extra sales you are making so 2000 extra sales into the contribution that we have calculated already here which is 9 are you able to get me so pretty simple and even when it comes to division z also it is pretty simple uh, his external sales is 3000 from his existing capacity and because of additional capacity even though 2250 additional capacity is added he can sell only 2000 extra because his market itself is 5000 so therefore 2000 he'll sell extra his contribution we already know which is 14 so multiply with 14 there ends the matter okay now this much additional contribution you are receiving from additional capacity minus additional cost is this much copy paste from the question we have got positive net benefit in all the three cases therefore your decision is to go for expansion 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 if it is negative we'll say stick with your existing capacity do not go for expansion are you able to get me so finally the best strategy is for division x sell 5000 units externally internal transfer of 5000 units to division z then internal transfer of 2000 units to division y and division y will buy this 2000 units from x and the balance 3000 will be bought from outside and ultimately everything will be sold externally division z will directly buy all the 5000 units all its requirement from division x and all the requirement i mean whatever that it has manufactured will be sold externally finally accordingly you can calculate profitability for your best strategy very simple just multiply with contribution which we have calculated in the first step reduce the fixed cost you get your answer fixed cost is given in the question okay fixed cost for additional capacity is given for existing capacity fixed cost is not given therefore we are not reducing it as simple as that you got this guys all of you right now i hope this one is clear Chalo, let's move on to the next one take this question centurion company operates a pulp division that manufacture wood pulp for use in production of various paper goods the following information are available selling price is 210 
variable expenses 126 contribution is 84 less fixed expenses based on a capacity of 1 lakh is 54 net income is given which is 30 okay centurion company has just acquired a small company that manufactures paper cartons this company will be treated as a division of centurion with full profit responsibility which means they are operating at full capacity okay and they are selling all these units to the external market that's the logic generally when you use the word full profit responsibility the newly formed carton division is currently purchasing 10,000 kgs of pulp per year from a supplier at a cost of 210 less 10 percent quantity discount which means 189 huh? yeah centurion's president is anxious that the carton division begins uh, purchasing its pulp from the pulp division if an acceptable transfer price can be worked out so three situations are given first one if the pulp division is in a position to sell all of its pulp to the external customers at a normal price of 210 Will the managers of carton and pulp division agree to transfer 10,000 kgs of pulp next year at a determined price explained with reasons? Situation 2. Assuming that the pulp division is currently selling only 60,000 kgs of pulp each year to outside customers at a stated price of 210 per kg, will the managers agree to mutually transfer, uh, I mean, to mutually at an acceptable transfer price for 10,000 kgs of pulp next year explained with reasons? Situation 3. If the outside supplier of carton division reduces its price to 177 per kg, will the pulp division meet this price? Explain, if the pulp division does not meet the price of 177 per kg, what will be the effect of profits on the company as a whole? That is a question. Okay. Right. Let's start answering this. Pretty simple. See, Anana. First of all, let's take situation 1. Minimum TP, I told you. You need to think from supply and division's point of view. It is nothing but total relevant cost of the supply and division. What is relevant cost of the supply and division? Right now, it is operating at full profit responsibility, which means entire capacity is being utilized to sell externally. So anything that it has to transfer internally can happen only by sacrificing the external sales. Therefore, when you sacrifice the external sales, you will be losing a selling price. At the same time, you will be saving the cost. So therefore, what you ultimately lose is the contribution. So selling price minus variable cost, this much you will lose. That becomes opportunity cost, right? So variable cost plus opportunity cost will be your minimum TP, which comes to 210. Coming on to maximum TP, you need to think from receiving division's point of view. It is the money that receiving division possesses, which is NMR or the external buying price, whichever is less. External buying price right now is 210 minus 10%, which is 189. Therefore, minimum TP is 120, maximum TP is 189, which means internal transfer will not happen. Got the point? Pretty clear. Right. Moving on to situation 2. So, what is happening in situation 2? Assuming that pulp division is currently selling only 60,000 case of pulp each year to the outside customers. Okay, and at the stated price of 210, will the managers agree for a mutually acceptable transfer price for 10,000 case of pulp in the next year? Explain with reasons. Pretty simple. So in situation 2, minimum TP is equal to variable cost only. Why? Because you are selling only 60,000 kgs to outside, which means the balance capacity is left over. You can utilize the balance capacity and transfer internally, which means what you will be incurring only is variable cost. Therefore, minimum TP will be variable cost, which is 126 from supply and division's point of view. Now, from receiving division's point of view, obviously, it is external buying price, which is 189. So, therefore, this will be your TP range, minimum, maximum range. So, therefore, there will be internal transfer possible in situation 2. So, any TP within the above range is a good TP, is an agreeable TP, and internal transfer will eventually happen. Right. Coming on to situation 3. If the outside supplier of the carton division reduces its price to 177 per kg, Will the pulp division meet this price? Explain if the pulp division does not meet the price of 177, what will be the effects on the profits? Uh, I mean, what will be the effect on profits of the company as a whole? But in situation 3, he did not explain you whether the supply division is operating at full capacity or 60,000 capacity. Like in situation 1 or situation 2, that he did not say. So we, need, we will answer from both the perspectives. Okay, chalo. Assumption number 1. It is assumed that pulp division is selling 60% of its capacity externally. In that case, obviously your minimum TP is 126, which is variable cost because there is no external sales sacrifice. So therefore, there is no opportunity cost. Maximum TP will be the external buying price, which is nothing but 177 as given in the question in situation 3. Therefore, this will be the TP range. Okay. So, you got the point? Right. So, if there is no internal transfer, then there will be loss. Right. If pulp division does not meet the price of 177, then carton division will buy from outside vendor. And because of this, the supply and division will lose this much. Because supply and division, it will cost only 126 to manufacture. And uh, 
if at all it would have agreed the tp of 177 it would have gained 51 rupees per unit for all the units that it has internally transferred because instead of keeping your capacity idle you could have transferred internally and you could have earned a profit of 51 are you able to understand therefore loss also for the company will be 51 how it will be lost for the company because company from company's perspective the received nation is buying from outside at 177 when company can manufacture at 126 so company also will lose 51 rupees so therefore 5 lakh 10,000 will be lost so which is pretty bad assumption 2 let's presume that pulp division is operating at 100 percent capacity and all of its capacity is being sold to the external market in that case the minimum tp will be 210 variable cost plus opportunity cost just like in the first situation is that clear you got this external buying price maximum tp will be 177 because receiving division will not pay more than 177 when it can buy from outside at 177 which means no internal transfer will happen are you able to understand that's obvious because if internal transfer happens company will lose 210 minus 126 that is the loss of sacrifice of external sales which is 84 and what you are gaining because of uh, internal transfer, your receiving division will not buy at 177. Instead, you will manufacture internally at 126. So, you will gain only 51. Ultimately, you will lose 33. So, total loss for the company will be 3 lakh 33,000. Uh, sorry, 3 lakh 30,000. Therefore, internal transfer should not happen if it goes by assumption 2, where supply and division is selling its entire sales to the external market and it is operating at full capacity. You got the point, guys? Yes, so with this, we are done with this particular problem. Right, guys, let's move on to the next question. This one, sixth one. Uh, G Limited is a multi product manufacturing concern functioning with four divisions. The electrical division of the company is producing many electrical products, including electrical switches. This division, functioning at its maximum capacity, sells its switches in the open market at 25 each. The variable cost per switch to the division is 16. The household division, another division of GL Limited, functioning at 70% capacity, asked the electrical division to supply 5000 switches per month at a rate of 18 each to fit in night lamps produced by it. The total lamp cost per, I mean, total cost per night lamp is being estimated as detailed below. Components purchased from outside supplies 50, switch if purchased internally 18, other variable cost 40, fixed overheads 21, total cost per night lamp is 129. The household division is marketing night lamps at a price of 130 each with a very small margin as it is doing business in a very competitive environment. Any increase in price made by the division will push out the division from the market. Therefore, the division cannot pay anything more to switches if they, uh, I mean, that is from electrical division. Anyways, further, the manager of the division informed that it is very much essential to keep on the market share for night lamps by the household division to retain the experienced workers of the division. The company is using return on investments as a scale to measure the divisional performance and also marginal costing approach for decision making. So this has come in your examination. First one, would you recommend the supply of switches to household division by electrical division at a price of 18 each? Substantiate your recommendation with suitable reasons. Analyze whether it would be beneficial to the company as a whole, the supply of switches to household divisions at a unit price of 18 by electrical division. Do you feel the divisional manager should accept the interdivisional transfers in principle if yes what should be the range of tp fourth one suggest the steps to be taken by the chief executive of the company to change the attitude of the divisional heads if they are against interdivisional transfers you got the point that is a question Chalo, let's start answering the first one would you recommend the supply of switches to household divisions by electrical division at a price of 18 each now see here again we need to calculate minimum tp from supply and divisions point of view okay so, total relevant cost of the supply and division is nothing but your TP. So many times I've told you, variable cost plus opportunity cost because it is selling all its units to the external market at a price of 25 where the variable cost is 16, which means your contribution will be 9, which you'll be losing if you want to sacrifice your external sales for the sake of internal transfer, which means your opportunity cost will be 9 and your variable cost is 16. Therefore, your minimum TP will be 25. Whereas the price quoted by the household division is only 18. So, since 18 is less than 25, electrical division will not accept that particular TP. Also, the company is measuring the performance based on return on investment. So, if the electrical division accepts 18 as its TP, thinking that its variable cost is 16, suppose, then its ROI will be adversely you know, affected. Why? Because its profit will drop, ultimately return on investment will drop, which will hurt its incentives. Therefore, supply and division will never accept. Are you able to get me? So, electrical division will never ever accept. Got it? So that's the answer for first part of the question. So 
we have also substantiated our recommendation with suitable reasons next analyze whether it would be beneficial for the company as a whole if the supplying i mean if the supply of switches to household division at a unit price of 18 by electrical division so in first case we have straight away said that it is not in the benefit of electrical division to transfer at 18 rupees why because its cost itself is what 25 therefore it will not transfer and that too it will affect its divisional performance evaluation as well because it is being evaluated based on ROI. Now in the second question we are asking not from electrical divisions perspective not from supply and divisions perspective but from the perspective of the company as a whole. Let us see whether the answer will change or not. Okay now see here. Calculation of the benefit from the company's point of view. So company ultimately has got two choices. It can sell switches externally that is it can ask the electrical division to sell it outside directly if that happens, the selling price is 25 and the variable cost is 16, the company will get 9 rupees. Whereas, the other option for the company is not to sell switches externally. Instead, it can ask the electrical division to transfer the switches internally to household division and convert them into lamps and sell lamps externally. If this happens, then the selling price of the lamps will be 130. The incremental cost, the further processing cost of converting the switches into lamps is component cost which is 50. Other variable cost which is 40 that is relevant. Fixed cost is not relevant. Are you able to understand? Yes. Apart from that, variable cost of electrical division is also important which is supply and division which will be 16. So this is cost of receiving division, these two. Okay. And these two is the cost of supply and division. That is the total cost for the company as a whole. Total relevant cost. So from 130, if you reduce the total relevant cost, company can earn 24 rupees for every unit if it converts the switches into lamps and sells it as lamps. Now tell me, company would like to earn 24 or 15, I mean, sorry, or 9. It would like to earn 24, which means there is an additional benefit of 15. Therefore, from company's point of view, internal transfer is more profitable because the company earns 15 rupees extra. So, if you sell externally the switches, company will earn only 9 rupees. If you convert that by transferring it internally into lamps and then sell it as lamps, the company is earning 24. So, therefore, from company's point of view, it's beneficial to transfer internally and then convert that into lamps and then sell it as lamps. Got it? Chalo, next. Coming on to third part of the question. Do you feel that divisional managers should accept the interdivisional transfers in principle? If yes, what should be the TP? Let's try to fix the TP now. So you know that minimum TP is nothing but VC plus OC, which is 25. This we have already calculated as first, first part of the question. Maximum TP, you need to think from receiving division's perspective and there are only two options. The money that receiving division possess, which is nothing but NMR or the external buying price, whichever is less. Now, NMR is nothing but net marginal revenue, final sales revenue minus further processing cost. What is the final sales revenue? Here we have calculated 130 minus further processing cost is nothing but cost of the receiving division, which is 50 plus 40, which is 90. So 130 minus 90, receiving division has got 40 in its pockets to pay to the supply and division are able to understand for buying the intermediate product you got it external buying price there is no information in the question so let's forget about it so 40 it has got in its pockets are able to understand so which means the maximum tp can be 40 and the minimum tp can be 25 so there is a possibility of internal transfer are you able to get me right so this can be your tp range and finally Suggest the steps to be taken by chief executive of the company to change the attitude of the divisional heads if they are against the interdivisional transfers that we have already seen. So this is a goal conflict scenario where, uh, you know, these individual divisional managers, they are fighting with each other. They are not agreeing for a good transfer price. Then the solution can be two. Either it can be dual rate transfer pricing system or it can be two part transfer pricing system and which we have told you already. So there are two solutions, dual rate, two part. You got the point, right? So that's it. We are done with this particular sum. Okay, guys, let's look at the final question, which is seventh one of our current session, because I wanted to get this under one and a half hours. That's why I'm going very fast. <laughs> Even my throat is also paining. It's okay. Right. So this will be the last one. It's a, it's a good one. It's a big one as well. Okay. With this, we'll wind up the session. Right. Shallow. Now see you. Great Vision manufactures a wide range of optical products, including lenses and surveillance cameras. Division A manufactures the lenses, while Division B manufactures surveillance cameras. Okay. The lenses that Division A manufactures is of standard quality. 
that has a number of applications due to huge demand in the market for its products division a is operating at full capacity okay it sells its lenses in the open market for 140 per lens the variable cost of the production for each lens is 110 while the total production cost is 125 per lens okay The total production cost of the camera by Division B is 400 each. <coughs> Currently, Division B procures lens from foreign vendors. The cost per lens would be 170. The management of the Great Vision has proposed to take advantage of the in-house production capabilities and consequently, the procurement cost of lens would reduce. It is proposed that Division B should buy an average of 5000 lenses each month from Division A at 120 per lens. The estimate cost of the surveillance camera is as below. Other components purchased from external vendors 150. Cost of lens purchase from Division A 120, other variable cost 30, fixed overheads 50, total cost of the camera 350. Each surveillance camera is sold for 410. The margin for each camera is low since competition in the market is high. Any increase in price of the camera would reduce the market share. Therefore, Division B cannot pay Division A beyond 120 per lens procured. Great Visions management uses return on investment as a scale to measure the divisional performance and marginal costing approach for decision making. So first one, analyze the behavioral consequences of each division when division A supplies lenses to division B at 120 per lens. Substantiate your answer based on the information given in the problem. Okay. So let's have a look into that. So behavioral consequences of division A. Division A is currently operating at full capacity that is given in the question, which means its entire production is being sold to the external market. So when you have to transfer internally, obviously what will be your minimum TP, variable cost plus opportunity cost. We have seen this already. So minimum TP is nothing but total relevant cost of division A, which is variable cost plus opportunity cost. So 110 plus 30, how much it comes, Nana? 140. Is that clear? Right. So from the above calculation, it is clear that division A will never accept a TP less than 140 because 140 is the cost for division A. Okay, right. Which is variable cost plus opportunity cost. So if division A accepts TP of 120, then for every unit, it will have a loss of 5 rupees because its total cost itself is 125. Or you will understand. And also the contribution will be reduced from 30 per unit to 10 per unit because it will be losing 20 rupees. Or you will understand. 140, 120. Ultimately, it will be losing 20. So this will adversely affect the division A's return on investment. Current return on investment is profit is this much, you know, uh, total cost. So profit divided by total cost, investment is nothing but total cost, right? So profit divided by total cost into 100, right now it's ROI is 12%. If TP of 120 is accepted, then this 12% ROI will be reduced and division A may not be eligible for incentives or bonus based on ROI and that may lead to demotivation for the manager of division A, which will not be in the interest of the company if he gets demotivated because that will reduce his efficiency and that is not good for the company. Are you able to get me? Right. What about behavioral consequence of division B? Right now, total cost of division B is 400. Right now, the selling price of division B is 410. That is there in the question. Right now, division B is earning a profit of 10 rupees. So what is the return on investment right now for division B? Okay, it is 10 rupees divided by its total cost is 400. That is the investment into 100, 2.5% only right now. Division B is, B is buying from outside. Okay, if the intermediate product is purchased internally at a price of 120, then what happens earlier it is buying from outside at 170 given in the question from the external vendor right now you are buying internally at 120 which means straight away you will save what 50 rupees your cost will get reduced by 50 so which means your profit will get increased by 50 so which means earlier your profit is 10 but now your profit is going to be 60 your cost will get reduced by 50 which means now your cost is only 350 so revised profit divided by revised cost now your revised ROI is 17.14 percent from what 2.5 percent are you able to get me? So therefore, ROI of division B has got substantially increased from 2.5% to 17.14%. Therefore, division B will accept the TP of 120. So the behavioral concept of division A is it will not accept. The behavioral concept of division B is it will accept because of so-and-so reasons which we have explained. Like this, you have to explain in the examination. Otherwise, you will not get marks. Everything has to be explained. You see the way I have written like that, you have to explain it. Got it? Chalo. Moving on to the second question. Analyze if it, it would be beneficial for the company as a whole for division A to supply the lenses to division B at 120 per lens. Let us see whether it will be beneficial for the company as a whole. Right now it is not beneficial for the supply division, but it is beneficial for the receiving division. Let's see whether it is beneficial for the company as a whole. Now, 
analysis of benefit for the company as a whole loss to the company due to internal transfer of 5000 units is how much will be the loss 30 rupees per unit because the supply and region has to sacrifice the external sales which means for every external sales that it sacrifices for the sake of internal transfer it will lose 30 and 30 is real profit so company also will lose 30 so 5000 units into 30 how much you will be losing 1 lakh 50000 this is because internal transfer can happen only by sacrificing external sales and this sacrifice of 30 is not only the sacrifice for the supply division it is a sacrifice for the company as well because it is real money it is real money okay now what about so this is what the company will lose because of sacrificing internal i mean external sales for the sake of internal transfer but how much it will gain let us see benefit to the company as a whole because of internal transfer is earlier your receiving division is buying from outside at 170 but now if you sacrifice buying from outside at 170 and buy internally from company's perspective earlier company through receiving division is paying 170 to the external vendor now company can manufacture through supply division at 110 itself which means company will save 60 rupees for every unit that the receiving division stops buying from outside and starts buying from inside company will save 60 which means ultimately the company will save for 5000 units how much 3 lakhs so here company will lose 1 lakh 50000 through supply division but company will gain 3 lakhs through receiving division therefore ultimately company will be benefiting 1 lakh 50 so the conclusion is since the net benefit is positive from company's point of view there should be internal transfer Earlier, Division B used to buy intermediate product from external vendor at 170. Now, instead, it can be manufactured from inside at 110, thereby savings of 60 per unit manufactured internally for the company. Got the point? So, from company's point of view, it's good. Internal transfer should happen. Third one. Do you feel that divisional managers should accept the interdivisional transfers in principle if he has calculated the range of TP? Let's calculate the range of TP. First, minimum TP from supply and division's point of view, maximum TP from receiving division's point of view. Minimum TP means what total relevant cost of the supply and division, which is nothing but in this case, because it has to sacrifice external sales for the sake of internal transfer, it will be variable cost plus opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is nothing but contribution loss, that is benefit lost, which is nothing but selling price minus variable cost, which is 140 minus 110, which comes around 30 from the question. And your minimum TP will be VC plus OC, which is 140. Maximum TP will be what Nana? NMR that is the money that receiving division possesses or external buying price whichever is less. NMR is nothing but external selling price of the receiving division minus further processing cost of the receiving division. External selling price of the receiving division is 410. Further processing cost of the receiving division that is own cost of the receiving division is 180. You can see it from the question. Okay. I don't have time to show the question and answer simultaneously. Okay. Because we are doing rapid, 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 rapid revision. Okay. External buying price of course it is 170 from the external vendor. So, whichever is less is what receiving division will pay. Even though it has got 230 in its pockets, it can buy from outside at 170. So, maximum it will pay you 170 only. Are you able to get me? So, therefore, minimum TP is 140 and maximum TP is 170. So, internal transfer is possible, making both the divisional managers happy. You see, anything within the range is possible. Normally, it will be average. 140 plus 170 divided by 2. You got the point? Chalo, finally, next step. Advice, alternative transfer pricing models that the chief executive of the company can consider in order to change the attitude of the divisional. The moment you see this, you know the answer. Dual rate transfer pricing system as well as two part transfer pricing system. Okay. Let's move on to the last one. Calculate the range of TP if division A has excess capacity and can accommodate the internal requirement of 5000. If there is excess capacity, what will be your minimum TP? Total relevant cost of supply and division, which is nothing but variable cost only because when there is excess capacity, there is no need to sacrifice. So, no opportunity cost due to excess capacity because no sacrifice, no contribution lost. Therefore, total relevant cost will be variable cost which is 110 and maximum TP will be NMR or EVP. Th that will not change. NMR is nothing but the money that I possess which is 410 minus 180 okay, or external buying price whichever is less. So, the answer is 170. Therefore, 110 is less than TP is less than 170 will be your answer. Got the point? Right guys, so that's it. We have solved as many problems as possible which I feel, uh, you know, a little bit, uh, you know, important and conceptually learning questions from your examination perspective. Now the time is 1 hour 34 minutes. I hope I have not wasted your one and a half hour. My target was to cover at least 70% of this particular chapter in this one and a half hour. I hope I have tried it to the best possible. Uh, so if you have liked this particular video and the effort, definitely hit that like button because our competitors are very busy hitting the dislike button. 
and uh, comment it what you feel because the moment i see your comments i'll try to put more efforts like this and i'll try to help you guys as much as possible from my perspective as a teacher thank you so much guys love you all all the best for your exam guys be confident and i'll come out with one or two videos with two or three minutes what are the tricks that i've followed when i've written my examination i hope that will help you guys so stay tuned to our youtube channel thank you so much all the best guys you will rock smp Right guys, hello, uh, welcome to PK Sir classes. This is your CA Prasanna Kumar, PK Sir. So we're gonna start with a uh, uh, revision lecture of decision making chapter. Now, uh, so many of you guys have messaged me that uh, especially with respect to concepts, you wanted uh, uh, a full in-depth revision classes with respect to decision making chapter. So here it is and let's start. Shalom. Now coming on to decision making, okay, what is decision making first of all? So it's a, on an average, every attempt it comes for 10 marks and I can say if at all out of generally I prioritize chapters uh, when I teach my classes based on this. So out of 10, decision making will be seven. So which means it's neither too important nor it is unimportant chapter, which means you can say it's a, it's, it's comes under B category. Let's put it that way. B and A category in between are able to understand. So anyways, so let's keep that aside. Let's get into the revision classes now. Decision making is all about taking decisions means what uh, to take decisions. Let's say we'll classify our cost based on variability in relation to base quantity means what you take a cost base quantity normally will be units. I've given in brackets that it is units and you see if the units or output changes, what is happening to the cost? Okay. If cost also changes proportionality along with the output, we call it as variable cost. If cost remains constant and only the output changes, then we call it as what fixed cost. And if both of them change, but they change disproportionately, then we call it a semi-variable cost. So like that, we classify cost into these three categories and then use that information to take decisions. Because you know that when you're trying to take decision, fixed cost is irrelevant. Why? Because whether you take the decision or you do not take the decision, fixed cost remains constant. Therefore, it is irrelevant for taking a particular decision. Therefore, to take a decision, definitely you need to classify cost into these three categories. And in other words, this is nothing but decision making in a simple way, right? Also, we need to classify cost into relevant cost and irrelevant cost to take decisions. So what are relevant costs? Those costs which you consider while you are taking decision, we call it as relevant cost. Irrelevant cost means those costs which do, you do not consider or which you ignore when you are taking decisions, we call it as irrelevant cost. Examples of relevant cost or opportunity cost, variable cost, incremental fixed cost or specific fixed cost or additional fixed cost. Okay. Irrelevant cost means fixed cost, sunk cost. Fixed cost means here we are talking about normal fixed cost or we can also call it as absorbed fixed cost or we can also call it as general fixed cost or we can also call it as allocated fixed cost allocated general absorbed all these things comes under irrelevant cost <coughs> incremental additional okay specific they will come under relevant cost so this is very important for you keep that in mind okay now let's have a bird's eye view of the entire chapter what are all the concepts that we're gonna see break even point pv ratio shutdown point indifference point further process or not decision making scenario break even chart financial and non-financial and ethical considerations when you are trying to take a decision, margin of safety, limiting factor, make or buy. These are all the concepts that we're going to cover in this particular chapter. So this is just a rough idea, okay, a bird's eye view. Now, coming on to PV ratio, I hope you guys are aware of PV ratio. It is also called as profit volume ratio or contribution sales ratio. What is PV ratio? Basically, it is a basic indicator of profitability of any business. Now, you might say that, see, why would PV ratio indicate profitability? Why? Because PV ratio talks about contribution percentage. This is the most important point that you have to remember. A small change in thought process really makes a huge difference when you are solving sums. Many a times people do not understand this, that PV ratio is nothing but contribution percentage. Suddenly, when you know that PV ratio is contribution percentage, all of a sudden when you start solving sums, the simple change in thought process will make wonders for you to solve the problems. Okay. So hereafter, whenever I talk about PV ratio, you just remember that, okay, PV ratio is nothing but contribution percentage. There is a matter. Okay. It is a basic indicator of profitability of any business. And these are all the formulas that we're going to use to calculate PV ratio. Okay. What are they? Contribution per unit by selling price per unit into 100 or total contribution by total sales into 100 or uh, 100 minus variable cost ratio. Are you able to understand? Variable cost ratio is nothing but percentage of variable cost. Now, you know that suppose variable cost is 50 
and uh, selling price is 100 then your contribution is 50 right because contribution is nothing but selling price minus variable cost are you able to understand so selling price always represents 100 percent so therefore from 100 percent if you reduce variable cost percentage in this example i call it as 50 which means 50 percent then what you resultantly get is nothing but pv ratio correct it's a simple logic right why because variable cost plus contribution is nothing but selling price so when selling price is taken equivalent as 100 percent then obviously from that if you reduce variable cost you get contribution if you reduce contribution you get variable cost either way are you able to get me so that is also one formula so variable cost ratio is nothing but variable cost percentage which is nothing but variable cost by sales into 100 pretty simple and so these are all the formulas for pv ratio contribution per unit by selling price per unit into 100 contribution by sales into 100 100 minus variable cost ratio or 1 minus variable cost ratio depending upon what kind of formula you have got if your variable cost ratio is like 60 percent then 100 minus 60 percent your pv ratio will be 40 percent if your variable cost ratio is 0.6 then 1 minus 0.6 your pv ratio will be 0.4 which is nothing but 40 percent so depending upon the necessity you can use whichever the formula you want then change in contribution divided by change in sales into 100 that formula also you can use to calculate what pv ratio at last you have this one change in profit by change in sales into 100 i called it as residual one means you should use this formula as a last resort last resort means in any question if he has asked you to calculate pv ratio try to use this formula this one this one and this one still if you are not able to get the answer then as a last resort you try to use this particular formula are you able to get me right anyways so let's say selling price is 100 variable cost is 60 then your contribution is 40 then pv ratio will be contribution by selling price into 100 which is 40 percent or 100 minus variable cost ratio variable cost is 60 so if you reduce 60 percent from 100 you get 40 percent which is nothing but pv ratio pretty simple right Shalom. Now let's move on to the next one. Next one is BEP, break even point. So what is break even point? The first thing that you have to understand is it's a sales level at which a firm ends up in no profit, no loss situation. That particular sales level, we call it as break even point. Very important. So this is an equation that all of you are aware of. From sales, if you reduce variable cost, you get contribution. From that, if you reduce fixed cost, you get your profit. Everybody is aware of this. But at BEP, we know that profit will be zero. When profit is zero, it means that your contribution should be equals to fixed cost. Correct? That's why I've put equals to over here. Right? So if profit is nil, then your contribution must be equals to fixed cost, which means at break even point, your contribution must be equals to fixed cost. This keep it in mind. This is very important for us, especially when we are solving sums. Okay? Keep this in mind. Okay, now we have a formula for break even point. Let's try to understand how this formula has come. Suppose selling price is 10 rupees, okay, variable cost is 8 rupees, then your contribution is 2 rupees, right? Let's say fixed cost is 1000. If you sell one unit, you'll be getting 2 rupees into your pockets, correct? So which means you need to recover a cost of 1000, but if you sell one unit, you'll be getting a contribution of 2 rupees. To recover the cost of 1000, how many units you need to sell? For every unit, it is 2, which means how many units I need to sell? 1000 by 2, which means 500 units I need to sell. When I sell 500 units, okay, then only my fixed cost will be completely recovered. Then what about variable cost? Sir? The moment you are talking about contribution, already your variable cost is recovered. That's what you mean by contribution. When I say I'm talking about contribution, already variable cost is recovered. So my only worry is fixed cost. And now fixed cost is also recovered at 500 units, which means your total cost is recovered, which means this is your break-even point. So at this level, fixed cost is recovered fully and variable cost is already recovered the moment you are talking about contribution therefore total cost is recovered and this we call it as break even point now how did you get your break even point 1000 by 2 now what is 1000 fixed cost what is 2 contribution therefore your formula for break even point is what fixed cost divided by contribution per unit if you want your answer in terms of units if you want your answer in terms of rupees very simple instead of contribution you divide it with contribution percentage now contribution percentage is nothing but pv ratio Therefore, fixed cost divided by PV ratio will give you same break-even point, but in terms of rupees instead of units. Are you able to get me? Pretty simple. Shalom. Let's move on. Once your total cost is recovered, we call it as break-even point. Till here, it's fine. But at final level, you need to learn some important points. What is that? There are certain presumptions behind the BEP formula. Now, what are those presumptions behind the BEP formula? You need to presume that selling price is constant, variable cost is constant, Fixed cost in total is constant. The relationship between cost and revenue line is linear, which means uh, it goes like this. Okay, that's what you call it as linear relationship. Anyways, that's not that important. That's why I put an into over here. These three points are very important. What do you mean by that? It means 
if at all in a question you have been asked to calculate BEP, you should not blindly jump into question and then try to calculate break even point by using the formula that is fixed cost divided by contribution per unit blindly. Are you able to understand? You need to check whether these conditions are satisfied. Only if they are satisfied cumulatively, then only you can apply BEP formula to find BEP. Now, please try to understand that break even point is not a formula. It's a sales level at which your total cost of both the options, I mean, sorry, it's a sales level at which your total cost uh, is completely recovered. Are you able to understand? So, break even point is a sales level. It is not a formula. For our convenience, we converted that into a formula. Are you able to understand? So, if you want to use BP formula, then all these conditions must be satisfied. Say, for example, if there is a question in which selling price per unit is not constant, it means can I apply BP formula in that particular question? You can't. Suppose variable cost per unit is changing. Can you apply BP formula to calculate BP? No. Suppose fixed cost in total is changing. So, can you apply BP formula to calculate BP in that particular question? The answer is no. But still, you need to calculate break even point. Now, how to calculate is a different thing altogether. Are you able to understand? But what you guys need to understand is that if these conditions are not satisfied, I cannot blindly apply BP formula to calculate BP. That is a point that you have to remember. Okay. This will really come in handy for you when you are solving what sums. Okay. Coming on to the next thing. Here you have something called loss and I have written it as unrecorded fixed cost. This is very important. I told you now small, small changes in your thought process makes wonders in solving sums. So here also I told you that uh, you should be thinking of PV ratio as contribution percentage. And here I'm again telling you that loss should be seen as fixed cost that has not been recovered. Are you able to understand? Hereafter, always remember, whenever you solve problems, you should always feel that loss is nothing but unrecovered fixed cost. You got the point? Very important. Chala, moving on to the next one. Break even chart. You can have a look at this chart. So this is your fixed cost. Okay. And this is your total cost. Why this is total cost? Why? Because it starts from here. So it is inclusive of fixed cost. So it starts from here. Therefore, it is total cost. And your revenue line starts from here, obviously, right? And this is the area where your revenue line cuts the cost line from the below. And therefore, we call this as break even point. Okay. And uh, before break even point, this entire area is loss. And this is profit area. Okay. And this is your actual sales level. So, therefore, difference between your actual sales level and this is your BP level. So, difference between your actual sales level and BP level, we call it as margin of safety. Okay. On Y axis, we take revenue and cost. On X axis, we take units. So, this theta, we call it as angle of incidence. So, this angle of incidence is influenced by which one? Selling price and variable cost, which means this is the total cost. So, if variable cost is less, what will happen? This angle will go like this. So, which means your theta will become more. So, therefore, this angle of incidence is influenced by variable cost. Also, this revenue line inclination is influenced by selling price. So, which means if your selling price increases, then what will happen? Assuming that your number of units remains constant, then uh, this, this will go like this, which means again your theta increases. So, your angle of incidence is influenced by selling price as well as variable cost. So, this talks about profit earning ability of your company. So, greater the theta, better it is for the company. And this fixed cost uh, influences your break even point. So right now, because the fixed cost is here, your break even point is here. Suppose if your fixed cost increases and if it is here, then your break even point also will increase. This will be your new break even point. Are you able to understand? So the break even point is influenced by fixed cost. Okay, keep that in mind. Shall I? Next, we're going to look into a concept called margin of safety. What do you mean by margin of safety? Name itself, you have got how much safe your company is. How much safe your means? I'm talking about company. Okay. So obviously, safety is linked with profits. The more profits you earn, the more safer you are. The less the profits that you earn, the less safer you are. It's pretty simple, right? The greater the profits you have, the safer you are, isn't it? Okay, now what is this margin of safety? To put it very simple, this is what is margin of safety. What is that? Sales beyond BEP sales. Okay, if somebody has asked you what is margin of safety, what will be your answer? Sales beyond BEP sales, up and above BEP sales. Therefore, Margin of safety is equal to actual expected sales minus break even point sales, which means sales up and above BEP sales is nothing but margin of safety sales. So, therefore, actual expected sales minus break even point sales is nothing but margin of safety. Are you able to understand? Now, there is a formula for margin of safety as well. That is this one margin of safety in rupees is equal to profit by PV ratio, margin of safety in units is equal to profit divided by contribution per unit. Now, let's try to understand the logic behind this particular formula. So, what is that? First, 
let us look into classical way of calculating profit. What is that? Profit is equal to, we will take total sales. We multiply that with PV ratio. PV ratio is nothing but contribution percentage, I told you. So sales into contribution percentage will give you contribution minus fixed cost will give you profit. This is a classical way of finding profit, correct? Now what I'm going to do is that I'm going to change this particular equation a little bit differently. How? In the place of total sales, I'm going to take margin of safety sales. So profit is equal to margin of safety sales into PV ratio I will multiply minus fixed cost will not come. It will be nil. Why? Because fixed cost is fully recovered. How? Because I'm talking about margin of safety. So when I talk about margin of safety, I'm talking about sales beyond BP sales. So when I talk about sales beyond BP sales, your BP has already been crossed. Once your BP has already been crossed, your fixed cost and all the total cost has been recovered, which means after crossing your BP fixed cost is zero. Therefore, your fixed cost is zero. So when this is zero, then obviously now you try to rewrite this formula. Fixed cost is zero. Margin of safety, send PV ratio this side, which means margin of safety is nothing but profit by PV ratio. That's how we have got this particular formula. Okay. Now, if you want margin of safety in units, then profit divided by PV ratio is nothing but contribution percentage. Instead of contribution percentage, you divide it with contribution per unit. You get your answer in terms of units. Pretty simple. Okay. Next, we have something called income statement, uh, you know, beyond BEP. What is that? When you take margin of safety sales over here, you reduce variable cost to get contribution. But because you have taken margin of safety sales, your fixed cost will be nil, which means your contribution itself will be profit. So this is another important understanding. So when you take sales as margin of safety sales, your contribution itself will be profit. Why? Because your fixed cost will be zero. Your fixed cost will be zero. Very, very, very important. Right? So contribution itself will be your profit. This is another understanding of the concept. Right? Got this? Okay, chala. let's move on. Now let's get to the next point, next concept, and that is shutdown point. Let's try to understand this shutdown point concept now. So let's move on with shutdown point now. Okay. Now, what is shutdown point first of all? Okay. So try to understand that it's a sales level again. See, everything is a sales level. Even break even point is a sales level. So shutdown point is sales level below which you are not recommended to continue your operations or in other words, you are recommended to shut down. Sir, what do you mean by that? Which means shutdown point is a particular sales level. If your actual sales is below the shutdown point sales, you are not recommended to continue your operations. Are you able to understand? Which means you are recommended to shut down when your actual sales is less than shutdown point sales. Now, to take this sort of a decision where your actual expected sales are being compared with shutdown point sales and accordingly you are taking a decision. To do that, first you should know what is your shutdown point sales. Now the biggest question is how to calculate shutdown point sales. To do that, first we need to start with this fixed cost analysis over here. For the purpose of calculating shutdown point, we're going to classify fixed cost into two. One is avoidable fixed cost, the other one is unavoidable fixed cost. Avoidable fixed cost means you can avoid it, you can save it. So therefore it is relevant for decision making. Unavoidable fixed cost means you cannot avoid it, therefore it is irrelevant for decision making. Means what sir? What kind of decision are you trying to take here, whether to shut down your factory or not, or whether to shut down your operations or not? Unavoidable fixed cost means whether you shut down your factory operations or you continue your factory operations, either way, it's going to be incurred. So why should I think about it? Therefore, I will ignore it because whether my decision is yes or no, anyway, in both the cases, it will be incurred. Therefore, it is irrelevant. Avoidable fixed cost means if I take a decision to shut down my factory operations, it will not be incurred. You can avoid it. You can save it. Whereas if you take a decision to continue your operations, then you have to incur it. Therefore, this is relevant for my decision whether to shut down my factory or not. Why? Because it changes. If I shut down, this will be avoided. If I run my factory, then this will be incurred. Examples are depreciation because of wear and tear. So only if you run your factory, it will be incurred. If you shut down your factory, it will not be incurred. But depreciation due to efflux of time, irrespective of whether you shut down the factory or not, time will pass. Therefore, depreciation will happen. Now, rent, it depends upon the agreement that you have with your so-called, you know, uh, the guy who gave you that particular building or the campus on rent. Okay. It depends upon the understanding you have got. It can be avoidable. It can be unavoidable. It depends. Right. Anyways, so this is clear. 
So fixed cost has been classified into two avoidable fixed cost and avoidable fixed cost. This is not relevant for decision making. This is relevant for decision making. There ends a matter. Now let's continue from here. Let's say avoidable fixed cost is 50,000. Just imagine that avoidable fixed cost is 50,000. Right guys, so let's presume uh, that your avoidable fixed cost is 50,000. Okay. Now, which means that in case if you shut down your factory, you will save 50,000, correct? So 50,000 will be your savings. In other words, in CA Inter in financial management, you would have learned that saved outflow is deemed inflow. So when saved outflow is deemed inflow, it means when you're saving 50,000, it's as if you have earned 50,000. Are able to understand? So when you're earning something, I can compare that to contribution. It is not actually contribution, but we will call it as equivalent contribution. That's why we will not actually call it as contribution. We will call it as equivalent contribution. So actually what's happening? We are talking about avoidable fixed cost. And if you shut down your factory, you're going to save this much. Okay. And saved outflow is nothing but deemed inflow, which means you're going to earn 50,000. Saving 50,000 is as if you have earned 50,000. So, which means we can say it is equivalent to as if you have earned a contribution of 50,000. Did I really earn a contribution of 50,000? No, but it's equal to as if you have earned a contribution of 50,000. These are all very important, Nana, because never ever by heart anything. Always try to understand the logics behind the concepts. Okay. So, therefore, I will consider this equivalent to contribution of 50,000. So, which means saving 50,000 avoiding a fixed cost of 50000 it's as if you have is as if you have earned a contribution of 50000 now the next question is if i have to earn a contribution of 50000 how much sales i should have done it is imaginary sales only because once you shut down where is the question of making sales because you have shut down your factory so obviously we are talking about imaginary sales so i'm going to avoid a fixed cost of 50000 which means as if I've earned 50000 which means as if I've earned a contribution of 50000 If at all I need to earn a 50000 contribution normally, then I should have made sales. I should have made sales of how much? Divide contribution by contribution percentage. Let's say PV ratio is 40% in your company, which means you should have made sales of 125000 to earn a contribution of 50000 are able to understand which means saving 50,000 avoiding 50,000 worth of fixed cost is as if equivalent to making sales of 1,25,000 that 1,25,000 is nothing but shutdown point sales so from the from the concept you can easily say that shutdown point sales is nothing but imaginary sales are able to understand now suppose if you continue your operations let's look at that data if you continue your operations your expected actual sales is 1 lakh. You are expecting that you will make a sales of 1 lakh. And you know that your PV ratio is 40%. We have presumed that it has 40% for example purpose. Which means you will earn 40,000 contribution in case if you run your factory. But if you shut down your factory, you will earn 50,000. Would you like to earn 40,000 or 50,000? 50, 50,000. Therefore, I will shut down my factory. In other words, if you run your factory, you will be expecting to sell 1 lakh. Whereas if you shut down your factory, you are making a sales of 1,25,000. Now, don't ask me, sir, if you shut down my factory, where is the question of sales? It's imaginary sales. If you shut down your factory, you are going to save a fixed cost worth 50,000, which means as if you have earned a contribution worth 50,000, which means as if you have made sales of how much? 1,25,000. In reality, you did not do it. But that is what you have done. Imaginary. Are you able to understand? Therefore, this expected actual sales will be compared with shutdown sales. And your expected actual sales is less than shutdown sales. Therefore, it is recommended to shut down. That's what is the definition here. Shutdown point is the level of sales, which is 1,25,000. Below which you are not recommended to continue your operations. Your expected actual sales is below that. Therefore, you are not recommended to continue your operations. You shut it down. So conclusion, it is recommended to shut down based on financial considerations. Again, very important at final level, especially new syllabus. Based on numbers, however, before taking any final decision, the company should consider the following non-financial factors. What are they? You should consider your goodwill. If you shut down your factory temporarily only, you are not winding up your company. You are going to shut it down temporarily with an intention to reopen it up. In the meanwhile, whether it is six months or one year, your goodwill will be lost. You will lose your market share to your competitor. You will lose your skilled employees. Skilled employees means they are skilled. Be therefore, they are very difficult to recruit back once you have lost them. 
your machines may get deteriorated due to idleness if at all there are any machines like that and if at all you have any perishable raw metals they will be lost they will be gone so these things also you have to consider this is very important for us especially in new syllabus at final level got the point non financial factors in decision making you got that all right let's move on to the next concept so the next concept is limiting factor then you can ask me sir you have written constraints and bottleneck also here i have written that is because many a times students are getting confused between these three you know almost similar terms they are not exactly the same but they are almost similar therefore people are getting confused therefore i thought that this is the right you know moment in decision making chapter where you can really get a clarity with respect to these three particular concepts that is constraints limiting factor as well as bottleneck okay right so first of all let's start with what is a constraint anything that makes achieving your objective difficult than it would otherwise be is a constraint for example it's a, it's a very broad term means what it includes everything that's what i've written over here sir what do you mean by that sir let's say you want to reach your destination you start from your office you want to reach your home which is around 10 kilometers away so your objective is to reach your destination that is your objective now what is a constraint anything that makes achieving your objective difficult than it would otherwise be which means anything that makes achieving your 10 km destination difficult than it would otherwise be will be a constraint which means if speed breaker is a constraint because if there is no speed breaker your destination reaching would have been smoother your journey would have been lot more smoother and comfortable if there is a narrow lane and because of that if there is traffic it's making your journey making achieving your objective difficult than it would otherwise be if there is no narrow lane things would have been lot more comfortable same goes with traffic signal same goes with potholes so which means constraint can be anything that makes achieving your objective difficult than it would otherwise be okay sir which means limiting factor is a constraint yes bottleneck is a constraint yes constraint is a big thing it's a broad term it includes everything so all limiting factors are constraints all bottlenecks are constraints but all constraints are not limiting factor so limiting factor and bottleneck is a narrow term when compared to constraint clear now what is a limiting factor limiting factor is a constraint first of all bottleneck is also a constraint then what is limiting factor basically limiting factor means scarce resources anything whose availability is limited whose resource availability is limited that is a limiting factor for example machinery's availability is limited laborers availability is limited material availability is limited that's why it is called limiting factor because it has got the ability to limit your production if machinery's availability is limited you cannot produce even though you have a demand if material raw metal availability is limited you cannot produce even though you have a demand which means these resources which are limited has got the ability to limit your production that's why it is called limiting factor you got the point what is bottleneck it is also a constraint it is same as limiting factor we will see this in theory of constraints chapter so what is bottleneck anything that makes achieving your objective slow or limited is a bottleneck for manufacturing your product say for example there are three machines machine 1 has got a capacity of 1000 units machine 2 has got a capacity of 500 units machine 3 has got a capacity of 800 units and you need all the three machines to manufacture product a or b suppose then because of machine 2 you are restricting your production to 500 which means machine 2 is a bottleneck in other words bottleneck and limiting factor both are nothing but the same so you got this i hope now this particular confusion is clear <coughs> uh we will see this concept of limiting factor later in depth in depth in the sense almost uh, you know you do have an idea right now but how to use limiting factor to take decisions is what we'll see later right now just the difference between these three is enough are you able to get me shall now let's move on to the next concept what is the next concept calculation of break even point under activity based cvp method what do you mean by that very important concept so listen carefully normally the formula for break even point is fixed cost divided by contribution per unit so everybody is aware of this right break even point formula is equal to fixed cost divided by contribution per unit that is your usual formula what is the logic behind this formula total cost can be divided into fixed cost and variable cost based on the variability of the cost with the output so you take output on one hand you take uh, cost on other hand whichever varies along with the output proportionately that is variable cost whichever varies along with the output disproportionately that is semi variable cost whichever does not vary along with the output that is fixed cost so we know that so the logic behind this formula is you have classified your total cost into variable and fixed cost based on whether your cost varies along with the output or not correct huh? 
but any cost that does not vary along with the output need not be fixed cost as it can vary with something other than the output logical right that cost we will call it as non unit based fixed cost non unit based means these fixed costs vary with something other than units that's why it is called non unit based fixed cost non unit based means these fixed costs will vary with something other than units non units which means something other than units so the logic of that we are trying to say here is that just because a particular cost does not vary with respect to output straight away why are you classifying it as fixed cost it is not varying with the output fine that doesn't make it a fixed cost it could vary with something other than output other than units that's why it is called as non unit based fixed cost which means those fixed costs can vary with something called uh, you know number of setups these fixed costs will can vary with something called number of engineering hours these fixed costs can vary with something called number of equations or you able to understand other than units they can vary with something other than units so i have taken some examples over here setup cost which can vary with number of setups engineering cost which can vary with number of engineering hours material requisition cost which can vary with number of requisitions inspection cost which can vary with number of inspections so all these are activities basically setup cost means it is backed up by setup activity engineering cost engineering activity material requisition cost material requisition activity over here inspection cost inspection activity are you able to understand so after considering this logic we will revise our bp formula like this what is that original fixed cost plus this is also fixed cost only but this is that fixed cost which will vary with something other than output all these are fixed cost only but they are varying with something other than output na this fixed cost is varying with number of setups this fixed cost is varying with number of engineering hours this fixed cost is varying with number of requisitions this fixed cost is varying with number of inspections therefore number of setups into cost per setup number of engineering hours into cost per engineering hour number of inspections into cost per inspection number of material requisitions into cost per requisition divided by contribution per unit plus original fixed cost what do you mean by this original fixed cost that portion of fixed cost which remains constant irrespective of anything that changes means this fixed cost is that fixed cost which will not change even if the unit changes this will remain constant number of setups changes this will remain constant number of material requisition changes this will remain constant number of inspections also it will it will not change with anything that's why it is referred as original fixed cost okay although original fixed cost is not an official term it should be called as fixed cost only but for your understanding i have called it as original fixed cost so that it will be easy for you to understand that's it nothing more than that or able to understand so original fixed cost means that portion of fixed cost which remains constant irrespective of anything that changes even if unit changes it will not change even if anything other than units also changes it will not change it will remain exactly the same got the point right chalo i hope it's clear over here so with this we'll wind up this particular session okay part 1 of the revision of decision making in the next session okay we will go with part 2 of decision making or you will understand uh, too much if we go at a moment then it will be very difficult for you uh, so this is the entire concepts i'm going to teach from power notes 2.0 so if you want to buy this power notes 2.0 hard copy color you can buy it uh, from our pkser classes app i'll put the link of the app in the description if you are using android phone you can just go to your google play store and search with the name pkser classes you will find our app in our app you go to store column under store column you will find power notes hard copy you can buy it and you'll get it normally within 5 to 6 days and you can have that hard copy and you can follow our revision lectures so stay subscribed to our channel you can share this link to your friends as well because like this so many revision videos based on power notes 2.0 is gonna be uploaded and i'm gonna help you in attacking your december 2021 exams in a very good way whatever the help that i can do from my side i'm gonna do it as you can see now the time is 4:11 am i think i have started doing this from 3:20 am in the morning so whatever the time that is available with me i'll create time and then i'll try to do this revision videos for you guys so i am with you don't worry okay so if you want to get best out of this revision videos i will rather advise you to purchase this power notes 2.0 uh, it is around 299 pages it's very handy it will be very useful for you to revise the day before the exams it contains concepts of all the chapters okay at one single area so that you can revise it very fast and go on attack the exams in a very positive way right okay so with this we'll wind up the session over here in the next session we'll go with the remaining concepts of decision making chapter right guys thank you so much bye bye meet you in part 2
right anna hello friends uh, welcome back so we are done with the first part of the revision of decision making okay i think till here we are done we are finished right so now we're going to continue with this one okay let's go to the next concept ready guys yeah so this is a very important concept nana right marginal costing versus absorption costing in what way it is important sir uh, in your inter itself this particular topic is important but at final level uh it is important from the perspective of decision making chapter as well as it is important for standard costing as well as well as it is important when you are trying to club abc activity based costing with either standard costing or decision making you will understand what i am trying to say only if you solve problems but what i am trying to tell you one thing is for sure that this is a very important concept even at final level okay it's not like directly there will be a question where he'll ask you uh you know explain the differences between marginal costing or versus absorption costing or there will be a 16 mark or 20 mark question from this particular area it's not like that so what i'm trying to tell you is that the understanding of this concept is must for you to understand lot of other concepts for example there is something called reconciliation of profits in standard costing you know that it's a very important topic at new syllabus final level in ca final scmp because it i think uh, reconciliation sums has been asked thrice so far that model but that model you will not be able to understand with logics unless you have clarity with respect to marginal costing versus absorption costing or able to understand so in that way it is really important otherwise you just need to by heart uh, the reconciliation in standard costing without understanding any logics if you want to understand the logics then this is it like this knowing this concept is very important i hope you guys are able to understand what i'm trying to tell you anyways so we'll go lot deeper i'll try to dig deeper we'll try to connect lot of concepts uh there will be lot of interconnecting being done as well as we'll try to understand the logic of it okay so that we'll be able to remember that easily so what is this concept of marginal costing versus absorption costing first one marginal costing is used for decision making absorption costing is used for external reporting like in cost records what we do we basically follow absorption costing methodology and then we try to present our cost records so it is for external reporting marginal costing is a technique absorption costing is a method So I hope in inter you guys have already seen. I'll just try to brush up the chapters that you have studied in your CA inter or CMA inter. Marginal costing, standard costing, budgeting. All these are examples of techniques. Unit costing, process costing, joint and by product, job costing, batch costing. All these are examples of methods. Okay, right. Coming on to the major difference now. Now we're going to look into the income statement. How income statement looks like as per marginal costing and absorption costing without stock. Without stock. there is a reason why i have written without stock here we'll try to understand that right now just focus on the concepts one more important thing many students are asking me sir you are uh, teaching from this particular power notes 2.0 where can we get it you can buy the color hard copy okay of power notes 2.0 from pk sir classes app the name of the app itself is pk sir classes okay So, if you are an Android user, listen carefully, Nana. I am again repeating because many students have uh, have been messaging us. If you are an Android user, just go to Google Play Store. I hope everybody knows what is Google Play Store, okay? And search for the name PK Sir Classes. Just like this, PK Gap Sir and Classes. You will find our app. Go to the app. In that you will have store. Go to the store. In that you will find a product that is uh, Power Notes 2.0 hot copy, color hot copy. Product will be there. You can purchase it directly. by making payment through any of the means okay if you are an ios user that is if you are using apple iphone and stuff like that then you have to go to apple app store from that app store you need to search with the name my institute this is the app my institute once you download my institute app then you have to use the code ycwr that is our classes code then automatically the app gets converted into pk sir classes app and again same procedure from that you can go to the store and from that store you can buy okay right you can get the hot copy is that clear so you can keep that hot copy with you and follow these revision classes that will really come in handy for you especially for your exams and <clears throat> again i'm telling you almost 70% of the stock is done it's it's been uh, i think one month since we have launched the hot copy so 70% of the stock is done so only 30% is left over so you guys try to place the order as early as possible otherwise after that once it is out of stock it will at least take another two or two months at least for us to get it back to replenish that therefore whoever uh, is trying to follow my revision lectures 
and uh, you want you are going to write exam in december i would rather ask you guys to place the order asap meanwhile you just follow these revision lectures which i'm going to upload in the youtube and uh, in few days you'll get the you know power notes i hope it will really come in handy because all the concepts has been kept in 299 pages okay so 299 pages is something that will come in really handy for you the day before the exam all concepts of all chapters you will see it when i'm going through the revision sessions you will be able to understand what i'm trying to say anyways now so that power notes is what i'm using over here and then i'm trying to take you revision sessions over here right anyways now moving on to the next one income statement so if you can see when it comes to marginal costing this is the way the income statement looks like first you'll have sales from that you'll reduce variable cost you get your contribution from that you reduce fixed cost you get your profit all of you guys are aware of this kind of presentation of income statement as per marginal costing as per absorption costing also the income statement is presented this way first for from sales you'll reduce factory cost you get your gross profit then you reduce administration and selling and distribution over it now normally in regular class i'll take a lot of time to teach this because obviously regular class is beyond 240 hours uh, even in crash also for that matter but uh, you know when it comes to revision session since we don't have time but i'll just tell you one thing always when it comes to manufacturing company you guys imagine that there are three buildings okay imagine that there are three buildings it will be easy for you to understand the concepts one is factory administration building and sales and distribution just imagine that as a showroom are you able to understand whenever you are trying to prepare an income statement as per absorption costing you just need to reduce these three buildings cost the first building is factory whatever the cost that is incurred inside the factory building we call it as factory cost second building third building so that it will be very easy for you to recollect okay so when it comes to marginal costing it's pretty simple sales minus variable cost you get your contribution minus fixed cost you get your profit we know this pro forma uh, when it comes to absorption costing this is the way sales minus first building gross profit minus remaining two buildings there ends the matter now if you look at the way the income statement has been presented it has been unique right the reason is when it comes to marginal costing uh, when you are trying to prepare this income statement you consider variability of a particular cost and you ignore functionality of a particular cost functionality means there are three types of functions one is factory function administration function and selling and distribution function inside a factory so if a if you try to classify your cost based on functions there are only three types of cost factory cost based on that factory function or manufacturing function administration function at so administration cost and selling and distribution function so selling and distribution cost so when you are trying to prepare your income statement as per marginal costing what is there in your mind you always try to find out whether a particular cost is variable or not if a cost is variable it will come here if a cost is not variable it will come here you are not worried about to what function does it belong to you are not worried about whether it belongs to manufacturing function or administration function or selling and distribution function i hope you are getting my drift right now coming on to absorption costing the thought process is exactly opposite i consider functionality i ignore what variability which means here if you come and tell me sir there is a variable cost my answer to should my answer should be don't tell me whether it is variable or not just tell me to what function does it belong to does it belong to manufacturing function then it will come here that is factory is nothing but manufacturing right irrespective of whether it is variable cost or fixed cost because i am not worried about whether it is variable or fixed i am only worried about to what function does it belong that's my mindset when i am preparing income statement as per absorption costing system so so therefore because of your mindset change the way you are preparing an income statement their pro forma is different although even though the pro forma is different over here the presentation is different still uh, you reduce the same number of costs therefore profit under marginal costing is equal to profit under absorption costing these two profits are same now you can ask me how is that sir we can just verify here if you see variable cost means inside that variable cost what is present direct material variable direct labor variable variable factory overheads variable administration overheads variable selling and distribution overheads three buildings okay similarly when it comes to fixed cost we have three buildings each building will have its own fixed cost so fixed factory overheads fixed administration overheads and fixed selling and distribution overheads there ends the matter now if you look at this inside factory cost also what do we have inside factory we have got direct material direct labor and because it is factory cost you'll have factory overheads which is variable and fixed right administration overheads variable and fixed selling and distribution overheads variable and fixed if you see in both the cases we have reduced exactly the same items of cost the same eight in number are you able to understand so that's the proof which means profit under marginal costing is exactly equals to profit under absorption costing are you able to understand now let's look at the summary profit under marginal costing is equal to profit under absorption costing provided when there is no stock this is very important provided 
can you see that when there is no stock very 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 important that's the reason when i have prepared income statement i have specifically written without stock this is the reason for that which means what is the contrary statement profit under marginal costing is not equals to profit under absorption costing if there is stock so when there is no stock both the profits are same which means when there is stock both the profits should not be same that's that's how the statement works right now we're going to focus on the second statement now hereafter what is that why profit under marginal costing is not equals to profit under absorption costing if there is stock to understand this particular statement we will uh, we need to imagine certain scenarios okay before that this is some of your basics okay factory cost means inside factory you'll have direct cost as well as indirect cost which is overheads in direct cost you'll have three elements direct material labor and expenses in indirect cost you'll have three elements material labor and expenses direct expense is a pretty rare item so we presume that it does not incur therefore you are left with direct material and direct labor okay indirect cost can also be called as overheads so therefore factory cost is nothing but direct cost plus indirect cost direct cost is nothing but direct material plus direct labor because we have presumed that direct expense does not exist and uh, the indirect cost is nothing but overheads because they are inside the factory we call it as factory overheads foh here means factory overheads okay not fixed overheads keep that in mind so this is your factory cost all the cost inside the administration building are indirect only therefore it is called overheads why because your output or units are manufactured inside the factory and the cost that is being incurred here is indirectly related to the units which are manufactured inside the factory therefore all the costs are indirect here here also all the costs are indirect these are all basics basics of your inter are you able to get me anyways i hope this is clear so this should help you to understand this better okay so anyways now we're gonna focus on this particular sentence now profit under marginal costing is not equals to profit under absorption costing if there is stock let's try to understand what it is to understand that we're gonna imagine three scenarios how many scenarios three scenarios so we'll go through these uh, three scenarios one by one okay so let's start with the first one the first one is your sales will be equals to production the second one sales is less than production and the third one is sales is greater than production so if your sales is equal to production basically it means that there is no stock therefore we already know that if there is no stock then the both the profits are going to be what same that we have already seen so that's what i've written here both the profits will be same but if sales is less than production then it means that there is a net closing stock uh, listen carefully okay net closing stock net closing stock means you can understand that from two possibilities possibility one is your opening stock will be completely zero and closing stock will be some 100 units and thereby there is a net closing stock of 100 possibility number two is both opening stock and closing stock are present in some numbers but closing stock in number is greater than opening stock in number thereby you have a net closing stock in both these cases your production will be greater than sales in other words sales is less than production okay the third scenario is exactly opposite where your sales is greater than production means you can sell more than what you have produced when is that possible when there is opening stock from the previous year so therefore there is net opening stock again there are two possibilities either your closing stock is completely zero therefore you have opening stock and therefore there is a net opening stock of 100 in this example or both opening stock and closing stock are present but opening stock in number is greater than closing stock in number thereby there is net opening stock in both these cases ultimately your sales will be greater than production done so now we have understood these three scenarios now let's try to understand the logic behind this particular sentence how is this possible profit under marginal costing is not equal to profit under absorption costing if there is stock right so we'll start with scenario two which means where there is net closing stock so why profits are different is the first question uh, because of presence of stocks obviously profits are different uh, because the, if there is no stock both the profits are same that we have seen already why presence of stock is affecting your profit why because they are valued differently as per absorption costing and marginal costing so when they are valued differently you know that stocks will influence the profit so when the valuation is different automatically they will either increase or decrease the profit in a different way therefore the profits vary right so valuing them differently is the main reason obviously next you will have two continuous questions why stocks are valued differently and how stocks are valued differently so let's try to answer the first one how stocks are valued differently then we'll answer why stocks are valued differently now if you look at how stocks are valued differently first of all try to imagine where stocks are physically present uh, they are present inside the factory or the godown when they are present inside the factory they will be naturally made up of factory cost we know what is factory cost already i taught you the concept over here so factory cost means direct material, direct labor and factory overheads. 
So come back over here, which means you'll be having direct material, direct labor and factory audits. In factory audits, you'll have variable and fixed. Same logic applies here as well. Now, what is the difference basically? When it comes to marginal costing, you will not have this fixed factory audits. Are you able to understand? This will not be there. Which means as per marginal costing, it is made up of three elements. Direct material, direct labor and variable factory audits. As per absorption costing, it is made up of four elements. Therefore, stock under absorption costing, the stock valuation will be greater than stock valuation as per marginal costing. As you can see, here it is 140 and here it is 110, right? Now, in scenario two, basically what happens, you have net closing stock. So, you know the tendency of closing stock is to increase your profit. So, which means more the closing stock, more will be the profit. Less the closing stock, less will be the profit. So, as per marginal costing, your closing stock value is 110 over here, which means your profit would have got increased by 110. Whereas as per absorption costing, your closing stock valuation is 140, which we have seen already here, which means your profit would have got increased by 140. Therefore, the conclusion is absorption costing profit is greater than marginal costing profit by 30. Are you able to understand? Right? And that 30 is because of this culprit, fixed factory audits. Now let's go to scenario 3. Scenario 3, the only difference is in scenario 2, you will have closing stock. In scenario 3, you will have opening stock. So there is net opening stock, which means tendency of opening stock is to reduce your profit. More opening stock, less profit and less opening stock, more profit. Therefore, as per marginal costing, if there is opening stock value of 110, it means the profit will be reduced by 110 as per marginal costing. Whereas as per absorption costing, because the stock value is 140, the profit will be reduced by 140. Here 140 has got reduced, here 110 only has got reduced, which means marginal costing profit will be greater than absorption costing profit by that 30 rupees. Okay, so we have answered this part of the question. What is that? How stocks are valued differently? Now, the next part of the question is why stocks are valued differently? Well, the reason is because fixed factory rates are treated as period cost. Period cost means expired cost as per marginal costing system. So, expired means that's why they get expired by getting debited in costing pendle account. Whereas, the same fixed factory rates are treated as product cost as per absorption costing system. So, product cost means unexpired. They stay inside the product. So that's why here this is the product. Your fixed factory audits is inside the product because it is treated as product cost. Whereas in marginal costing, it is not inside the product. Why? Because it is treated as period cost and is, it goes and gets debited in costing PL account. Got the point? Anyways. So that is what we try to explain over here. Now. So here I just gave explanation. When you debit something in costing PL account, it is said to be expired. You got the point? Right. Now. Next question is, okay, fine. So why fixed factory audits is treated as product cost as per absorption costing system and why the same fixed factory audits is treated as period cost as per marginal costing system? So you said that fixed factory audits is treated as product cost as per absorption costing system. Therefore, it goes into the product valuation. This is the product closing stock. It goes into the product valuation. Whereas as per marginal costing, it does not go into the product valuation. Instead, it gets expired in the form of period cost by getting debited in costing panel account. What is the logic behind that? So that is what we have asked here. Why fixed factory audits is treated as product cost as per absorption costing system? Why the same fixed factory audits is treated as period cost as per marginal costing system? Well, absorption costing, the purpose is external reporting. Marginal costing, the purpose is decision making. So when you want to take decisions, fixed cost is not relevant. So which means you need to consider it or ignore it. You got to, sorry, ignore it. You ignore it by treating it as period cost. That is the logic behind why fixed factory audits is treated as period cost as per marginal costing system. So when you ignore it, you have to ignore it when you're trying to take decision. So obviously when you treat it as a period cost, it goes and gets debited in costing penal account and it gets ignored. And that's what I want because it is irrelevant for me to take a decision. Whereas when it comes to absorption costing, you are not taking any decision. So therefore no cost is irrelevant, which means all costs are relevant and therefore all the costs are reported and nothing is ignored. Simple logic. You got this? Shalom. Right. Now let's move on to the next one. The next one is concept of absorption. Now coming on to concept of absorption, uh, this is also very important, Anna, so listen carefully. First of all, we need to understand the logic behind why there is a requirement of something called concept of absorption. So unlike your financial accounts, which is prepared at the end of the year, costing is a continuous process which starts from day one itself. Okay. So from day one, you need to know uh, your, you need to manufacture your goods and you need to fix your selling price to sell your goods, which means you need selling price per unit from day one. Normally, presuming that you are a price setter, 
how will you fix your selling price your total cost per unit plus profit markup based on your overall cost of capital that varies from company to company but ultimately you need to know total cost per unit to fix your selling price if you are a price setter but how to find total cost per unit uh, total cost will have two elements direct cost or per unit or prime cost per unit indirect cost per unit in other words overheads when it comes to direct cost per unit to calculate it there is no problem whatsoever it is easy to calculate no complications no issue but when it comes to calculating indirect cost per unit you have two problems uh, problem number one is you do not know what is your overhead cost per unit or indirect cost per unit that is the reason in ca inter you read a separate chapter called overheads where the ultimate utility of overhead chapter is to find overhead cost per unit where you do those three steps primary distribution of overheads, secondary distribution of overheads and absorption of overheads where after the third step you eventually ultimately find overhead cost per unit which is indirect cost per unit you add it to direct cost per unit you get total cost per unit and eventually you fix your selling price so this is first problem and that we eventually solve with the help of overheads chapter we have already learned that in your intern there is second problem as well what is that second problem you do not know what your actual overheads are until you reach the end of the year you will know it only at the end of the year so at the beginning of the year you don't know what's your actual overheads are but we need to fix our selling price from day one itself to do that you need to know total cost per unit from day one itself but you don't know what's your actual overheads are from the day one itself you will know it only at the end of the year you understand the problem so which means basically you do not know what your actual overheads are at the beginning of the year obviously so which means no actual overhead cost per unit which means no total cost per unit, no selling price per unit, you can't do business. So what is the solution for, for this particular problem? Go with expected overheads. When you don't know what your actual overheads are, you go with expected overheads. Something you'll expect, right? That this much will be my expense. Go with that. Which is nothing but budgeted overheads. Expected overheads is nothing but budgeted overheads, right? Isn't, isn't it? Yes. So calculate budgeted overheads, okay? Find out budgeted overhead cost per unit, right? which is nothing but indirect cost per unit, which is not actual, but it is budgeted. You add direct cost per unit to that, which is already ready with us. Total cost you'll get, add profit margin based on your return that you want to earn. You get your selling price per unit problem solved. You got this? Shallow. Now, now the next thing is, okay, this is fine. Now let us see how this whole concept of absorption works. <coughs> oh, sorry. We're going to divide overheads into three parts, budgeted overheads, absorbed overheads, which can also be called as standard overheads and actual overheads. Okay. Before your financial year starts, you will expect your overheads, you will budget your overheads, which is, which comes around, let's say 120,000. How you have budgeted your overheads like that, you will budget output as well, which is units. Let's say it is 12,000. In that case, if you divide both of them, you'll get budgeted rate per unit, which is 10 per unit which can also be called a standard rate per unit or absorption rate per unit or predetermined rate or recovery rate, nothing but the same. Here I have divided this overheads, budgeted overheads with units. Why? Because I presume that units is the predominant influencing factor in that particular production department. Other than units, there can be five other predominant influencing factors. So it purely depends upon the question. But most frequently, it will be either of these three. Either Mishnas will be the predominant influencing factor or laborers or units. Suppose it's a capital intensive department, machines will be the predominant influencing factor because it is full of machines. Labor intensive department, laborers. Here uh, it is units. So like that, it depends upon that particular production department. Depending upon that, you need to choose one of these three and divide them. You will get your absorption rate to put it very simple. All this will happen before your financial year starts. So once your financial year starts, on April 1st, let's say you have manufactured 40 units. Already you have your absorption rate, which is 10 rupees. So you observe 10 rupees per unit. So you have observed 400 on day one. Same logic applies to day two, day three. So long it goes for 365 days. After 365 days, let's say you have actually manufactured 13,000 units. This is your actual output. Actually, you have manufactured 13,000 units and you have observed 10 rupees per unit, which means you have observed 1,30,000. Absorbed means what? What you have debited in costing p and account. Once 365 days is done, you have come to year end. So obviously when you have come to year end, you know what's your actual rates are. Let's say it is 1,40,000. Whereas how much you have debited in costing pay account or absorbed 1,30,000, which means you have debited less. So under absorption, which is 10,000, which is the difference between absorbed overheads and actual overheads. Clear? So this is nothing but concept of absorption. You got the point? Shalom.
finish na let's move on to the next one <coughs> Next one is activity based CVP analysis. You might say, sir, already we have seen this, right? Yeah, we have seen. But now I took uh, activity based cost costing concept also here itself. And then we're going to finish the concept of ABC also because both are connected. Normally, activity based costing concept should be taught as part and parcel of SAOI, that is strategic analysis of operating income. But now we're going to see it here itself as part and parcel of decision making chapter itself. You got the point. That's why I've put this heading one more time. You'll understand. Okay, what we have seen already, what we are going to see now is quite a bit different. We're going to see so many different perspectives. Right now, see here. Activity based CVP analysis. We know that break even point formula is fixed cost divided by contribution per unit. How did you decide that this much is the fixed cost? Based on variability with output, you classify your fixed cost into variable cost and fixed cost, right? This classification of fixed cost is wrong. Why? Because we have seen this concept already. Anyway, one more time I'm saying just because a particular cost does not vary with the output doesn't make it a fixed cost. In reality, what happens is there are so many fixed costs which vary with something else other than output. For example, there is a setup fixed cost which varies with number of setups, but it doesn't vary with number of units. Engineering cost which varies with number of engineering hours, but it doesn't vary with number of units. Material requisition fixed cost which varies with number of material requisitions but does not vary with number of units. Similarly, inspection fixed cost which varies with number of inspections but does not vary with units are you able to understand so these are officially called as non-unit based fixed cost because these fixed costs they vary with something other than units that's why it is called non-unit because they vary with something other than units all these are other than units only now and these fixed costs vary to something other than units therefore we call it as non-unit based fixed cost and we have seen this formula as well so this is nothing new already we have seen it over here correct we have seen this concept where is it Already we have seen it, so we have brushed it up one more time. Okay, till here it's clear, we know it. Now we're gonna look into the concept of activity based costing. Very, 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 very important concept. That's why I gave so many stars over here. And as I told you, it actually comes under SAOA chapter, strategic analysis of operating income, but we're gonna finish it off here itself. Now, before we get to this particular concept, activity based costing, the first thing that you guys need to understand is that what is the purpose of activity based costing? concept the purpose is to find overhead cost per unit now you might be surprised because already we know how to calculate overhead cost per unit how do we know that we have learned that in our ca inter right or cma inter there's a chapter called overheads where we do three steps that is primary distribution of overheads secondary distribution of overheads and absorption of overheads where ultimately you try to find overhead cost per unit so when you already know how to find overhead cost per unit why do you need a separate concept again to calculate the same well, to know that you need to wait. Okay. But right now you should know one thing that the purpose of activity based costing is to calculate overhead cost per unit. Done. Okay. To understand the logic behind this, because already we know how to calculate overhead cost per unit, then why are we trying to learn another concept where again, the purpose is to calculate the same overhead cost per unit, which we already know how to calculate. Let's try to understand that logic for that. First, you should know the modern business environment. From 1960s to 1990s, it was a seller's market. Seller was the dominating guy. So there are no multinational companies. Say, for example, the cost structure was in most of the companies, manufacturing companies, I mean, if total cost is 100 rupees per unit, direct cost will normally be greater than or equal to 90%, and indirect cost will be normally less than or equal to 10%, which is overheads. So therefore, overheads are not that important at that particular point of time, at this time, okay? So even ad hoc absorption of overheads was sufficient. Ad hoc means blind way of absorbing overheads was sufficient. This is what you are doing in your IPCC overhead chapter. When you are trying to calculate overhead cost per unit, you are going with ad hoc method of absorption. It is not perfect method of absorbing overheads. But whatever the way it is, ultimately you'll calculate total cost per unit and you fix your selling price based on the presumption that you are a price setter, which I told you already. But after 1990, this was fine at that particular point of time when overheads was less than 10%. Even that ad hoc method was running fine. Otherwise, why would companies be follow and they have, they have been successful as well. So it worked at that particular point of time. It worked. But not after 1990 because after 1990, uh, it has been, <clears throat> what do you call, bias market. So which means selling price is fixed by market forces. And uh, seller has become a price taker, which means he has to accept the price that has been fixed by the market because he doesn't decide selling price per unit unless uh, 
you know his total cost per unit of the product is precise he will end up taking wrong decision which will adversely affect the business what do you mean by that suppose if your total cost is not exact it is approximate it is not precise uh, 40 rupees per unit you are saying the total cost of a particular product and it is not correct it is wrong in that case either it will be over, over costed or it will be under costed so if it is under costed it means that the product gives more profit so you may decide to increase your production which is wrong why because you feel that it gives you more profit because of your wrong calculation of total cost same logic applies to over costed situation as well you feel that the product is giving you less profit and you may decide to stop production so both the decision will damage the company and its business you got the point isn't it right <clears throat> So, and in the other case, the other reason is that earlier you are a price setter. Therefore, you were setting your selling price and this was working. But now, because it's a bias market domination, this is happening, which we have already explained to you. Apart from that, suppose if total cost is 100 per unit, now indirect cost is almost like 40%. Earlier, when we have studied this, it was only less than 10%, right? When you are following that blind method of absorbing overheads or ad hoc absorption method. But that was working fine at that particular point of time. Why? Because overheads are not significant. It was less than 10%. But now you cannot follow the same blind method of absorbing overheads when your overheads is as high as 40% due to MNCs and due to change in the way you are doing business once the bias market situation have come into picture. That is one thing. Second thing is, now you are a price taker, which we have already seen. So you don't have control over your selling price. Are you able to understand? So, therefore, the only way to solve all these problems, what problems? To solve the problem of under-costing or over-costing your product. To solve the problem of uh, managing a significant overhead cost, which is almost like 40%. The only solution for you is ABC, which is activity-based costing. How? Because activity-based costing helps you to find exact overhead cost per unit. That's what we have told here. So you was wondering, you were wondering that already we know how to calculate overhead cost per unit. Then why do we need another concept again to calculate overhead cost per unit? Means the difference is once upon a time, whatever the overhead cost that you were calculating in your intermediate based on overhead chapter was not precise because you were observing your overheads based on ad hoc absorption methodology. But ABC helps you to find out the same overhead cost per unit only. But the difference is it will help you to find out exact overhead cost per unit, precise overhead cost per unit. Therefore, once you know exact overhead cost per unit, then your total cost per unit also will be precise, which means your selling price will be perfect. There will be no question of under costing or over costing, right? You will do your business in a perfect way. Now let's try to understand what is ABC. Try to recollect your IPCC or CMA inter over its chapter or CA inter, whatever it is. Overhead cost per unit, how do you calculate if it is units method, total overhead cost divided by total number of units, correct? If it is Mishnah's method, because I told you now, depending upon predominant influencing factor, this can keep on changing. Concept of absorption, I told you just now. Depending upon the different types of methods, okay? It keeps on changing. So, overhead cost per unit is total overhead cost divided by number of units or overhead cost per missionary is total overhead cost divided by total missionaries. Let's say your total overhead cost is 1,20,000. Let's say your missionaries is 10,000. So, what you were doing in CA inter is what we are trying to see here. So, missionary rate will be 12 rupees per missionary, correct? Let's say there are three products, A, B and C. Missionaries, A takes 2 hours, B takes 3 hours, C takes 1 hour. Per hour, the rate is 12. So obviously into 12, into 12, into 12, your overhead cost per unit is 24, 36 and 12. You will readily have direct cost per unit. You add that, you get your total cost per unit. This is what you were doing. Correct? And as per ABC, what you were doing is wrong. You can ask me, how is it wrong, sir? We'll try to understand the same. Now see here. This Meshna rate, what you have calculated here, 12 rupees per Meshna, ABC activity based costing says that it is wrong. What is that? Dividing total overhead cost divided by total Mishnas, which is 1,20,000 divided by 10,000 Mishnas, is wrong. So how can you say it is wrong? What is the logic behind this? 
the logic is see when you are dividing 120000 divided by 10000 mesnas it means that this entire numerator is influenced by denominator that is the logic this entire 120000 is influenced by mesnas that's why you are dividing the entire overheads with mesnas is the logic the entire 120000 overheads is influenced by mesnas but this logic is wrong why because 120000 overheads is not a single expense it's a pool of so many expenses if you do further analysis of this 120000 you get that machining cost is 40000 out of this 120 setup cost is 30 inspection cost is 20 out of this 120 material requisition cost is 30 out of this 120 and only this machining cost of 40000 is influenced by mishnas which means out of this 120000 only 40000 portion is influenced by mishnas which means entire 120000 should not be divided by 10000 mishnas only 40000 should be divided by 10000 mishnas that is the logic Remaining costs of overheads are influenced by different different factors. Then they should be divided by those respective factors, not mishnas, because these are not getting influenced by mishnas. Only this forty thousand portion is influenced by mishnas. Therefore, divide it with mishnas. These three are not influenced by mishnas. They are influenced by different different factors. So divide them with respective factors. Thereby, you'll get multiple overhead absorption rates or multiple rates of recovery. That is nothing but we call it as activity based cost. You got the point? So that is the logic and the concept of activity based costing. You got this? Got this guys? Right, shall Let's move on to the next one. Concept of sell or further process. See, uh, the confusion is very simple. Should you sell now at whatever the selling price that is available right now or you should further process that particular product and sell? Well, the answer is very simple. Take sale value after further processing. Let's say it is 1500. After further processing, let's say your sale value is 1500. Right now, your sale value is 1000, which means if you further process, you'll be getting additional sales of 500. What is the cost for further processing? Let's say it is 400. Then there is a med net benefit of 100. In that case, you can further process. So if it's positive, you can further process. Suppose your sale value after further processing is 1500. Right now, the sale value is 1000. So additional sales is 500. Whereas the additional cost is 600. In that case, this will be 100 negative. Then do not further process. Very simple. Very, very simple. You got this? I hope this is clear. All of you. Right. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Still, there are so many concepts like a concept of limiting factor and so many other uh, indifference point concept and all those things that we'll see as part and parcel of transfer pricing chapter. Okay. I'll cover it in transfer pricing chapter. So right now I'm not going to cover those concepts. Is that clear? So don't get worried that I'll be covering in transfer pricing chapter. Now let's move on to the last concept of this particular chapter, decision making. That is relevant costing. So based on elements, basically we can classify cost into three categories, material, labor, and overheads. So let's try to start with the first cost, that is material cost. And what is our object right now? Our objective is to find what is the relevant cost of material. Our objective is to find what is the relevant cost of material. How to find relevant cost of material? Ask yourself the first question. Is raw material is in stock or out of stock? If it is in stock, then it is different. If it is out of stock, straight away the relevant cost is replacement cost, which is nothing but buying price. The logic is very simple. When there is no raw metal in stock, how will you get the raw metal? You'll go, you'll buy and you'll get it. So what is the cost of using it? Whatever the price with which you have bought it, it's as simple as that. So when it is out of stock, you're going to buy it and bring it over. Therefore, that buying price is nothing but replacement cost. So relevant cost is replacement cost. Very simple. Suppose if the raw metal is in stock, then what is the relevant cost of that particular raw metal if you use it? For that, you need to answer one more question. Is it regularly used? You have two answers. Yes, it is regularly used. No, it is not regularly used. If it is regularly used, then again, the relevant cost of using it is replacement cost. Why, sir? Why? Because... Let's say the raw metal comes like this, immediately it will be going for consumption. Comes, goes for consumption. Comes, goes for consumption. Comes, goes for consumption. In that kind of situation, if you use in between some units of raw metal, then it will create stockout situation. So immediately you need to, you know, solve that stockout situation. How will you solve it? By buying and then putting it over. So when you're trying to use any stock in the middle for temporary requirement or whatever it is, are you able to understand? So what is the cost of using it? Replacement cost only because you're immediately replacing it with a new uh, newly bought raw metals, correct? Therefore, if your raw metal is regularly used, 
and you are, it is there in stock but it is regularly used it's a busy raw material and you are using such raw material then the relevant cost of using it is replacement cost why because when you use such raw metal immediately it has to be replaced so you will buy and you will replace so what is the cost of using it i've bought and i've replaced now nah. so the bought price which is nothing but i mean the buying price which is nothing but replacement cost so if it is not regularly used then uh, you see whether it has got any resale value let's say it can be sold for a value of 100 then 100 will be the cost of using it why because you're using it you're losing an opportunity to sell it for a price of 100 Therefore, 100 rupees of benefit is lost. Benefit lost is nothing but opportunity cost. Therefore, relevant cost will be 100. So, you need to think like that. There is a raw material stock like this. It can be sold for 100. That stock I am using for some purpose. In that case, I lose an opportunity to sell it for 100. Therefore, 100 rupees is gone. Therefore, what is the cost of using this raw material? That 100 rupees which I have lost, which is nothing but opportunity cost. Therefore, relevant cost will be resale value. Suppose this so called irregularly used raw material, which is there in stock, can be used as substitute in the place of some other raw metal. Let's say this irregularly used raw metal is X. It can be used as a substitute in the place of Y. Y right now is not there in our stock. We need to buy Y by paying a price of 150 per unit. But we came to know that instead of buying Y by paying a price of 150, we can use X as a substitute for Y, which is already there in stock. X is already there in stock. Therefore, what is the relevant cost of using X? 150. Why? Because because of X only. Now you have saved 150. Well, the logic is very simple. Therefore, price of the substitute will be your answer. Very simple. You got the point? Yes. So price of the substitute will be your relevant cost. Yeah. So when both the options are available, whichever is higher will be your answer. So if both the options are available, relevant cost will be whichever is higher. 100 or 150. 150 will be your relevant cost. Pretty simple. Can be sold for something. Can be used as substitute. Whichever is higher will be your answer. Now coming on to the next one, that is labor. You need to find the relevant cost of your labor, that is your objective. What type of labor it is, is your first question. Is it skilled labor, unskilled labor? If it is unskilled labor, he is very easy to find. So you will not take them as permanent employees because whenever you need them, you can easily find them because they are not skilled. In that case, the relevant cost will be actual wages paid, which is whatever you pay. So whenever I need them, I'll recruit them, I'll use them, I'll pay them, I'll ask them to get lost. So what is the cost of using them? Whatever that you have actually paid which is nothing but actual wages paid. But when it comes to skilled labor, that is not the case. Because they are difficult to find, they will generally be taken as a permanent employee. So to find out the relevant cost of skilled labor, you need to find out whether he is busy or idle. If he is idle, then the relevant cost of using a skilled labor is zero. Why it is zero? Why? Because he will be permanent employee which means your wages are committed already, whether he works or he doesn't work, whether he's busy or he's not busy. Anyway, you have to pay them. So you're already paying him and he's idle. So what is the incremental cost of using him now? Nothing, because you're already paying him. Whether I use him or I don't use him, in both the cases, you have to pay. So therefore, what is the relevant cost of using him? Zero, because the incremental cost of paying him is zero because you're already paying him. You got it? Even though he's idle, still you're paying him. If he is busy, then what's going to happen? Very simple. If he is busy and you want him, say, for example, for project X, Y. Okay. You will get him over here and see that the project in which he is already busy, is there a substitute available? If a substitute is available, whatever you pay to the substitute will be the relevant cost use of using this particular skilled labor because the value of skilled labor is what you are paying to the substitute because the substitute is doing the same job that your skilled labor is doing. Correct? The logic is very simple. So if he is busy, you try to bring him to another project. Here it is project A. You're asking him for project XY. You bring him over here. Then here somebody has to replace his work. Let's say there is a substitute worker available and you're replacing him and you're paying him some 10,000. Then 10,000 is the worth of this so-called skilled labor. Is that it? Because somebody is doing the same work that the skilled labor is doing at some X price. Then X price will be the value of the skilled labor as simple as that. So therefore relevant cost is nothing but wages you paid to the substitute worker. Suppose if substitute is not available for project A, and you're asking skilled labor to come to project XY, then if substitute is not available, then you have to stop this particular project and work for project XY. Then whatever the profit that you're losing because of stopping this particular project A is a benefit loss. Benefit loss is nothing but opportunity cost. That opportunity cost will be the relevant cost. Got it? And finally, overheads. Material is done, labor is done, and the last one is overheads. Two types of overheads, variable, fixed. Variable overheads will always be relevant. Why? Because they're variable. They change. When they change, they are relevant. Isn't it? 
In fixed storage, if it is general fixed storage, it is irrelevant, which doesn't change, which remains constant. Okay, absorbed fixed storage, general fixed storage, share of fixed storage, all these things are constant. Allocated fixed storage, all these are irrelevant. But if it is specific, then it is relevant. Specific, incremental, additional, discretionary fixed storage, all these are relevant. Why? Because they are changing. You are incurring them right now. They are increasing. So fixed cost also, if it changes, then it is relevant. If it remains constant, then it is irrelevant. Simple logic. You got it? That's it. So we're done with all the concepts. Uh, as I told you, the limiting factor, indifference point, all those concepts are there that we will cover in transfer racing, okay, chapter. When we are revising that particular chapter. Is that clear? That's it, guys. With this, we are done with all the concepts. I've covered activity-based costing also over here. I hope uh, uh, you guys are really uh, getting benefited from these uh, rapid revision videos. Uh, I'm trying to cover all the concepts as much as possible in the limited time. Are you able to understand? We'll try to do the same for all the important chapters for this particular attempt. So stay tuned to our channel. Subscribe, uh, you know, our classes so that you'll get the notification the moment I upload without wasting your time. Okay. And also you share this video. So let your friends know so that they'll also get benefited. So uh, that's the reason, as you can see, I'm working late night whenever I find time, midnight or late night. And then I'm trying to, uh, you know, record the session for you guys. Thank you so much. I hope this video helps you. Uh, write your exams better. That's it guys from my side. Bye bye. Right. So what we're going to do is that we will revise. Okay. The whole concepts and after revision, we'll go with the sums. Okay. Shall we start? Right. Chalo. Let's move on. So what is the chapter that we have started Nana? MBE. Tell me, is it important chapter or unimportant chapter? Obviously important, very important. Okay. It belongs to a category. Now, coming on to all the topics in this particular chapter, I gave you the bird's eye view. What are the topics we have got? Quality management, and that we have cost of quality, total quality management, as well as what, Nana? Business excellence model. Then we have theory of constraint, supply chain management, as well as gain sharing arrangement, correct? Now, priority wise, what's your first priority in this chapter? Quality management, all the areas of quality management, okay, which uh, covers cost of quality, total quality management, as well as business excellence model. Then comes supply chain management, then comes theory of constraints, and finally, gain sharing arrangement. After that, uh, we have seen the intro. What is the intro part, Nana? Uh, during the past two decades earlier, uh, what was the market? It was dominated by sellers, let's say roughly before 1990s, okay? So seller dominating the market means everything is decided by the seller. For example, as you can see here, the price is determined by the seller. The response time is determined by the seller. The quality of the product is determined by the seller as well as performance is dictated to the customer. So this is the performance that we're going to give through our product. Say, for example, if it's a buy car car, everything is dictated by seller. So seller domination purely. And seller was the price setter. That is also very important. Price setter means what? He can fix the selling price. Okay. But coming on to bias market, uh, which took domination after what, Nana? Yeah, exactly. After 99. Roughly, I'm just trying to give you an idea. That's all. Okay. So post 1990, what has happened? Uh, there was a tectonical shift in the way the business was going on. And that is what we call it as modern business environment where like once upon a time, it was not the market that was dominated by the seller. It's purely a market which is dominated by the buyer. So buyer dominating in a sense, what does it mean? It means price is determined by the buyer, not directly, but what? Indirectly through the forces of demand and supply. So therefore, now the seller becomes price taker. He just need to accept the selling price that has been determined by the market. Unlike, uh, you know, earlier once upon a time where he used to be what? Price setter. And response time also will be determined by the buyer. You know, what is the response time of the service that you are providing or by within what time you will be delivering us the product. Similarly, quality also will be determined by the buyer. He will say, okay, this is the quality level that I'll accept. Otherwise, I'll reject. Similarly, performance also will be determined by the buyer. Now, I told you examples for that, right? Royal Enfield Classic 350 we have seen and we compared that with what, Nana? Java as well as what? Honda CB350 and all that. Isn't it? And so what? All right. Now, the reasons for the above transition, we have seen all the reasons. First reason is what? Globalization, which led to what? Opening up of all economies and as a result, multinational companies came into picture, correct? Because of multinational companies in every single country, what has happened? Competition has got increased and that gave upper hand to whom? Buyers, okay? After that, we have competition, which I've discussed just now. Then excess capacity is also one of the reasons, especially due to industrial revolution. What has happened? 
a lot of machines have come into picture and as a result what has happened their capacity to manufacture a lot of things has got increased overriding their domestic demand domestic demand means what suppose a company is there in a particular country and they have a capacity which will satisfy the entire demand in that particular domestic country and beyond that so what they started doing is that okay fine they started exploring the other markets which is obviously beyond their borders okay and after that that is one of the reason why we had emergence of multinational companies you got the point and they started getting into other countries and they they started setting up their plants manufacturing plants and started selling their products next ease of travel is also one reason why uh, uh, you know we started getting imported cars and all that isn't it right internet of course that's where the revolution has started and customer has got access to all the details right now through the internet so he became more intellectual in buying things you know and finally availability of raw metals is also one of the reason i gave you some examples right db's group i gave one example for diamonds and all that and coca cola example also i gave you correct huh? where they try to set up their plant where water is available primarily okay anyways so this is just the intro part of this particular chapter okay after that what we have seen na cost of quality what is cost of quality first of all before we get to that one thing we know that quality is not free it takes some cost correct huh? otherwise everybody will provide quality why quality is possible only to few people because you have to spend money to get quality correct huh? now first of all before we get to something called cost of quality uh, we need to understand what is quality so i told you very in a very simple way quality means any product must be free from three things what are those three things defect deficiency significant variations okay i explain you what those significant variations and all that okay after that uh we try to understand how many types of cost of quality we have got okay uh so first of all what is a simpler understanding of quality it is ability to meet what nana customer expectations and provide value for money if you are able to do that it means from the customer's point of view you are said to have quality you know he feels that your product has what quality if you are able to meet his expectations and also provide what simultaneously value for money i gave you an example for that scorpio yen is doing right right now you know the same thing isn't it in fact you can see the uh, managing director interview yesterday i don't know whether you guys are able to follow that or not exactly this is the wording that he has used okay uh, he said that indian customers at heart are always value conscious okay they always look for value for money no matter how rich they are so by default they look for what value for money that's that's the exact dialogue of what so obviously they were also looking into these kind of aspects once they go for pricing okay anyways now moving on to the next one we try to understand what is cost of quality over here cost of quality has got two things one is cost of creating good quality other one is cost of correcting bad quality so cost of creating good quality can also be called as cost of good quality cost of correcting bad quality can also be called as cost of poor quality there is one more name for cost of good quality which we call it as conformance cost where you confirm with the quality standards which has already been set we call it as conformance cost whatever the costs that are incurred in order to ensure that you confirm with the quality standards that has been set we call it as what nana conformance cost and whatever the costs that are incurred in case you are not able to meet the quality standards your product is not able to meet the quality standards then to bring it back to the quality standards which we have planned we call it as non conformance cost and of course conformance cost can also be called as cost of meeting the quality non conformance cost can also be called as cost of not meeting the quality once you are not able to meet the quality standards then again i have to what work it out bring it back to the quality standards for that i have to incur some cost which i call it as cost of poor quality right after that what we have seen cost of quality especially cost of good quality can be further classified into two what are they prevention cost and appraisal cost and cost of poor quality can be further classified into two what are they nana internal failure and external failure cost then we try to understand one by one okay so what is prevention cost whatever the cost that you incur for preventing what nana poor quality of products for example if i train somebody okay what will what is the ultimate intention of training somebody when you train them ah exactly they will not you know do what mistakes isn't it so they'll not do mistakes they'll be able to manufacture the product in the best way possible isn't it is it a good thing or a bad thing good thing so you are trying to avoid something wrong from happening what is something wrong from happening here bad quality okay so training even planning also comes under similar kind of a thing isn't it i gave you an example for that isn't it for example for your exams you plan right if you don't plan what will happen the probability of you failing in the exams will be really high isn't it if you plan 
then the probability of you failing in the exams will be what? Relatively less. Same logic happens here also when you are manufacturing something, isn't it? Next, supplier evaluation. What do you mean by evaluating a supplier? To ensure that the supplier does not give you what? Low quality raw materials or does not give you, uh, what can I say? He will deliver the products on time. He will deliver the raw materials on time. New product review or evaluation. Whenever you are evaluating something, what is the logic behind evaluation? You try to ensure that things are correct. You understand the point? You try to ensure that things are correct. If you don't evaluate, then what will happen? In, un, indirectly, you are trying to increase the probability of something wrong happening. Correct? Huh? So that's the reason you try to evaluate. Training, already we have seen. Meetings also with the same intention, either to plan or to train people. Error proofing, already I gave you an example. What is error proofing? Quality management system such that your product will be free from errors. We have seen that uh, Coke example, cool drink example, correct? Uh, where the cool drinks are getting filled up uh, before it gets sealed. You will try to implement a laser system or something such that if there is any under quantity in that particular bottle, right, it will be filled up and then after that it will be what Nana sealed such that once it is sealed, all always it will be of good quantity correct uh, same thing we have seen with uh, what is that a printer example where uh, when once you want to insert the cartridge you need to uh, you know insert the cartridge only in the right way only then it gets locked correct uh, so which means it has been designed in such a way that once the cartridge gets locked it means that it is a good unit so thereby you have created a system in such a way that there is no chance for error that we call it as error proofing okay then of course we have something called capability evaluation so i told you already the easiest way to remember this is remember the words evaluation okay remember the words planning and remember the words what nana training so the moment you see these words you got to understand that they come under what cost prevention cost and of course these prevention costs will be implemented before your product goes for actual manufacturing are you able to understand this is really important so you do all these things before your actual manufacturing starts okay after that, coming on to something called appraisal cost. What did I say? Once your uh, you know prevention cost are done, which means you have invested a lot of money into what prevention cost. Later, what will happen, Nana? You have a doubt whether whatever the money that you have invested in preventing something wrong from happening has it been really able to prevent that or not? That is a doubt for me. Okay, so therefore, what I'll do? I'll start checking. Isn't it checking or inspecting or whatever it is? So that we call it as what cost, Nana? Appraisal cost. Uh, same logic we have seen in uh, environmental management accounting where Hansen and Mendoza's classification where we have prevention environmental cost as well as what? Appraisal environmental cost. There also we have seen the same logic. In prevention environmental cost, you will buy some pollution control equipment, you know, air cleaning equipment, water cleaning equipment, something like that. And then that is prevention cost because you are trying to prevent something wrong from happening. In this case, it is pollution. Okay. And then you have a doubt whether is it really preventing or is it really doing what it is intended to do then i have to check it checking testing you know auditing all these things okay then i'll start really checking the water levels or really checking the pollution levels of what air so that we call it as what cost appraisal cost correct so that is what we have seen here as you can see verification quality audits checking testing field testing as well as what nana supplier ratings here you have evaluated the supplier that is prevention cost and then you will check whether the evaluation is correct or not through ratings that we call it as what nana we call it as what appraisal cost exactly next internal failure cost means what despite investing your money in prevention cost as well as what nana checking it through appraisal cost still something wrong can happen correct yes or what everybody so when something wrong can happen uh, that we call it as a failure and that wrong can happen at two places one is within your factory the other one is what once your product has left your factory and it has reached the destination destination in the sense customer okay so if the mistake is identified by you within the factory premises as a company then we call it as internal failure if that product reaches the customer and then customer identifies the problem and then tries to communicate with you then we call it as external failure so what are the examples for internal failure once you identify the failure within the company premises we call it as waste scrap rectification redesign rework failure analysis delays as well as what nana downtime when i say downtime here it is unplanned downtime not planned downtime okay right another important thing is that the easiest way in a question to identify what uh, internal failure cost is to look at the word re okay because whenever you check something you test something you inspect something for the first time that comes under appraisal cost but after checking also if there is a failure and then again you try to rectify the product and again you try to recheck it whether the rectification has been done correctly or not we call it as what nana internal failure 
Are you able to understand? So the best example for that is rechecking, retesting, reinspection. So whenever you see the word called re, then you have to understand that it comes under internal failure. Okay, then we have something called external failure, which we obviously know the moment customer is involved, we know that it is a external failure and which is the most dangerous cost out of these four external failure because it not only gives you uh, a cost because you uh, in the form of warranty claims or goods returned by the customer, whatever it is, but still it also affects your goodwill. So that goodwill will reduce your sales in the long run, which is really dangerous. Got the point? So you can see the examples over here, repair of goods return, warranty, servicing, lost sales due to what? Customer dissatisfaction, compliance, etc. Okay. So after that, what we have seen? We have seen some important notes for solving case scenarios and case studies. What are those notes? We know that cost of good quality is inversely proportional to cost of poor quality. So the more you invest in prevention and appraisal cost, the lesser will be what? Internal failure and external failure. So therefore, if a company wants to achieve zero defect level, it has to invest a lot of money into what? Prevention appraisal cost, not just at one time, not in one shot, but regularly over a period of time. So that is what we call it as continuous improvement program. So you keep on investing your money in prevention appraisal cost such that your internal failure and external failure at some point of time may become what? Nana? Zero. Okay, after looking at this, we have seen something called optimal cost of quality. So what is optimal cost of quality? Uh, this is cost of good quality graph. So which means here you're investing a lot of money in prevention and appraisal. At the same time, if you have invested a lot of money in cost of good quality, cost of poor quality will be at its minimum or almost zero. Similarly, if you have not at all invested any of your money in cost of good quality, then cost of poor quality will be really high. Correct? Huh? So what this optimal cost of quality tries to tell you is that this is wrong. This is also wrong. Why? Because in both the cases, your total cost of quality is what? Nana? Really high. Correct? Huh? Your total cost of quality is really high. So he says that you try to find a balance between them such that you have an agreeable level of defects percentage so that your total cost will be at its minimum. So as you can see where these two lines intersect, this is the area at where your optimal cost of quality exists, which means your total cost of quality will be at its minimum. Got the point? That is a concept. Although I told you I don't agree with this concept. Why? Because this concept only considers what Nana? Cost of quality. Uh, but we generally prefer, I, I, it's my personal opinion, we prefer what? This one. Which one? This one where uh, your prevention and appraisal cost is really high. Yes, we agree that total cost of quality will be what? Here. It's, it's very, very high when compared to what? This level. Okay. By this much. But still, you have a lot of other perks. What are the other perks? One is almost you are defect free. When you're almost defect free, your customer will be really satisfied. He knows that once he buys a product, it will be absolutely short shot, correct? Uh, that increases your brand value. As a result, that increases mouth publicity, that increases sales in the long run. So that additional contribution from additional sales has not been con you know, considered here. Second is, you can also try to sell at a higher price because of the brand value because of the higher quality. You understand the point? That extra sales which you're enjoying, that is also not considered here. As a result, I personally feel that which is the best one which is the best one? Yeah, this one over here. Got the point, Nana? When your uh, cost of good quality is at its maximum. Okay. Sometimes it can be inefficient also. Anyway, at that time, we'll see, look at the individual situations and then accordingly, we'll take the call. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's look at here. So point at which total quality cost is minimum is known as what, Nana? Optimal cost of quality. This implies that striving for zero defects through continuous improvement is not at all good from what point of view? Economic point of view, which means from numbers point of view. Uh, and the argument is that there should be some acceptable level of defects, which I have told you. So lower external failure and internal failure cost will result in what, Nana? Higher customer satisfaction, which will also result in more sales. We have discussed this. It is also possible that a project may not be attractive from financial perspective due to what Nana high cost of good quality, which is nothing but prevention and appraisal, but it can be attractive from non-financial perspective in the form of higher customer satisfaction. Always remember today's good non-financial perspectives or tomorrow's good financial perspectives. Okay. Today, if customer is satisfied, which is a non-financial perspective tomorrow, your finance will be very healthy because the customer will indirectly increase your sales. Correct. Yeah? All right. Okay. Now, next question is discuss any measures to reduce what Nana non-conformance cost. Very simple. If you want to reduce the non-conformance cost, which is internal failure and external failure, what you will do? Increase the investment in prevention and appraisal. Correct? Uh, that we know already because both of them are inversely proportional to each other. 
Apart from that, we have certain other things as well. You can invest in TQM, total quality management. You can invest in Six Sigma because the job of Six Sigma is to identify the root cause of defects and reduce the defects. Correct? Huh? We can also invest in total productive maintenance because the entire intention of total productive maintenance is to ensure that your machines are working at optimal efficiency level. Correct? Huh? Automatically, the quality of your finished goods will be good. And of course, we have Kaizen and target costing. Okay? Shall we? After that, we took a small example where we try to understand what is the calculation of what nana cost of quality. So I gave you a selling price and variable cost, okay, and contribution over here. And we took the example of customer demand as how much nana four thousand units and rejections by the customer as twenty percent. So when the rejections by the customer is twenty percent to satisfy a demand of four thousand, you need to send, you need to deliver how many units nana five thousand units, which is four thousand divided by. 80% because 20% will be rejected. So once you manufacture 5,000, ultimately customer will be accepting 4,000. Okay. After that, we have seen certain scenarios. We went with scenario one where there are certain presumptions that have taken. What is the first presumption? Rejected goods are not replaced. Loss of market share due to loss of goodwill is how much? Runner? Thousand units. And return goods by the customer will not be exactly repaid, and they don't have any scrap value. In this case, in this scenario, we try to understand what is cost of quality, right? So to calculate cost of quality, the first thing you guys need to understand that there will be a contribution loss from where, from the loss of market share due to what, nana loss of goodwill, uh, which is how many units? Thousand units. So from each unit, what is the contribution that we have already calculated? Thirty. So thousand into thirty, how much I'll be losing? Thirty thousand. Apart from that. Even though the sales is five thousand, I'm actually manufacturing how much, Nana? Sorry. Even though the sales is four thousand, I'm actually manufacturing five thousand, which means thousand units are produced, rejected, and they got wasted according to our presumption. Okay. So therefore, once thousand units are wasted, I've already spent how much of money on manufacturing those thousand units? Seventy. Not only manufacturing, you're also delivering them to the customer. After that, only customer is rejecting. So therefore, you'll incur the delivery cost as well. So ultimately, I'll be losing how much? Seventy on per unit basis. For thousand units, I'll be losing seventy thousand. So total external failure cost for me will be thirty thousand in the form of loss of sales because of loss of goodwill, which we call it as opportunity cost. Plus, we have thousand units which got wasted where we have manufactured and delivered to the customer but customer has got rejected and therefore we have lost how much on that 70 and that gives us 70000 loss so the total loss is how much 1 lakh which we call it as what cost nana external failure cost after that we have seen something called scenario 2 where in scenario 2 we took some different presumptions so the first one was goods will be what nana replaced unlike scenario 1 where it will not be replaced Replaced components can't be repaired, but I'll be replacing. That's all. I'll not be repairing. Scrap value still here is zero, which means you just need to throw it away. And loss of market share due to the loss of goodwill is still the same, which is how many units? Thousand units. And also here, because you'll be replacing, which means you have to deliver the product again to the customer. And that additional delivery cost will be how much? Nana? How much? 10 rupees. Those are all the perceptions. So now again in this scenario, we try to calculate cost of quality. How to calculate cost of quality? First, again you are losing contribution because of loss of goodwill. Correct? Yes. So how many units are you losing? 1000 units at a price of how much? 30. Which means I will be losing how much? 30,000. And then you also need to replace 1000 units. Correct? What 1000 units? The customer will be rejecting 1000 units and then you have to again replace those 1000 units to the customer. Correct? So which means again additionally you will be incurring 10 rupees correct so therefore earlier it was just 70 rupees what you were losing but now you have to again send back a new unit correct where you will be incurring additional 10 rupees so therefore you'll be using how much 80 rupees so therefore 1000 into 80 how much you'll be losing 80000 anyway contribution loss or opportunity cost is already there which is 30000 plus 80000 how much will be your external failure cost 1 lakh 10000 right after that what we have seen Shall move on. Now, what is the next one we have got? Solution 1. So, here, what is that we are trying to see? How to solve the above problem of defective units reaching the customer and affecting the goodwill negatively. Okay, because since uh, in the earlier two scenarios, what is that we are facing? Uh, we know that uh, the defective units are reaching the customer. So once defective units are reaching the customer, what is happening? Customer is feeling pretty bad because he is rejecting and as a result, the goodwill is getting bad. I mean, the goodwill is going down and as a result, ultimately, the bad word of mouth is spreading and as a result, I'm losing what? 1000 units of market sales. Correct? Uh, now, what I'm trying to do eventually is that I'm trying to rectify that case. What case? 
customer should not feel bad about my product i have to protect my goodwill so to protect my goodwill i am going with two solutions the first solution is uh, i am trying to completely eliminate the defective units how can i eliminate defective units for that first i need to find out root cause of the defect so i have done my research and eventually i found out that the root cause of my defect is what defective raw materials from the supplier got the point so once i have identified that raw material defects are the reason for my finished goods defects okay what i have done i have kept a inspection where the moment i buy the raw materials from the supplier immediately it will be inspected before it goes for production as a result this will result in two things what are the two things you will save variable manufacturing cost of rejected units why because first of all you will not manufacture any rejected units isn't it because your defective units are completely eliminated as a result 1000 units of 70 rupees will be what nana saved so therefore 70000 will be saved apart from that a uh, customer will not be getting any defective units as a result customer satisfaction will be high your goodwill will increase therefore you will be able to sell 1000 units more so therefore on every unit you will be earning a contribution of 30 so therefore i'll be getting an additional contribution of 30000 totally my benefit will be a cost saving of 70 plus additional contribution of 30 total it's going to be how much 1 lakh but to actually implement this solution to uh, you know inspect the raw metal i have invested how much on here 95000 so therefore my net savings will be 5000 so this is one solution where we have eliminated what defective units once for all but in the second solution what we are trying to do is that we are not trying to eliminate the defective units rather we are trying to identify the defective units before they reach the customer got the point so what i'll do is that uh, i'll try to have a inspection process at the end phase of the production okay end phase of the production means once your finished goods are manufactured before it leaves the factory premises there i'll do the inspection such that all the defective units will be what nana identified and they will not leave the factory premises thereby avoiding the possibility of reaching the customers so as a result all the defect units here we are not avoiding creation of defect units what we are trying to avoid is only uh, the reach of the defect units into the customers hand that's all okay right so for that uh, how much is the cost we are incurring to inspect the finished goods before it leaves the factory 25000 and this will result in three things what are those three things first anyway your goodwill will increase because ultimately the defective units are not reaching the customer therefore they'll be happy and as a result good word of mouth will spread and therefore my sales will increase by 1000 if sales increases by 1000 i'll be able to get more contribution which is 30 thereby 30000 which we know next up. but the problem here is unlike in solution 1 i did not avoid manufacturing of what nana good units sorry i did not avoid manufacturing of bad units or defective units therefore even though if my sales increases by 1000 units actually i have to manufacture how much 1250 in my factory because there will be 20% defects okay so 1250 i'll manufacture inside my factory and at the end of the factory gate itself 250 units will be identified and it will be stopped and exactly 1000 units will reach the customer got the point so therefore even though i have increased sales of 1000 units actually i have to manufacture how many for that 1000 sales 1250 units you got the point in this 1250 units 1000 are produced and sold and 250 units are produced and they will be what wasted but they will be identified within the factory but you need to remember that we won't be incurring delivering cost on these 250 units because they are identified within the factory so therefore cost of 250 wasted units will be what nana only 50 thereby i reduce the delivery cost and eventually i will be losing how much 12500 after that delivery cost also will be saved on the other defective units because earlier when the sales demand is 4000 actually i need to manufacture and send how many 5000 in that customer will reject what 1000 so therefore ultimately i am incurring delivery cost on the entire 5000 but now what's happening exactly now what's happening yeah so he is rejecting what nana uh, sorry now what's happening is that we are only identifying what 1000 units within the factory premises as a result ultimately we are delivering only 4000 units you understand the point therefore we'll be saving delivery cost on those 1000 units which is the difference between 5000 and 4000 and that savings will be how much 20000 so the total savings will be how much for us here we have additional sales uh, sorry additional contribution from additional sales which is 30000 and also we have uh, the delivery cost saving which is how much rana 20000 so the total gross savings will be how much 50000 and the cost for this will be uh, initially having cut 25000 for inspection of finished goods before they leave the factory gate and after that here again i'm incurring cost of 
250 wasted units for the additional sales and that will be 12,500. So the total cost will be how much? 37,500. There is a net savings of 12,500. So if you take the summary of the above, here in solution 2, there is a net savings of 12,500. In solution 1, there is a net savings of 5,000. So you might be feeling from financial perspective that solution 2 is better. But always in the long run, which solution is better than a solution 1 is better because first of all, you are not manufacturing any defective units, which means you are doing optimum utilization of resources. So tomorrow after 5 years, maybe the raw metal may become what? Scarce. In that case, obviously solution 1 will be better. So therefore, always in the long run, which is better? Solution 1 will be better. That is one thing. Got the point? That is what we have seen here. Okay. Yes. And apart from that, there is one more solution. Already we have seen two solutions right now. One solution was uh, you just uh, try to keep an inspection department at the beginning of your factory where the moment you get raw metals from the supplier, immediately it will be what? Inspected and thereby all the defective raw metals will be rejected and only good unit raw metals will go for, will go for what? Production. Thereby all the you know finished goods will be good. That way you have avoided defective units. The second solution was you did not avoid defective units. You just started getting all the raw metal. You did not inspect them straight away. It went into production and it created defective finished goods. But that defective finished goods were identified by way of inspection process of finished good before it leaves the factory gate exactly. And therefore, ultimately good units will be reaching the customer. That was second solution. There is a third solution also, which we have already implemented as per JIT. So as per JIT, what we generally do is that because we can't have the luxury of defective units because as per jet because it is just in time after getting the sales only i'll be what producing eventually so i don't have the luxury of time right and moreover i don't maintain stock as well isn't it so therefore what i do in jet is that i go to the supplier i tell him that i have identified that the reason for my defective finished goods is your defective raw material so therefore uh, please don't try to send me defective raw material you try to do the inspection process yourself we will also support you for that and we were doing that we were sending our engineers to the suppliers factory isn't it to improve his quality and you improve your quality and finally send me only good units i'll pay you that extra bit of premium for doing all this work rather than the normal price that i pay for your raw metal you understand the point as a result eventually what will happen he will give me directly what good units only thereby there's no need of inspection and all those things i'll get the good units and thereby i'll manufacture only good units everything is solved got the point so this is the last solution okay which indirectly we have seen in jit okay right so after this, we have seen something called total quality management. We have seen the definition of total quality management. Definition is very easy. It is a management philosophy which seeks to integrate what Nana? All organization functions like what? Marketing, finance, design, engineering, production and customer service. What is the intention of doing all these things like integrating all your functions is to focus on meeting the customer needs. Not only meeting customer needs, but also what? Satisfying the organization objectives. It can be profit maximization or wealth maximization, whatever it is. So that is the definition, pretty easy to remember. After that, we try to understand the concept of TQM in detail. So what is this TQM? I told you that the key word here is all. So what do you mean by all? Your objective of TQM is to meet what Nana? Customer expectations by removing what Nana? All the waste and also simultaneously improving efficiency, not just in one process, not just in one department, not just in one function, but in what? Everything. So the key word here is all. That is why it is called total quality management and not quality management. Okay. This requires ensuring that all the things are done right the first time itself. The same thing we have seen in Deming's 14 points also. Correct. Huh? So according to JIT also, they feel that inspection is a non-value added activity. As a result, they say, why are you depending on the inspection? Now, the biggest question is, why am I depending on inspection? Because I have a doubt that I'll manufacture defective units. So try to remove that doubt. How to remove that doubt? Ensure that you get everything right the first time itself. Thereby there is no chance of defective units. Then there is no need of inspection. Are you able to get me right? So next. The next question is how to get things right, right the first time itself. Now this can be achieved by continuous improvement of all the functions of the organization like what Nana? Design, engineering, production, marketing, finance through the most important wording here. What is that? Joint efforts of all. Joint efforts of all means who are they? Top level management, middle level staff, lower level workforce, as well as the third party who is supplier. Okay. Because everybody put together, what will happen? I gave you a perfect example for that. We have seen a very big example where we try to understand, okay, how all these guys put together will help you out to get a best product. Correct? Because supplier will give one input, right? Design team will give one input. Production manager will give one input. Correct? Marketing guy will give one input. 
saying that this is what the design that customer has expect uh, expects or accepts you understand the point you guys remember the example right now we don't have time because we are revising but what i'm trying to tell you is that we have seen a very good example where these how a team together will give you a lot of advantage right anyways so after that what did we see we have seen certain important notes for tqm where uh, i told you that there is no single theory of tqm it is just a philosophy that assumes that quality is an outcome of all the activities taking place in the organization and everybody in the organization has to participate do you guys remember the same wording we have seen somewhere where we have seen that everybody needs to participate to make this successful kaizen costing very good that was one of the important sentence we have been repeatedly seeing that when we were studying kaizen costing correct in target costing also we have seen but in target costing mostly the designer team has to be involved completely not the whole of the organization correct correct is yes, what but uh, when it comes to kaizen costing that was not the case everybody has to involve at all the levels only then kaizen costing will give you the desired results same logic happens here as well even in tq okay another important thing is quality is not measured from manufacturer's perspective quality is always measured from customer's perspective this is very 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 important what customer feels that this is the quality that is the quality that we need to accept as a manufacturer and try to give the same to the customer you understand the point everybody very very important keep this in mind expected quality standards is based on internal priorities or industry standards it depends upon where the company stands in the industry okay if the company is already benchmark in the industry with respect to quality standards then it will go with internal priorities if the company is not benchmark in the industry if it is a very small company or a beginner company then it will look at industry standards that we have seen then tqm is to be viewed as investment rather than cost correct ah this we have already seen somewhere same sentence where business process reengineering where we have seen that ppr should be seen as a investment in the short term and benefit in the long term same goes with tqm as well correct ah after that we have seen a question where how to use tqm to gain what nana competitive advantage so we have four points over here first one is what fine tuning of the existing process to improve what quality to ensure that the quality is happening and also you have to train your employees as that they will ensure that quality will be there in each and every aspect of the function of the business that you are doing and developing commitment towards quality that is what we call quality culture just like how we eat food how we try to breathe how we try to buy every day correct just like that quality also should become normal it should become normal for everybody in your company only then tqm will be implemented successfully and finally ensuring that customer satisfaction is there when there will be customer satisfaction automatically once you provide quality product at the desired price automatically customer satisfaction will be there right yes or no right after that what did we see suppose you want to implement tqm in a bank what will you do very simple you provide training to the staff what kind of training not just technical training where you'll be teaching him how to open the bank account how to look at the accounts and stuff like that all the technical part but also how to treat your customer how to talk to him how to explain him suppose sometimes you are not able to solve his problem then and there itself then how to convince him that this is not going to happen today you understand that that's customer care and also uh, next thing that you would like to do is try to give more staff to solve customer complaints faster and also reduce the length of the queue in case customer is suffering from what long queues in your bank that way you can implement tqm see these are all one of the things how we'll implement tqm correct up and also increase working hours of the bank for better customer experience suppose customer office timings ends at 5 o'clock you also close your bank at 5 o'clock it's not going to work try to open it till what 7 o'clock so that customer can come and take the services from your bank and finally provide single point of contact and also what nana online banking services this way you can try to implement tqm in a bank suppose if your bank is falling behind when compared to the competition right after that we have seen something called what nana six c's of tqm so what are six c's of tqm we have seen commitment culture control customer focus cooperation as well as continuous improvement in this lot of things we have already seen already we know that uh, to implement tqm we need to do something called continuous improvement already we know that for implementing tqm we need cooperation of everybody already we know that to implement tqm in the definition itself the entire focus will be on the customer already we know that to implement tqm we need quality culture correct ah yes sir what and also there is something called control which i have already explained you right this is one of the negative points of tqm also there will be too much of documentation for everything that you do isn't it yes sir what all right so probably a uh, little bit of new point here is that we can say commitment where a uh, quality improvement should become a normal part of everybody's job that i already told you it should become a normal habit correct 
Yes, sir. What? Right. Culture means I told you it is a change in attitude completely. Okay, that will happen once you train your employees. Next, control means what? I told you. Uh, control is really important. I gave you a perfect example of standard costing where just because you set the standards, everybody is not gonna follow it and achieve it. You have to what? See the actuals. You need to calculate the variance. After calculating the variance, you need to get the report. You need to document it, and you have to take a counter measure on it and punish or reward somebody who is responsible for something wrong, isn't it? This whole process we call it as control, correct? And that's why control is also important. In TQM, if you just set the rules and then leave it, it's not going to happen. You have to eventually what? Control it. And then customer focus. Yes, we know always will be focusing on the customer, not just the outside customer, but also the in. inside customer internal customer will be the other divisions correct and of course cooperation means total employee involvement where if you have multidisciplinary teams from different different departments and functions everybody has to put joint efforts and give solutions and finally we have something called continuous improvement so it is not a pro, uh, program where you have a starting date and ending date tqm is not like that tqm is like a process which goes on what nana continuously right after that we have seen one important thing what is that Deming's contribution to TQM. We know that Deming is known as father of quality control. And what Deming was trying to say is that you guys are obviously obviously wrong because always you blame the quality issues to what on the laborers, and that's absolutely wrong because only 15% of the quality problems is due to the inefficiency of the labor, whereas 85% of the quality problems are due to what, Nana? Your inefficient processes, systems, and your poor management. Okay, right. then we have seen very important 14 points of deming i told you you need not remember this 14 points where uh, he'll be asking you a question in the examination where please write deming's 14 points will he ask you something like that in the exam no but what will happen is that when we are trying to answer certain case scenarios and case studies we have to make use of these points to answer those case scenarios as well as case studies so that is important okay right so what are the deming's 14 points nana first one create constancy of purpose towards improvement so what is the meaning of it replace short term reaction with what nana long term planning i gave you mcl example there you remember that right next adopt the new philosophy what philosophy i have to adopt deming's philosophy only where always don't throw the blame on the laborers the actual blame you have to rectify your own internal systems internal process as well as the management and cease dependence on inspection that we have seen already so try to get it right the first time itself we have seen the example of uh, the what is that printer we have seen the example of that uh, yeah oil bottle and all that next move towards single supplier for any one item why because if you buy the same raw metal even though the raw metal is same from different suppliers there will be significant variations in your finished good because each uh, supplier will give you a different slightly different quality of raw metal so to ensure that quality is there for one finished good entire input should be bought from one supplier got the point so that the uniformity will be there next improve constantly and forever that is nothing but continuous improvement which we know correct institute training on the job yes you have to give training to your employees such that they will not create what defective units correct next institute leadership i told you the difference between leadership and bossism where bossism goes with what targets and pressure and all that leadership doesn't go with that it goes with quality of work okay next drive out fear what fear it prevents workers from acting in organization best interest means suppose a worker at the lowest level who is operating a machine has got a phenomenal idea to improve the operation of the machine or whatever it is and then you have to let him come forward and share his thoughts correct huh? and we have seen uh, in jat also one of the performance measurements in jat is number of ideas generated so therefore the more freedom that you give to the lower level workers who are operating on the machines the better ideas you'll get and that will be in the interest of the company as a whole so to make that happen you need to drive out the fear it's not there right now but once upon a time it was there so we were talking about 1970s 1960s 1950s you got the point next break down the barriers between departments so you see supply division is there you should look at the receiving division as what another customer don't try to see him like uh, normally what will happen before this if supply division is selling certain goods to the outside environment which means to the real uh, retail customers and also he is selling the same good to what receiving division he never used to give same importance to both the people he will treat the external customers with real uh, you know maturity real uh, you know what is that he'll give lot of importance on the timing and stuff like that but when it comes to the internal customer he used to take him in a what what do you say take it for granted you know something like that that kind of an attitude used to be there but deming said that don't show this differentiation you treat him the same way you treat what external customer next 
eliminate slogans what is eliminating slogans earlier they used to put a lot of posters and slogans where uh, because they felt that all the mistakes were on the laborers correct huh? and as a result the laborers used to get demotivated and that was actually counterproductive okay it was not helping the employees to increase their productivity so therefore now you eliminate all these things okay because you know that 85 percent problem in quality is due to what your own uh, processes weakness as well as what system weakness as well as poor management so therefore now you eliminate all these slogans they are no more necessary and after that we have seen something called production targets what is that eliminate management by objectives means objectives means target you never run a management with targets because you try to push the targets on your employees what they will do they will try to rush up their work so therefore they'll try to compromise on quality work for example they'll skip inspections and then they'll try to deliver the product faster to the customer. Now, this will definitely affect the quality. So, don't do that. Next, remove barriers to the pride of worksmanship. So, if any worker has really performed well, and that should be known to the top level management, recognize that and then try to give him a bonus or incentive or something like that. Make him an employee of the week or month or whatever it is. That will also encourage all the other employees. Overall, your efficiency of your entire employees will increase. And of course, last two points are very simple. What are they? What are they? exactly institute education and self-improvement and transformation is what nana everybody's job that we know because everybody has to involve when it comes to tqm correct huh? then we have seen uh, criticisms of tqm what are they nana too much documentation which we know and of course i gave you this example as well what is that too much of focus is on quality assurance and not on quality improvement i gave you the perfect example of toyota both innova as well as fortuner correct huh? so yes once you buy an innova whatever they are offering it's gonna be a qualitative stuff there is no doubt in that isn't it it's gonna work for sure but you're not trying to improve what you're offering you understand the point yes or what whatever toyota is offering yes it perfects it will run for five years seven years ten years fine down the line but when compared to the competition you are offering less features less luxury less quality of materials you understand what i'm trying to say so there is quality assurance yes whatever you're assuring is gonna work in that there is no deceiving part but your competitors are offering better. What about that? You try to do that as well. So that is one of the negative point of what Nana TQM. And of course, I've just give you one small point over here because some of you guys are getting confused between TQM and Six Sigma. So I told you that both of them indirectly, they improve the quality, but the approach is different. Uh, Six Sigma tries to improve the quality by what? Reducing the defects by identifying the root cause of the defects. But TQM is not like that. It tries to improve the quality by focusing on process improvement process efficiency the way work is done you understand the point so totally both these guys are actually different in their approach although the target is the same got it all right okay after that we have moved on to the next one what is the next one we have got business excellence model right right guys uh, so now we have something called business excellence model i told you that it is a dry topic already correct huh? right and uh, in the recent study metal the content has got changed so let's try to understand what is this a very simple understanding is it is nothing but self-assessment for a company so any organization would like to self-assess you know themselves so where do they stand uh, with respect to their industry how are they competing with respect to their competition do they have edge over their competition or are they actually weak with respect to what competition if that's the case then how they have to improve themselves so that they'll be able to what compete eventually so it's just like self-diagnosis, okay? Self-assessment of an organization. Got the point? Anyways, so now why do we need business excellence model? Well, to survive in a complicated and competitive modern business environment, a company should achieve excellence in what, Nana? All aspects of their business. Not one, not two, every aspect. So excellence in all aspects of business is nothing but business excellence. Why have to excel? Because you want to satisfy the needs of those who are impacted by your business operations in simple words stakeholders okay you got to satisfy all your stakeholders okay what kind of stakeholders uh, your customer is a stakeholder your employee is a stakeholder your supplier is a stakeholder okay the banks or financial institutions that who has given you loan is a stakeholder correct uh, government who collects taxes from you is a stakeholder the society around you is a stakeholder if they are getting affected by you you understand the point so your responsibility is to ensure that you give everything to these guys uh, which you are intended to give for example you have to make payment on time to the supplier you have to give good quality product to the customer with good customer service you have to give uh, good compensation to your employees and give them good growth growth opportunities correct huh? yes sir what right 
and you have to pay your bank loans on time and you have to pay taxes to the government on time isn't it that's the thing so that is what we call to satisfy the needs of those who are impacted by your business operations in other words all stakeholders i gave you two stakeholders example over here one is employers where uh, you have to give them good compensation growth learning experience and for society you have to give them ethical work you have to ensure that you do not employ any child labor and also betterment of your surroundings indirectly raising the standard of living will it happen yes it will happen whenever you see your uh, when there are a lot of companies the standard of living around those areas gets what improved because you have a lot of money right because a lot of people will be working and you've got a lot of money so automatically you'll buy a lot of things naturally what will happen standard of living will increase right after that we have seen the summary of pm what is summary of business excellence model excellence in what nana all aspects and satisfying the needs of all stakeholders and there are a lot of business excellence model in the entire world we have efqm European Foundation for Quality Management. We have got Singapore Business Excellence Framework. We have Australian. We have what? Japanese. But what we have in our syllabus and what is relevant for exam is what? Nana EFQM model. Next, we try to understand what is EFQM. We have a diagram, but before we get to the diagram, first we need to understand what it is. So, what is EFQM model? Ray? First of all, it has got three modules that provide a logical and systematic method of self-assessing the organization. Because we know that business excellence model is all about self-assessment of an organization. Correct? How to self-assess? We have three modules. What are those three modules? Module number one is direction. Module number two is execution. Module number three is results. Sir, what is direction? Sir, very simple. Why does an organization exist? Got the point? Explain the purpose of the organization and the strategy that it uses to operate its organization. Got the point? Yes, so what for example now imagine for a moment that you are the organization okay why do you exist right now as of now let's say that yeah your target is to pass what ca let's put it that way for ease of understanding okay then that is nothing but the module one direction so what's your direction in the direction of passing your ca correct yes for example you take our ica why do they exist they have to create what the qualified charter contents and they have to manage them isn't it and yes so what right you got the point. That's the purpose why an organization called ICA exists, right? To create these professionals, to manage these professionals, isn't it? Everybody, right? Next, module two is execution. So, what do you mean by execution? How does it deliver on its purpose and strategy? For example, we took our example, right? So, your target is to pass the CA. That is your direction, right? Next, how does it deliver on its purpose and strategy? How are you going to achieve the passing CA, which is your direction, correct? Probably you have to what? Put some effort, you have to write some exams, you have to get minimum 50 marks and stuff like that. Yes or what? You have to prepare for it, you have to appear for the exam, all these things. That will come under how? Next, results. What has the organization actually achieved and what it wishes to achieve in future? Now, you will actually write the exam and we'll see your results. Okay, did you really achieve what you're intended to do? You got the point. In case if you pass, then you as an organization, you have achieved what you wanted to achieve. There is a matter, that's all. So it's a simple three modules. What are those three modules? Why do you exist? Okay. How are you going to? So why do you exist means there is a purpose. And the next question is how are you going to achieve that purpose? And the third question is did you really achieve that purpose? Which is nothing but results. Correct? Everybody. It's a pretty simple thing. Okay. Just try to remember. That's what we have in the diagram. Direction, results, as well as what? Nana? Execution. Got the point? All right. Okay, after that we have seen that there is a key term over here which I have underlined. What is that key term? Sustainable. What is that? The logic of this particular model is to connect the purpose and strategy. Purpose means why a company exists. Strategy means what is it trying to do to achieve its existence. You understand the point? Which means, say for example, a company is there. Uh, let's say we talk about uh, Royal Enfield for example, IHR Motors. So what is the purpose of that particular company? Yeah, I want to be a leader when it comes to what 350cc segment vehicles let's put it that way got the point so that will be your direction what why do your organization exist and what you want to achieve correct how are you going to achieve it yeah i try to provide quality 350cc vehicles of varied uh, models like classic like meteor which is a th you know touring model like you've got multiple models isn't it and did you really achieve it yes the results show that he is the market leader even today isn't it Yes, so it's a simple thought process. So, the rational of this business excellence model is to connect the purpose and strategy. Also, find out how this connection between purpose and strategy can help the organization achieve and deliver what Nana sustainable value and outstanding results for its stakeholders. When I say stakeholders, it includes your customer, 
your employees your suppliers your uh, you know people who are trying to do business with you everybody it includes everybody right and the most important word here is sustainable value what do you mean by sustainable value not just today not just tomorrow for an infinite amount of time let's say 20 30 40 50 years you have to keep on delivering the same it's not just this year it's not just next year right then we have seen something called radar so what is this radar it acts as a diagnostic tool for this particular EFQM model because through EFQM model you are trying to self-assess yourself correct uh, as an organization that is nothing but we call it as business excellence model and for that radar will help now how radar will help first of all what is radar radar is an acronym for what R stands for results A stands for approach D stands for deploy A stands for assess and again R stands for refine so let's try to understand them so results means determine the results of the organization it is aiming to achieve as a part of its strategy in our example i just asked you to presume that you are an organization so that you'll have an ease of understanding then what's your results then determine the results that the organization is aiming to achieve what are you aiming to achieve pass ca november 2022 or may 2023 for example for example okay next approach means what the approach the organization will take to deliver the result now as well as in future for example, based on our assumption, in our example, you are the organization and uh, what is the approach that you will take to pass the CA exams? You will take coaching, you will study for 10 hours per day and you can get the right materials. You got the point? Yes. Next, deploy. Deploy means what? You have to execute this approach properly. Now, in approach, you know what to do and in deploy, you have to execute it. In reality, you have to really do that. For example, in reality, you have to study for 10 hours. In reality, you have to take coaching or in reality, you need to pre prepare from the right materials. And then finally, we have something called assess and refine. Assess and refine means what? You have to check whether what you have approached here and what you have executed, did they really work? Assessment is nothing but checking out whether it has really worked or not. How can you check whether it has really worked or not? Your exam should be, uh, you should be passing with good marks, correct? In case if it works, then whatever you have done so far is fine. In case if it didn't work, then you have to what? Refine. Refine means what? Better what you have done. You understand the point? Then you have to change your strategy again start from this one and again you try to achieve got it anyways then after that finally we have seen that uh, efqm model along with the radar which the radar which we have seen just now has got the following users so what are the users that we have got uh, first users it helps the company to build a holistic view of its current operation now what is holistic view complete view okay a to z view okay okay how are we operating what are our strength what are our weakness okay what is our market share uh, what are our competition in relation to them where do we stand where does our industry stand as a whole every single picture you will have a clarity with the help of what business excellence model and that business excellence model is what efqm next it helps organization to drive transformation through well thought of course of actions that can change its current operations to achieve what excellence in operations this steers the organization to achieve and sustain long-term vision through continuous improvement what do you mean by this this so-called efq model with radar framework will help you drive what transformation through well thought of course of action for example in our example we were talking about passing your ca exams correct yes so what once you do self-assessment to pass your ca exams that so-called self-assessment will help you what to understand where you are right now and it will drive the transformation transformation means what the change what needs to happen say for example you're just studying for four hours or five hours a day the transformation will happen maybe you'll start studying for more number of hours or you'll start studying effectively or you'll start studying the right books or if you feel that you can't self-study then you'll start taking coaching or if you're already taking coaching if you feel that self-study is enough you'll go for self-study whatever it is ultimately it's a transformation it's a change got the point hello yes all right it also helps organizations sense and prepare a response for market disruption very 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 important this build agility or in other words flexibility and resilience in what business operation i think i gave you a fantastic example for that what example i gave you with regard to building the response for market disruption any something wrong happens in the market how will you respond the greater flexibility you'll have the response will be very strong and you'll not be affected by that correct i gave you a perfect example of what safola you remember that did I give you the Suffolk example or not? What is the challenge that they have faced? How did they really overcome that? Correct? Yes, it was a very interesting case study. Anyways, after that, the EFQM award is a coveted award, of course. If you follow EFQM, there is a good thing because EFQM is very famous. And as a result, we will also start giving awards. 
and if you follow our EFQM model, then we will be giving you the best implementation of EFQM, whatever it is. And then because of that, your goodwill also will what? Increase that point they are trying to say. Because uh, they say that, yeah, EFQM is what? Globally pretty famous and therefore they can bring what? Not only that, another important thing, just like your accounting standards, what they are trying to do is that if every company starts implementing EFQM to self-assess themselves, then what will happen? We'll have the data of all the companies, isn't it? So that will bring uniformity in criteria while assessing the organization relative position in the marketplace. I'll have uh, the data of business excellence model of one organization in EFQM, another organization also in EFQM. What can I do? I can compare them. You understand the point? And then I can see what is the total position of the industry. I'll be able to understand clearly what company, where it stands. Got the point? Hello? Yes. All right. Fantastic. So with this, we're done with what? We're done with what, Ray? Business excellence model. Okay. Now we're done. Shall we move on? Bol Ray Mukus. All right. Now, next we have something called theory of constraints. Okay. Now, before we get to theory of constraints, I told you that we need to understand three things. What are those three things, Nana? What is a constraint? What is a limiting factor? And what is a bottleneck? Constraint means I told you that anything that makes achieving your objective difficult than it would otherwise be is a constraint. Means Suppose you want to reach a destination on your bike and reaching the destination is your objective. Then in the way, a pothole, a speed breaker, a traffic signal, a narrow lane, everything will make reaching your destination difficult than it would otherwise be. Correct? So all those potholes, speed breakers, that this, that this, everything, we call it as constraint. So constraint is a very big term. Okay. What is a limiting factor? We already know. We have seen it in decision making chapter. Scarce resources or nothing but limiting factor. Raw metal can be scarce. Uh, labor hours can be scarce, machine hours can be scarce, correct? Huh? If their availability is less, automatically they will become limiting factor. So then we have seen something called bottleneck. So what is a bottleneck? Uh, anything that slows down your manufacturing activity is a bottleneck. So logically speaking, uh, limiting factor and bottleneck, they are actually same. Okay. So if raw metal availability is less, automatically it will slow down your manufacturing activity. It's as simple as that. If Mishnah's availability is less, automatically it will slow down your manufacturing activity. Correct? So basically both of them are same. Right. After that, uh, we have seen something called, there, there are two people called Goldratt and Cox and they had a new approach for production and that approach is referred as what Nana? OPT. What is OPT? optimized production technology so what is this optimized production technology this opt says that you can expand your profits by increasing what throughput now what is throughput throughput is nothing but sales minus direct material cost now that throughput can also be called as a throughput contribution for that i already told you the logic what is that we presume that the time scale is what very small so when the time scale is very small almost every cost will behave as a fixed cost except one cost what is that one cost direct material and therefore, the only variable cost in such a kind of a scenario based on the presumption is a direct metal cost. So logically speaking, this formula is actually what Nana contribution is equal to sales minus variable cost. And that variable cost is what direct metal because in this scenario, only direct metal is a variable cost and uh, the contribution will be referred as throughput contribution. So in other words, it is nothing but sales minus variable cost. Okay, right. Then we try to understand what is this OPT approach. What is OPT? Optimized production technology. So OPT basically means that they say that first of all, you identify all your resources in your factory, then divide them into two categories. One is bottleneck, the other one is non-bottleneck. And then non-bottleneck resources do not utilize them to their 100% of their capacity and bottleneck resources, you utilize them to the 100% of the capacity. That is what OPT says. Okay. Now, we try to understand the logic behind that. Why are they telling us to utilize bottleneck resources to 100% and why are they telling us not to utilize the non-bottleneck resources to what Nana? 100%. For that, we try to take an example. We took three machines and machine one capacity per hour is how much? 5,000. Machine two is 3,000. Machine three is 6,000. Now, out of these three machines, we know that machine two is what Nana? Bottleneck. Correct? Right? Because it is slow. So we have three machines over here and uh, machine two is the bottleneck. Why machine two is the bottleneck? Because its capacity is what? 3000 units per hour. So according to the OPT, what is that he's trying to say? Uh, utilize this machine two to what? 100% of its capacity because it is bottleneck. 
and do not utilize machine one and machine three to its what nana hundred percent of its capacity. What is the logic? The logic is suppose if you utilize machine one to hundred percent of its capacity, then you will be able to manufacture how many units nana five thousand in one hour, and this guy will be able to manufacture only three thousand, or he'll be able to take only three thousand in that one hour. Correct? Huh? And as a result, indirectly, what happens? There will be a two thousand units of WAP stock getting piled up between machine one as well as machine two. That is in one hour. Then imagine what's the situation in two hours, three hours, four hours, five hours, six hours. There's a lot of WAP inventory that will get piled up. And we have already seen in JIT uh, that if WAP inventory piles up, there are two problems majorly. One is a lot of uh, money that gets blocked, so you'll have a heavy opportunity cost, or working capital requirement will increase. and if any defects are manufactured by machine 1 unless the machine 2 operator works upon the pile of wap stock over here that defect will not be communicated to the machine 1 operator till that time machine 1 operator will keep on what manufacturing the defects which is not good for the company correct ah so to avoid this wap stock before the bottleneck machine which is m2 we say that utilize bottleneck machine to the extent of 100% which is 3000 units per hour and also the non bottleneck machines which is m1 and m2 i mean m1 as well as m3 do not utilize them to their 100% levels not utilizing to the levels of 100% means what utilize them to the level of what bottleneck which means now bottleneck is manufacturing 3000 which means m1 also should manufacture 3000 m3 also should manufacture 3000 so that wip will be avoided correct ah that's what opt says right after that what did we see uh we have seen operational measures of toc what is that operational measures we just try to understand three important terms in theory of constraints what are those three important terms nana throughput contribution then what investment then we have something called operating expenses correct so throughput contribution means what obviously it is an inflow so i want it to get increased correct investment means it is the money that is getting blocked so always i want it to keep at its minimum and uh, operating expenses is nothing but outflow so i want to i want it to get reduced or minimized correct ah and of course here i told you the most important thing even direct labor will be considered as what nana fixed cost because there is an assumption of small time capsule so the only variable cost is what nana direct material cost although sometimes in questions he will also tell you that direct labor is also variable if it is specifically told in the question that direct labor is variable what do you have to do take direct labor as variable cost only so ultimately it's a question that you have to follow but 90 to 95% of the cases only direct metal will be what variable got the point anyways after that what did we see we have seen uh, goldratt's five step method for improving what nana performance correct for bottleneck machine what are the five step process first you have to identify the constraint in our example is m2 correct ah and exploit the constraint so utilize m2 to 100% of its capacity which is 3000 units per hour in our example then subordinate and synchronize to the constraint which means m1 and m2 uh, sorry m3 you need to subordinate them to what m2 and synchronize synchronize means what m2 is manufacturing 3000 therefore m1 and m3 also should manufacture 3000 that is what we call it as synchronization after that elevate the performance of the constraint elevation means what improve the performance of the bottleneck right now it is operating at 3000 which is m2 correct ah you try to elevate it such that it will manufacture something more than 3000 how can you ensure that it will manufacture something more than 3000 oh i told you a lot of examples na yesterday ah suppose uh, there are four workers who are working upon m2 machine right now increase it to what six workers if you feel that because of four workers they are not working to the fullest capacity of m2 suppose right now you are working 5 days in a week you increase that to 7 days suppose you are working 8 hours per day you increase that to 12 hours suppose there is a any spare part that you can change such that uh, the efficiency of the m2 will increase then you do that as well ultimately you do lot of things if nothing is working you can change the machine as well that's the last resort ultimately the intention is to elevate the performance of the constraint such that what will happen once you elevate the performance of the constraint which is a bottleneck it ceases to become bottleneck correct ah but once it ceases to become bottleneck somebody else will become bottleneck and again you will repeat the same process then you take that somebody else he will become bottleneck then again you will exploit which means utilize to 100% again you will subordinate and synchronize all others to the bottleneck and again you will elevate the performance of the bottleneck and again somebody else will become bottleneck and then this keep on what going so it will it is a non stop cycle okay so that is what i've explained here as well okay chalo 
right nana after that what we have seen we have seen something called throughput accounting ratio so what is throughput accounting ratio inflow per limiting factor divided by outflow per limiting factor that's what i've told you in the simplest terms inflow is nothing but throughput contribution divided by limiting factor is nothing but bottleneck minute correct it can be bottleneck hour or it can be bottleneck minute divided by outflow is nothing but factory cost per limiting factor is nothing but per bottleneck minute correct so ultimately this will give us an idea of how much is inflow with respect to what nana outflow just like your profitability index in your ca inter correct so generally we will calculate this ta ratio for so many products like a b c suppose for a the ta ratio is 1.2 for b it is 0.9 for c it is 1.3 what does it mean it means that b should not be continue to be manufactured because 0.9 means it is less than 1 less than 1 means what your inflow is less than outflow therefore you should not be manufacturing b what about a and c in my example it's greater than 1 so no problem and c is the most profitable one you understand the point that way ta ratio will help you to identify which product is actually giving you what good profit chalo okay how to improve ta this we know uh, if you want to increase this ta ratio what are the two choices increase the numerator or what reduce the denominator pretty simple okay after that what did we see a very important topic what is that nana supply chain management right so what is the supply chain management buddies it is nothing but management of what flow of products not only products services not only services data which is information all the way from origin of the product which means in our example we took the tires example correct uh, where the origin of the product will be uh, from the forest where the raw metal will you will be getting right from there to the consumption of the final product where it is consumed by the end user correct uh, who is using a bike or a car or whatever it is right and that we call it as what nana supply chain management to put it very simple ensuring that the entire chain of supply is intact it's not broken you understand the point because in that entire supply chain you can see some 10 companies or 20 companies or 30 companies will be there right from the original origin and the end user correct if any of these companies are suffering then the whole supply chain gets affected correct yes or what right now that is what is happening now in the entire supply chain there is one area in china which is shanghai i don't know it is shanghai or i don't know i think it is shenzhen i think so whatever it is i'm not sure with respect to the name in that area because of corona what has happened the entire manufacturing operations has got stopped which is which has not been started even today if i'm not wrong because of that the whole supply chain got affected you understand the point and that's the reason why we have so much waiting periods with respect to our cars today you understand the point so from this only you have to understand that managing the supply chain is that important that's why we have a separate topic on that which we call it as management of supply chain which is nothing but supply chain management okay what is the objective what is the target of this uh, supply chain management you have to correlate your production and distribution of the goods in case you are manufacturing something with the demand of the product such that it should match with the customer's demand so that customers get what they want when they want where they want and the price they want but right now what's happening is that uh, the companies are not able to match their uh, production with the demand of the product especially in case of cars correct because the demand is very high especially post corona many people are willing to buy what private uh, vehicles exactly and because of the supply chain shortage especially the chips because one organization in your entire supply chain got affected these guys are not able to meet the demand so they are not able to provide customers what they want especially when they want and also at the price they want now you can see price has got increased like anything isn't it everybody all right okay then we have seen something called process of supply chain management this is very important for us especially for solving what uh, case studies and case scenarios so the entire process of supply chain management has got how many nana four things what are those four things plan develop is nothing but procure make as well as what nana deliver it's very easy right first you plan then you procure the raw metals then you manufacture then you deliver that's all it's very simple to remember isn't it everybody all right so what is plan instead of ad hoc production ad hoc means blind kind of production blind means without giving any importance to what the actual demand is you just keep on producing on your own without any thought process just based on gut feeling okay so instead of doing like that don't do that 
you develop a proper production plan after understanding the customer requirements you try to do the research see how many units they want accordingly you try to make your production then once you have done with your planning now i have to procure the raw materials in order to manufacture correct where you will procure raw materials from your suppliers what sort of raw materials good raw materials with good quality and on time it should not be delayed correct after you get the raw materials you will manufacture the finished goods which is nothing but making so how to manufacture the finished goods manufacture it in such a way that the quality is equal to the requirement of the customer got the point this will automatically capture the ever changing customer demand for example i gave an example earlier sedans were in demand in india now what suvs are in demand so accordingly every brand is launching an suv only when they try to launch their brand for example kia seltos mg hector correct you have seen all those examples in detail or what all right and finally deliver deliver manufacturing product to customer with what nana excellent logistics and i told you logistics are really important because you have to deliver on time i gave you an example of toyota glanza versus toyota balino you remember that did i give you that example ah uh, yes exactly chalo okay after that we have seen some important notes what is that always logistics will play a crucial role right from procuring raw materials you need logistics movement of raw materials in the plan also you need that delivery of the final product to the to whom customers you need good logistics for example amazon and all these guys they are taking i gave you the real life example of what e cart you remember that all right next warehousing also plays a crucial role i gave you the example of samsung mobile phone in case your screen gets damaged you try to go and try to give it to the service center and if there is no local warehouse if there is a centralized warehouse i explain you how it will happen correct ah you guys remember that award all right next seamless flow of information is also critical right from capturing customer requirement to production plan to intimating supplier for supplying what nana raw metal for that you need integrated erp here also i gave you example of mcdonalds do you guys remember what seamless flow of information i also gave you example of amazon correct ah also scm is the backbone of e-commerce industry which requires fulfillment of orders from any place and any time that we know why because scm uh research is a core reason why e-commerce industry has got boom right now isn't it because in e-commerce basically what happens you got to connect lot of people that to on a real time basis isn't it yes sir what i gave you that example as well and because there was lot of study already went through into scm and that scm worked as a backbone for your e-commerce boom got it so which means what you are trying to say is that if there is no scm there will be no e-commerce absolutely yes that's what i've told you already isn't it yes all right okay finally later we have seen types of supply chain how many types of supply chain we have two types what are they nana exactly one is push model the other one is pull model push model means what uh first of all we will decide a product i gave you colgate plaques example you remember that and then we will try to push the product into the market by doing what advertisement and customer will not ask for anything correct ah but in pull model what happens customer will demand the product and then he will pull the dealer dealer will pull the company through let's say i gave an example right the last department in the company let's say production department 3 production department 3 will pull p2 p2 will pull p1 p1 will pull the supplier you remember that that's why it is called as what model pull model i explained you with the help of this example correct ah so this guy pulls this guy 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 and this guy pulls what vendor so it is pull model that's why because you are pulling correct hello here what is happening he pushes here this guy pushes here this guy pushes here this guy pushes here and finally you push it on to the customer through advertising got the point or we can also call it as marketing correct ah hello all right so after that we have seen scm for service industry what are the problems that we going to face in service industry basically services are more customized unlike your products correct ah so therefore meeting customer requirements which are uncertain and also they will be what ever changing that's the biggest challenge you will face once you try to implement your supply chain management in a service sector industry the best example that we have seen yesterday is what tourism industry i explained you that you remember that so customer requirement should be fulfilled considering capability of the organization which means we should not give over promises more than what we can capable of doing yes in other words there has to be a balance between meeting customer requirements and also maintaining effective supply chain management what is effective supply chain management customer and company both get required level of service in what nana cost effective manner got it all right so example i gave you 
uh, if you are running a tourism industry okay tourism company accept only those packages where customer and tourism company both can get what required level of service from their suppliers from their suppliers means what my, i ask my customer to go to some other place nana like for example let's say it is uh, sri lanka suppose in colombo in colombo i'll have my own partner my supplier as a tourism industry guy i'll have a taxi partner i'll have a hotel partner isn't it is that what so what i have to do when the customer comes to me look at the wording I accept only those packages with the customer i'll accept only those packages from the customer means what i will only give some promises to the customer such that where customer and tourism company customer and me i'm the tourism company both can get required level of service from their supplier means what i need to get money from him right plus the customer needs to get required level of service whether it can be food or it can be transport or it can be sightseeing places whatever it is you understand the point yes everybody all right after that we have seen that uh, there are two things in supply chain management one is upstream the other one is downstream so what is upstream nana so i am the company above me we call it as up who is above me supplier so all managing of all the transactions with the supplier i call it as upstream supply chain management who is below me customer right so all management of all the transactions with the customer we call it as downstream supply chain management now upstream is very simple i told you it is not that important as well and uh, there are only two things when it comes to upstream what are those two things nana one is relationship with supplier the other one is use of information technology what do you mean by using information technology you try to source the supplier online which we call it as e sourcing and you try to what purchase the raw materials from the supplier online you try to make payment online which is nothing but we call it as e sourcing e purchasing and e payment which is nothing but use of it another thing and most important thing is maintaining the relationship with the supplier that also comes under up, upstream supply chain management what do you mean by maintaining relationship for example uh, you know what are your strategies when you try to finalize a supplier first of all do you need supplier then try to take a make or buy decision if i manufacture on my own what's going to be my cost if i try to buy from the supplier what will be my cost accordingly take a good decision then try to identify number of suppliers and don't always depend on one single supplier you always depend on multiple suppliers but have relationship with one core supplier then cost quality and speed so your supplier should be selected based on three important criteria what are they cost so that he gives you at an affordable price plus the quality of the raw material should be good plus he should be able to deliver faster as per the promise got the point everybody right after that what do we have source source means what the supplier should be nearby the location should be nearby and he should be available all the time in case of emergency as well correct huh? right after that what did we see nana we have seen something called downstream supply chain management in that i told you only two things are important what are those two things customer relationship management and relationship marketing brand strategy and use of it or you know pretty simple okay first we started with relationship marketing where we have something called what nana six market model okay what is this six market model see as per relationship marketing what is your objective your objective is to keep your existing customer but also to attract what nana new customer exactly isn't it right so to do that one organization should have proper customer care appropriate prices and also what nana helpful staff to achieve this organization should focus on six market domains so we have seen that six market domains right what is the first market supplier market where supplier itself will act as a customer then we have internal market where your own staff also should act as your customer correct then we have recruitment market i need good relationship with the recruitment so that i'll get the potentially good employees uh, without them i can't manufacture a good product i can't provide a good quality service correct then influence market means we have seen instagram influencers correct they will influence our product through advertising of course we have to pay them money then we have customer market once our customer is satisfied he himself will act as a act as what reference he will refer and then we have referral market as well here we will refer it officially we'll give them some money that if you refer then so much so much money will pay you right just like how apps are doing whereas in customer market it will happen unofficially customer out of his own interest he'll do without any uh, you know monetary compensation got the point yes everybody all right then we have seen use of it of course in use of it how will you maintain your relationship with the customer you will send him what mails care also you'll try to give him some links you try to sell your product through what e business and also monitoring your customer transactions which we have seen daily in our social media correct 
and then amazon is also doing the same thing na once you search something in amazon you know what's going to happen it will really bombard you with what advertisement isn't it buy this buy this buy this buy this just like in that movie junior entire movie is there andhra wala in that that one old lady will be there she'll be always behind brahmanandam you remember that yare yeah, i actually get the same feeling the moment uh, i try to search something you know then you open insta you open anything then there'll be babu please buy babu please buy babu please buy like that you will be bombarded with ads isn't it yes or what all right obviously right then brand strategy i think i gave you example for this brand strategy as well for example the moment we think about orange uh, immediately what comes to our mind ktm bikes the moment we think about green what comes to our mind kawasaki isn't it we have seen all those examples right so use of logo or specific color or any other means to make the product distinctively visible just goes with apple as well their logo isn't it care nana and i told you the example of apple stickers how once upon a time what was the intention behind apple stickers you know how they were taking on ibm once upon a time and all those things isn't it yes right after that what did we see nana customer relationship management this is very 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 important what is this customer relationship management uh, knowing the needs of the customer and providing best possible solution based on the personal information very core thing here you will understand the personal information of the customer his purchase history as well as his buying preferences because we know that a satisfied customer will bring in more customers and a dissatisfied customer will take away a lot of customers from you that we know correct okay in that we have divided them into so many sub parts first part is analyzing a customer and their behavior second part is customer account profitability which can also be called as customer profitability analysis which we'll see in sao chapter correct ah third one is customer lifetime value fourth one is what selecting a customer acquiring him retaining him and then extending him correct ah kya re all right now what is the first one analysis of customer and their behavior means what you got to understand the customer and his buying characteristics based on lot of things one is his geographical location i gave you the example of uttarakhand versus us correct ah then purchasing characteristics what is purchasing characteristics what is his nature will he wait if there is a waiting time or would he like to you know enjoy the car or bike immediately what's his purchasing characteristics how many years once he will change the car he will change the bike everything will be studied you understand the point then expectation of benefits which is quality discount it depends that's the reason people buy in december i told you that example as well isn't it especially when it comes to cars and safety need i gave you the perfect example of what tata and mahindra that to nowadays and that all the other cars also they are improving their safety because the per perception of uh, you know what is that yeah people have got changed isn't it and of course social need i gave you the example of toyota innova and uh, you know one of my friend real estate friend why he specifically bought what toyota innova because there is a social purpose in the society the way they look at innova isn't it did i tell you that example exactly all right next moving on to the next one customer account profitability so i told you that uh when you open your uh, internet banking of your banks you will find a area called offers where you will have pre approved loans and all that i told you the reason behind that how these things will work isn't it for that what did i tell you exactly they will try to analyze each and every customer uh they'll try to analyze what is the revenue they earned from that particular customer minus what is the cost that they've incurred to give that sort of a service to that particular customer and finally they'll divide the customers into four categories which we call it as what platinum gold uh iron and lead correct and platinum customers are the most profitable customers gold are profitable uh, uh iron is uh, not profitable but desirable but the last one is not profitable not desirable correct ah uh? yes or uh, what and of course to calculate this customer account profitability you need the information based on activity based costing that also we have seen and of course we'll be solving problems based on this concept in which chapter sao chapter and the concept name called customer profitability analysis right now we'll not be doing all those things we just try to understand so as i told you think from bank's perspective because bank is the example that we have taken okay uh, so what will happen nana bank will analyze the customer all the customers and it will split the customers into segments and then it will calculate the annual revenue that you earn from every customer then it will calculate the annual cost of serving the customer then revenue minus cost will give it an idea of who is the most profitable customer and who is the least profitable customer and eventually it will eliminate the unprofitable segments of customers correct ah and then we have seen an example over here how a, if a bank wants to give credit cards okay 
how they will try to divide the customers into these categories and mostly for platinum and gold customers only you will receive calls from banks saying that the credit card is for lifetime free that this and all those things you understand the point hello everybody and this is also a kind of a strategy only that is the reason only offers will be there on credit cards more than debit cards have you ever observed because you want to make people buy with the money they don't own actually today even today i don't have any credit cards because i don't like buying things which uh, which is not my money you know you understand the point and also i'm very bad at remembering the due dates so in credit card you'll know what will happen if you don't remember your due dates isn't it <laughs> you'll be like fined like anything isn't it chalo anyways now moving on to next one what is the next one you have got customer lifetime value for this also i gave an example uh, engineering college and in that surrounding engineering college if you have a multiplex and i know that this guy will be studying in this engineering college for 4 years and he will be regularly coming to my multiplex for theater he will be buying snacks and all that then i will calculate the customer lifetime value correct which is nothing but present value of future cash flows of from this particular customer for a period of how many years in this example 4 years so customer lifetime value is nothing but net present value that a company desires from a customer over an entire lifetime so here you have to take a judgment with regard to the duration of the relationship in our example what was the duration 4 years by considering customer loyalty estimated frequency of purchase which means how many times he'll come and uh, is there any comp data that we are going to get say for example another mall can come correct uh, in the nearby place exactly right moving on to the last one what is the last one ana selecting a customer how to select a customer i told you bmw selects their customer in a different way uh marathi selects their customer in a different way isn't it similarly uh if you want to have a, a veterinary clinic set up then you select your customer in a different way you generally open the clinic in a rich area i told you all those examples correct you remember that and then you want to acquire the customer we'll go for search engine optimization as well as what advertising that also i've told you right and then you have to retain your customers correct how will you retain your customers give them quality product give them quality service automatically they'll be retained and of course finally once you have retained your customer you have to what resell him cross sell him upsell him what do you mean by reselling say for example it's a mobile phone after one year he's going to change the mobile phone what he will do he'll give you the old, old phone and then he'll take the new phone that is reselling suppose he wants to upgrade the mobile phone then i'll take the old phone and then i'll sell him a costlier one that is upselling or if i take the mobile phone and then i'll try to give him what accessories along with the mobile phone you understand the point sir this uh, bluetooth speaker is good or this earphones is good or airpods or something like that along with the mobile we call it as cross selling got the point chalo fantastic and finally we have the last concept what is the last concept nana gain sharing arrangement i told you i gave you that uh, movie example you remember that so gain sharing arrangement means uh, let's say there is a hospital and hospital gets lots of patients and they need to do lot of diagnostic work like uh, ct scans a lot of scans and uh, blood tests that tests this test and all that they don't have the equipment with them nor they have the machines so they have two choices either they can buy all this and they can recruit the doctors for this and then everything do it themselves or there is another guy like say for example vijaya diagnostics who can do all the job for you he is the supplier okay so in this case what will happen uh, that diagnostics guy the vijaya diagnostics he will take the first step he will come to the hospital he will say that see instead of you buying everything on your own which is going to cost you so much and then you have to recruit the doctors which will cost you so much and then you have to pay them salaries and they will do only this level of service when compared to us who are already what experts instead of that if you can you know refer all your patients to us you know where we will be doing their diagnostics uh, scans etc etc then uh, this much is the profit that we can earn based on the difference between the fee that you collect and the cost that we incur okay and this profit we can you know share in this ratio like 60 40 or 50 50 whatever it is or able to understand and also the supplier here in this case which are diagnostic says that in case we are not going to get any profit then you need not pay me any single rupee so without any guarantee of payment i'll start providing my service correct that we call it as what nana gain sharing arrangement because in this example they are sharing the gain correct yes or what right so supplier performs his side of the contract with no guarantee of receiving what ana payment and payment will be based on the benefit to the customers so basically who is the customer here in my example hospital hospital is a customer you understand the point hello yes so basically from this arrangement either the supplier can be rewarded with large return or can walk away with nothing 
So GSA seems to be a win-win situation for both supplier as well as customer since interest of both the parties are aligned. In my example, that was the case. Correct. Another angle of GSA arrangement is that you need to take a lot of precautions when you are entering into GSA agreement. What are the precautions? First one, you be specific and both the parties need to transfer the data honestly. Are you able to understand? Only then both the parties will know exactly how much profit or is it getting earned so that they will be distributing that in a good way. Correct. If you are not honest with the other guy, if you are not transparent, then what will happen? Maybe the other guy feels that you are showing a wrong data, then the whole agreement will not work. Correct. Next, predefined formula for sharing of benefits. That is also very important. So that tomorrow there is no confusion after the GSA has been implemented. Efforts from both entities are required, not just the supplier. Supplier will only agree for no guarantee of payment. That's all. That's the good thing that he is doing from his side. That doesn't mean that only supplier has to work. Even the hospital also has to work in this case. Correct. Yes. And finally, poor drafting of clauses or inaccurate GSA formula can lead to failure of GSA because it will lead to conflict. Once there is a conflict, naturally GST agreement will be what? What? Ah, it will collapse. As simple as that. Got it? Chalo, that's it. So with this, we are done with the revision of what? Very quick revision of what? Modern business environment. Now you guys can take a break. Okay? Chalo. After that, we'll start solving sums. Right, and hello friends. Uh, so welcome back to PKS classes. Okay, this is your CA Prasanna Kumar, and we will go with another revision lecture. Now this time the chapter is going to be strategic analysis of operating income, a very important chapter, now, especially for up the upcoming attempt. I mean for the upcoming attempt. Okay, so try to concentrate. And uh, as usual, I have been telling this in the previous decision making, transfer pricing, all these revision chapters as well. That if you want to buy this power notes, you can buy the hard copy. From PKSL classes app. I'll put the link for the app in the description. You can uh, download it directly from Google Play Store. Okay. And I'll put the uh, link with respect to iOS. Okay. Uh, for those uh, Apple users, that link also I'll put it in the uh, description. So you can directly download and you can order and you can get it so that you'll be able to follow these revision lectures in a much better way. Anyways, having said that, uh, so this is a rapid revision marathon. Okay. So therefore we don't have sufficient time. We need to cover as much content as possible within a time period of one, one and a half hour for this particular chapter. Okay. So we'll try to do that. So therefore I want you guys to, uh, uh, you know, follow this entire session with utmost concentration and don't try to fast forward it because always the, already the session will be in what fast forward because it's a rapid revision marathon, right? Anyways. So the chapter is strategic analysis of operating income. So if you look at the bird's eye view of this particular chapter, uh, we have, these are all the contents that we have got strategic profitability analysis under which you have got growth component, price recovery component and productivity component. Apart from that, we have activity based costing, ABC, activity based management, cost management, ABM. Under that we have value added and non value added activities. Then we have got activity based budgeting. Apart from that, we have got profitability analysis through activity based costing, DPP, direct product profitability and CPA, customer profitability analysis. Customer profitability analysis, CPA is nothing but customer account profitability, okay, which we have seen as part and parcel of SCM, that is supply chain management, okay. So both are nothing but the same. Anyways, now this particular area, we are not going to cover in this particular chapter. It will be covered as a part and parcel of what standard costing and that is the right thing to do. Are you able to understand? I have seen many students by hearting this particular area outside out of your study material. I think some three pages full of formulae is present in your ICA study material. So I've seen students what they are trying to do is they're trying to buy heart this. Don't do that uh, without by hearting with just mere, uh, you know, common sense and logic. You can easily cover this particular concept. In fact, this is this particular concept is very easy. Trust me. But you should be covering that as part and parcel of standard costing, not as part and parcel of this particular chapter. That is the right thing to do. So keep this in mind. You have a standard costing revision marathon. I think four and a half hours. I've already uploaded, I think, two months back. It's a very comprehensive revision. You can just follow that particular revision session to have an idea. Okay. Chalo. Anyways. Right. Let's move on. So now we'll start with the first one. Profitability analysis through activity-based costing. This particular concept is already covered by me even in revision uh, lectures as well. Okay. As part and parcel of decision making chapter under activity based CVP analysis. Already decision making revision lectures has been done. 
and activity based CVP analysis already has been covered. So you can check out that particular lecture. Okay, right. Now let's move on. So let's look into the introduction part. In modern manufacturing environment and service sector right now, whatever the new manufacturing environment that is happening, direct costs are relatively low and overhead costs are relatively high. And not only overhead costs are high, but also they tend to be not volume related. This is not a new concept for us. We have already seen this in decision making revision. Okay. In decision making revision, we have already seen this. This is not new. Uh, I've already explained you what was the, you know, once upon a time, what was the situation? It was seller's market. Now it is buyer's market. And I was, when I was trying to explain you activity based CVP analysis and activity based costing concept also, we have already seen as part and parcel of decision making chapter. They have clearly explained this. So once upon a time, direct cost used to be 90%, indirect cost or overheads used to be less than or equal to 10%. But now, direct cost is somewhere around 60% on an average, indirect cost is somewhere around 40%. Are you able to understand? So this is what we are trying to say here. Not only that, they also tend to be not volume related means we have seen non-unit based fixed cost. I hope uh, you guys remember that, which means those fixed costs which does not vary with respect to change in volume, but they vary with respect to change in something other than volume, like number of setups, number of requisitions, okay, number of inspections, something like that, cost drivers. Okay, so this whole thing is something that we know. So it is nothing new. We have already seen as part and parcel of decision making. Even in revision, we have covered. So in this kind of situation, activity-based costing with its emphasis on activities and their cost drivers helps cost to identify more easily and manage more efficiently. That's obvious. Uh, we already know the concept of activity-based costing. So that is also not something that is new. We have seen it as part and parcel of decision making revision. Let's move on to the next one. Let's have an example. Let's say there are two products, A and B. Units produced are 10,000 and 10,000. Okay, Mishnas is 20,000 for A, 80,000 for B. Variable cost per unit is 3 and 4. Now, if you look at the fixed overhead cost, uh, setup cost is 1 lakh, depreciation is 2 lakhs and delivery cost is 1 lakh. Total fixed cost will be how much? 4 lakhs. Okay. So, what you have to do is that allocate this total fixed overhead cost, which is 4 lakhs, to product A and B using traditional method, that is Mishnah's method, as well as, uh, you know, uh, traditional method or absorption costing method and then determine the total cost. Right? And here one assumption that we have taken is budgeted units and cost are same as actual units and cost. That's the only assumption that we have taken because we are trying to understand the concept over here. So let's try to keep it simple. Okay. So it's pretty simple right now. So first we need to calculate Mishnah rate or you can also call it as overhead absorption rate or you can also call it as cost driver rate which is nothing but total overhead cost. Okay. This one which is 4 lakhs that is budgeted overheads right now divided by total Mishnas. Are you able to understand? Because right now we feel that Mishnas is the predominant influencing factor. This is nothing new. I've already covered this as part and parcel of decision making revision. There we have seen uh, concept of absorption. I don't know whether you guys remember or not. If you have seen that lecture, you will be able to, you know, remember. Concept of absorption we have seen already. In that, we have already covered this particular concept. Anyway, I'm just trying to brush it up one more time. Okay. <clears throat> So Mishnah rate is nothing but total budgeted fixed overheads divided by total budgeted Mishnas. So which is 4 lakhs over here. Total Mishnas is 20 plus 80. So which is going to be how much? 1 lakh. So you got the Mishnah rate as 4 rupees per Mishnah. Okay. Now let's calculate total cost of product A which is nothing but direct cost plus indirect cost. DC plus IC. Or in other words variable cost plus overhead cost. Now direct cost is how much? Three. That is directly given. So put it over here. What about overhead cost? So you guys need to look into overhead cost over here. How many Mishnas they have taken? So you've got 10,000 units produced. Mishnas total is 20,000, which means 20,000 divided by 10,000. Per unit, it will be two hours. Each unit will take two Mishnas. Per hour, the rate is four rupees. So four into two Mishnas, you get the overhead cost as eight. The total cost of product A will be 11. What about total cost of product B? Already you've got the direct cost, which is four. Put it over here. Then indirect cost, 80,000 divided by 10,000 units. 80,000 Mishnas divided by 10,000 units means 8 hours per unit, right? So 8 hours into 4 rupees per Mishnah, which we have calculated. So you've got the total cost of product B as 36. Okay, right? So this is what we do as per traditional uh, system, traditional method. You can also call it as absorption costing method. You can also call it as Mishnah's method, whatever it is, right? This is traditional method. In traditional method, I told you there are six different types of 
overhead absorption rates. It can be uh, material cost, it can be labor cost, it can be prime cost, it can be Mishnah's method, it can be labor's method, it can be units method. Out of these six, we are using this particular method in this particular problem. I mean, in this particular example, which is Mishnah's method. Are you able to understand? So, which means you need to understand that Mishnah's is the predominant influencing factor. Mishnah's is the one which is dominating that particular production department and therefore we have taken Mishnah's. Suppose if labor's is dominating that particular department, we would have taken labor's instead of Mishnah's. Okay, and the entire process remains the same. Total budgeted fixed storage divided by total budgeted labor's and then it goes on. Right? Now, let's look into some additional data. Cost driver, I hope you already have an idea. Okay, the one that drives the cost or a factor that causes the activity to be performed. For example, for setup cost, number of setups is the cost driver. Okay, for requisition cost, number of requisitions, number of material requisitions is the cost driver. For inspection cost, number of inspections is the cost driver. So I hope you guys are aware of it, right? Now let's, we take two examples over here, number of deliveries and number of setups. And I gave you the numbers of number of deliveries for product A and B. That's what we are seeing right now. Okay, product A and B. Anyways, <clears throat> So let's solve the same problem as per activity-based costing. Now, you know the concept of activity-based costing. Why? Because we have covered that as part and parcel of decision making. I'm repeating this again and again because you need to understand that you need to watch that particular revision lecture first. And after that, you should be coming over here. You should not be watching this directly. So if you are watching it right now, just stop the video over here. Go back to the revision lectures that you have done, which is decision making and transfer pricing, and then come back to this one and then listen. Okay. Right. Anyways. So how to solve this as per activity based costing? Very simple. The first column will be different types of activity. In this case, it is setup, depreciation and delivery. Here, setup, depreciation and delivery. Three activities. This is what we have taken over here. Right? Okay, next. Cost pool is nothing but amount. Cost pool is nothing but amount. Copy paste from the example. If there is a question in question, this information will be available. You just need to copy paste. Next, cost driver name. For setup, the cost driver will be number of setups. You can easily, you just need to match that. So it's very simple. But depreciation, obviously, Mishnah's. Assuming that, uh, you know, the depreciation is happening because of usage of machine. Delivery, number of deliveries. Very simple. So now you need to take cost driver quantity. Now, please be careful here that when you are taking cost driver quantity, you should take the total. Sir, what do you mean by total, sir? For example, if you look at setup, only two products information is given. Number of setups is how much? 900, 100. So total should be taken. Total means how much? 1000. 1000 should be taken over here. Keep this in mind. Always, when we are trying to take cost driver quantity, you should always take the total. Okay, you should always take the total. Now, depreciation, same logic. Mishnas is the cost driver quantity. You should take total Mishnas. Means, uh, you know, 20,000 and 80,000. So which means total will be how much? 1 lakh. Take that over here. Delivery, number of deliveries, 9,200 and 800, 10,000 total, right? Now divide cost pool with cost driver quantity, you'll get your cost driver rate. Okay, 100 rupees per setup, 2 rupees per missionar and 10 rupees per delivery. You got it? So this is what we have done. Okay. So this is setup cost, which is 1 lakh divided by number of setups. Depreciation cost divided by missionars and delivery divided by number of deliveries. Now, once we are done with this uh, cost driver rate calculation, which is nothing but multiple cost driver rate or multiple absorption rates. I hope you guys know this concept already. We have seen this in decision making chapter. As per traditional system, you will have only one Mishnah rate or one cost driver rate. Only one. Only one. Which can be the predominant influencing factor. But as per uh, activity based costing, you will have multiple cost driver rates or multiple absorption rates. We have calculated that over here 100 per setup, 2 per Mishnah, and 10 per delivery. Now let's calculate total cost as per ABC. <clears throat> First one. Setup cost. What is the number of setups for product A? The number of setups for product A, here it is, 900. Per setup, what is the cost? 100. So, 900 into 100. Got the point? That will be your answer over here. Same here, 100 into 100. Right? Very simple. Next, depreciation, same logic. Okay? So, Mishnah's is how much here? 20,000, 80,000. So, 20,000 into per Mishnah rate, 2 rupees. 20,000 into 2. That's 80,000 into 2. Pretty simple. Same logic applies for delivery as well. 9,200 into 10 per delivery. 800 into 10 per delivery. So 9,200 into 10, 800 into 10. So once you are done with all this, you will be getting your total overhead cost. Once you have got total overhead cost divided with number of units, you will be getting overhead cost per unit. 
then you add it to the direct cost, you'll be getting total cost per unit. Pretty simple, done. So finally, the summary is, when it comes to traditional system, your ORETs will be allocated to the departments, which I think you would have done in your CA inter or CMA inter, whatever it is, where we have primary distribution and secondary distribution and directly from there, it will go to product. So try to understand how it happens from overheads to departments, from there to products. Whereas as for activity-based costing from overheads, it will directly go to activities and from activities, it will go to product. So this is the difference. Keep this in mind. Okay. This is the difference between traditional system and activity-based costing system. Right. Now let's move on to the next one. The next concept is direct product profitability. So what is this direct product profitability? Let's try to understand. See, uh, if there is any firm with a portfolio of profitable products, when I say portfolio, it means that you'll have uh, like 10 products or 20 products or 30 different products. Okay. They enjoy very high profitability. Okay. In that kind of situation, it is very important to know profitability of each and every product. We can say profitability of individual product. So that as a management who is doing business, you can concentrate on the most profitable products and you can eliminate the least profitable products. So this is a common sense way of doing business, right? DPP is generally used in retail business to determine profitability of individual product. Because in retail business, calculating profitability is not as easy or as simple as you think. You guys might be thinking, sir, when it comes to retail business, what is this, sir? Let's say you take a biscuit packet, okay, for example. Uh, let's say it's a, you know, Mary biscuit. You buy it at 10 rupees from your vendor and you sell it at 12 rupees to the retail customer. You get a profit of 2 rupees. It's that simple, isn't it, sir? No, sir, that's absolutely wrong, sir. You'll try to understand. So therefore, when you have a portfolio of frauds, especially retail sector, you just imagine how much of portfolio of profitable products they have got hundreds and thousands, isn't it? So in that kind of situation, trying to manage trying to keep those products which are profitable and trying to eliminate those products which are not profitable is not that easy. It's very difficult, very complicated as well. So therefore, we use something called direct product profitability in retail business to understand the profitability of individual product. Okay, right. So let's go further so that you'll be able to understand this with much more clarity. Traditionally, what happens? Retail stores will reduce purchase prices of goods from selling price to get a gross margin. That's what I've told you right now. So you will reduce the purchase price from the selling price. Selling price of Mary biscuit is 12. Purchase price is 10. You'll get your gross margin, which is 2. This is what traditionally we used to do. That's what I've put over here. This can lead to wrong decision with respect to what profitability. How, sir? I'll give you an example. Let's take tissue paper. Tissue paper, when you try to calculate gross margin, which is nothing but the price with which you have purchased from the vendor and the price at which you have sold to the retailer. Your gross margin is 15%. Looks all good. Ice cream also. The price with which you have purchased, say for example, is 80 or something like that. Whatever. I mean the cost. And you have sold it at 100, for example. Whatever it is. Okay, just imagine. The difference between your purchase price and the selling price is nothing but gross margin. So, for tissue paper and ice cream, the gross margin looks solid. It's very good, right? 15% and 20%. But if you look into direct product profitability, it's 0 and 4%. Sir, why, sir? Why? Because tissue paper takes a lot of space a lot of space and your rental proportionate rental rental apportionment rent cost apportionment is very high ice cream is a refrigerated product so there is in addition to your cost of buying the ice cream from the vendor you are incurring a lot of refrigeration expenses right the 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 power bill or whatever it is so therefore as per dpp while calculating individual product profitability dpp uses variety of measures like space used for storage, space used for transportation, okay, which can be non-refrigerated transportation, refrigerated transportation, and all these things will influence your product cost or able to understand. Therefore, you'll be able to ultimately find out which product gives you exactly good amount of profit and which product gives you really not so good profit. For example, here, you were actually on a wrong opinion that tissue paper and ice cream is giving you good amount of profit. When you have calculated your gross margin, but in reality, it's giving you nothing. So this is where DPP makes a whole world of difference. That is direct product profitability. Got the point? So here you can see certain expenses which are not impacted or influenced by the products or not allocated to individual products. This is also very important. For example, head office expenses. 
are you able to understand these are all head office expenses are not influenced by tissue paper as a product head office expenses are not influenced by ice cream as a product therefore don't allocate those head office expenses to these individual products to calculate direct product profitability is what we are trying to say so certain expenses which are not impacted or influenced by products that are not i mean which are not influenced by products or not allocated to individual products anyways now so which means you guys need to remember that head office expenses should not be allocated to individual products to calculate dpp there it's a matter that's it now let's move on to the next one so dpp basically what it does is that it analyzes the indirect cost into four major categories what are they one is the overhead cost where you will try to allocate them based on activity based costing which we already know to the products apart from overhead costs you will have volume related cost okay so which means uh, more the volume that you occupy more will be the cost that is storage and transportation cost apart from that you will be having product batch cost okay which means uh, when a batch of the product is kept on shelf or a warehouse you are storing it just try to imagine a go down you are storing it okay so then you link a cost more the time that you store more will be the cost right and inventory financing cost as well how much money is getting blocked okay whatever the cost of the product with which you are purchased uh you know into the interest rate or you will understand for example 1 lakh worth of inventory is there in your godown so which means 1 lakh worth of your money is blocked or you will understand otherwise you would say for example you would have invested that 1 lakh in a bank you would have earned an interest of 10% which means into 10% which means 10000 you are losing right now that will be your inventory financing cost or you will understand the simplest way of understanding or the other way of understanding is this 1 lakh which has got blocked you have got it as a loan Say for example, working capital loan, and you are paying some fifteen percent interest on that. Then that will be your inventory financing cost. Either way, whichever angle you want to understand this logic, you can understand. Okay, so these are all the cost according to DPP. Okay, so the entire indirect cost related to your uh, related to your products has been divided into four: overhead cost, volume related cost, product batch cost, and inventory financing cost. So keep this in mind. You got it. now overhead cost means directly you will allocate that to the products based on activity based costing volume related cost i told you more the volume they occupy more will be the cost like storage and transportation cost product batch cost means i told you it is generally based on time you will understand once we start solving some examples inventory financing cost just now i have explained so it's clear next what are the benefits of this so called tpp let's try to understand that now when it comes to this particular benefits of dpp i hope you guys can just read it and you can understand pretty simple okay it will help you to analyze the cost better it will help you to take better pricing decisions okay it will help you to rationalize your product range um, you know rationalize means you taking decision with respect to product range in such a way that it will benefit you in the maximum way benefit you in the sense i am the one who is doing business which means it will benefit you the guy who is doing business in the best way possible right and better management of store as well as warehouse you'll be able to manage the space and all the other things better because of dpp you know which product to be put in which place and all that right so it's a general points okay you can just look into that once now let's move on to the next example to understand dpp now uh, where are we right now we are trying to understand the concept of direct product profitability are you able to get me right chal let's move on now listen carefully with respect to this particular example we'll be able to understand the concept fat fat we'll finish it off Now, <clears throat> a firm is selling three products A, B, C through retail stores. Other data is as under. You have got A, B, C quantity per cubic meter is given, which means number of units in one cubic meter of space. Okay, right. So twelve thousand six hundred, four thousand thirty-two, and two thousand eight eighty. Time in the retail store A is there in for one month, B for two months, C for one month. product a and c requires refrigeration facility also keep that in mind which one products a as well as c not b okay monthly fixed expense is given total is 189000 in that 109000 is for refrigerated okay this point also keep it in mind head office expenses is 1 lakh i already told you head office expense what you have to do with it we have already seen the concept you guys remember that here i have already discussed it right now let's move on to the next one total space of retail store is 40000 cubic meters out of this 25000 cubic meters is for refrigerated goods which means probably for a as well as c or in the question it can be given like this also it can be given as total volume of all goods sold per month is 40000 cubic meters which is 25000 cubic meters for refrigerated goods like this also he can give you information in the question 
so which means he can say total space is so much in that refrigerated goods space is so much or he can say total volume of goods sold per month is 40000 cubic meters in that refrigerated goods volume is like this either data can be given like this in the question or data can be given like this okay just keep that in mind anyways so now how to calculate dpp let's try to understand from with the help of this simple example first what we'll do we'll take total cost per month which is given in the question 189000 but 19000 is for refrigerated goods 80000 is for general general cost general cost means this 80000 will be incurred for all the three please try to understand this is where i have seen many students getting confused that is why i have taken this example so listen carefully 19000 is refrigeration cost which means it will be incurred only for a and c because only a and c requires refrigeration facility Whereas the other expenditure, if you remove this 1,9,000 from 1,89,000, the remaining 80,000 which you have got is general expense. Means what? It is incurred for A, B and C. Keep that in mind. That is incurred for A, B and C. And 1,9,000 is incurred only for A and C. Keep that in mind. Right? Clear? So, what I am going to do right now is that I am going to calculate refrigeration cost per cubic meter per month. General cost per cubic meter per month. So, total cubic meters is already given. For refrigerated goods, it is how much? 25,000. Total is 40,000. This 80,000 general expense is, is incurred for the entire space, total space of 40,000 cubic meters. Therefore, the total general cost per cubic meter is 2 rupees, which will be incurred for all the three products. Whereas, when it comes to refrigeration cost, 1,9,000 is incurred only for 25,000 cubic meters of refrigerated good space, right? So, therefore, divide both of them, you will be getting 4 rupees 36 paise per cubic meter per month. So, this 4 rupees 36 paise should be given only for A and C. This 2 rupees should be given for A, B and C. So, which means from this A cost will be how much? 4.36 plus 2, correct? what of course presuming that they are there for one month if it is 1.5 month again it will change two months again it will change now so a cost will be suppose if a stays for one single month 4.36 plus 2 b cost will be only 2 b cost will be only 2 why because there is no refrigeration for b c cost will be again 4.36 plus 2 presuming that c also stays for one month Again, if it is 1.5 month, if it 2 months, again it will change. Now, let's have a look into that. Now, see it. Calculation of product cost per unit to calculate DPP. Cost per cubic meters per month. 4.36 plus 2 for A. For B, it is 2. For C, it is 4.36 plus 2. As I told you. Quantity per cubic meter. That is given in the question. In 1 cubic meter, 12,600 units, 4,032 units, 2,880 units. Put that over here. Cost per cubic meter, so much. In one cubic meter, these many units. Which means per unit per cubic meter is how much? Which means uh, per cubic meter, this is the cost. And in one cubic meter, this many units are there. Which means per unit, it is how much? Divide these two. Okay. So, cost per unit per month will be 6.36 divided by 12,600. 2 divided by 4,032. 6.36 divided by 2,880. You will get this much as answer. 0 0.0005, 0 0.0005, 0 0.002. And uh, as I told you, now let's take how many months are they staying. Now A stays for one month, B stays for two months and C stays for one month. That is given in the question. So multiply with that, you'll be getting total cost per unit or total cost per quantity. So that's it. Once you got total cost per quantity, already you'll be having that gross margin. Reduce it from this, you know, from gross margin, you just reduce this particular cost, you'll be able to get your DPP. Very simple. And you have to note here that head office expenses are not allocated to products because products are not influencing them, which we have already seen over here. Certain expenses which are not influenced by the products are not allocated to individual products. For example, head office expenses. Therefore, here head office expenses are not allocated to products. Is that clear? So it's very simple. I hope this is clear, right? So, refrigeration expenses will be incurred for A and C. General expenses will be incurred for all the three. So therefore, if you can see 2 is common in all the three areas, 4.36 is there only for A and C. Pretty simple logic, right? And you just divide them with number of units per cubic meter, you will get cost per unit. And then you divide it with time. One month means you can just leave it like that. 
if all the three plots are staying for one month but that's not the case over here a stays for one month b stays for two months and c stays for one month therefore you just multiply you'll get your cost per unit right Chalo. let's move on to the next one what is the next one you have got customer profitability analysis next concept so coming on to this customer profitability analysis okay um so let's have a look into that how the concept looks like let's take an example to understand the concept okay so that it will be easy for you to appreciate let's say there are three customers x y as well as z selling price you are selling the same product to all the three customers and the selling price is also same now obviously because you are selling the same product to all these customers variable cost will also be same so you feel that the gross profit that you get from these customers are exactly the same so according to you customer x or customer y or customer z are one and the same why because all the three they'll give you the same profit per unit isn't it so you might feel that all these three customers are one and the same for you and you might give them equal amount of importance but in reality that's not the same why sir let's try to understand customer x orders 1000 units from you customer y orders 2000 units from you and z orders 500 units from you sir what is there because of change in number of units ultimately 1000 into 30 2000 into 30 and 500 into 30 okay we can say from units perspective customer y is important then customer x is important then z is important no not like that it's not that simple so let's try to understand that to understand that you need to know certain other specifications as well you need to know what is the order quantity every time customer x orders how many units he orders per order right customer y what is the order quantity 50 units per order 100 units per order 200 units per order same what is the order quantity of z so that you'll you'll be knowing number of orders once you know number of orders then you'll calculate ordering cost are you able to understand and that also you need to reduce from this gross margin which you are having over here then how many returns are being made customer x has written how many units y has written how many units z has written how many units this will also influence your ultimate profits right transportation cost all of them are they incurring transportation cost or are on their own or as a company we are incurring for them are we delivering the goods to the uh, you know customers uh, you know destination or the place or whatever it is or customer comes to our place and then takes the goods and go away you know and gets away whatever it is so transportation cost own we own means what x incurs on his own but for y we are incurring the transportation cost for z he incurs on his own and you are giving some special discount as you can see 10 percent you are giving for customer x for customer y you are giving nothing for z you are giving five percent are able to understand so which means till here equation looked very simple all of them are buying the same product same selling price same variable cost so same profit per unit but after that once we have got these additional information additional data things have got completely changed that is why customer profitability analysis is important that is why to know similar to dpp here we are trying to understand which customer gives you maximum profit which customer gives you least profit so that you'll be able to manage your entire customer profile in a better way right you got the point now let's move on. Of course, you can apply Pareto analysis also here. So like this, you can just connect, interconnect your concepts. Pareto analysis also you can apply. In fact, in Pareto analysis concept, one of the applications of Pareto analysis is customer profitability only, correct? Anyways, now let's go with an example. Let's say there is a hotel. Okay, you've got two types of customers in that particular hotel. One is a family, the other one is a business guest. Okay family what will happen generally uh, you'll have more of swimming pool facility right they will use more of swimming swimming pool and they will use bar facility relatively less so families will be spending most of their time in the swimming pool and less time in the bar whereas when it comes to business guests more time they'll be spending in bar and less time they'll be spending under what uh, in the swimming pool so obviously in this kind of situations it's very important for you to calculate customer profitability analysis i hope you are able to get the logic get the picture right now so by applying customer profitability analysis in the above situations, we can find which customer is more profitable and which customer is less profitable. Then strategies may be adopted to encourage more profitable customers. Are you able to understand? Very, very, very important. Got this? Now, there is something called fundamentals of customer relationship management. Are you able to understand? 
So from administration point of view, there are three operating CRM, analytical CRM and collaborative CRM. Okay. So what is this? We'll see later right now for this particular discussion, it is not relevant. So let's keep that. You can just try to look at it once on your own, right? So right now let's continue with customer profitability analysis. So industries using CPA, hospitals, banks, insurance companies, professional firms, logistics companies, hotels, tour operators, all these guys. Okay. What are the benefits of CPA? It identifies which customer is contributing actually to the profitability and which customer is eating away your profits. Okay. Then company shall have a constructive dialogue. Okay. Which means you can negotiate with the customer to improve the margin. And this so-called DP, DPP, which we have seen so far, direct product profitability and customer profitability analysis can also help the companies in profit parity analysis. That's what I've already told you. Parity analysis can be applied here as well. Anyways, this is what is important right now, sir. What do you mean by this, sir? What do you mean by company having a constructive dialogue with the customer to improve margin? For example, let's come to this information over here. Let's say the order quantity of X is very less. Let's say 10 units per order which means for 1000 units, he'll go with 100 orders, which means ordering cost will be very heavy. And that's eating away the profits that you get from customer X. Then you can have a constructive dialogue with customer X and you can ask him to, sir, please improve your order quantity, right? Which means let's say 30 units per order. As a result, your ordering cost gets reduced. That's what we call it as constructive dialogue. So you can negotiate with the customer, with those customers who are giving you relatively less net profits, not the gross profit, but the net profit, and then accordingly, you can improve your profitability levels, right? So that's one of the major application of customer profitability analysis, which is really good, isn't it? Right? So identify which customers are actually contributing to profitability and which customers are actually eroding your profitability. And then you can have a negotiation with them and you can improve your margin as simple as that. Now here I've given you some applications. So this will be very useful for you to solve some problems. So. I have divided them into three columns. What is a problem that you can have from a customer? What is the reason for that particular problem from the customer? And what will be the solution that you have to write, you know, in that particular problem, which you're trying to solve. Anyways, suppose you're giving high discount to a particular customer. Why are you giving high discount? You want to promote your sales, initial sales. What is the solution for this particular problem? Because you're giving high discount, if your profitability is getting eroded, you can negotiate with the customer for lower discount taking care of not losing him at the same time. See, just because you are trying to improve your profitability doesn't mean that you have to lose your existing profitability as well. See, for example, let's say customer A gives you already a profit of 1000 rupees. In order to improve this from 1000 to 1200, you should not lose 1000 itself, isn't it? It makes sense. So when I try to negotiate or when I try to have a constructive dialogue with my customer, I should always try to improve my existing profitability, not at the cost of profitability itself. So that is why I negotiate with the customer for lower discount, taking care of not losing him at the same time. I hope you guys are able to understand this. Next, coming on to the next problem, high ordering and delivering cost. Are you able to understand? Which means most probably why you will have high ordering cost? Because the customer is ordering more number of times. So ordering cost will vary per order. So more number of orders, more the ordering cost. Probably the reason is customer is using JIT. I hope you know the logic. If he's using JIT, he will order whenever he needs. So therefore he will order more number of times, which means more will be the ordering cost and delivery cost. So in this kind of situation, what can be the solution? Increase your selling price. That's why generally under JIT, your selling price will be more when compared to your traditional ordering, correct? You would have seen this in JIT chapter as well. Fixed cost per delivery you can put. You order how many number of times you want, you order, but for each order, this much will be the cost or you can, you, you need not charge anything per delivery, but have a threshold limit for number of orders. For example, 10 orders will be free. This is the threshold limit, threshold limit beyond that. I'll charge you beyond that per order. I'll charge you hundred per order. I'll charge you thousand per order. I'll charge you 15,000, whatever it is, whatever the number it can be. So these three can be the probable solution for this particular problem. What is that problem? High ordering cost and delivery cost. Next, high site visit cost. So people from your company are visiting the customer site very frequently. As a result, you are incurring high site visit cost. So the probable reason for this can be the customer requires customized products. Therefore, he is asking you to visit his site. What you can do to solve this particular problem so that you can improve the profitability. 
you can uh, charge fixed amount per visit from the customer or improve your business process in such a way that customer himself will stop asking you to visit his premises. Are you able to understand? That can also be the solution. Next. High rush orders can be another problem. Customer requires immediate delivery. Rush order means immediate delivery, right? So what you can do simply charge per rush order or even for this also you can keep some threshold limit. One or two rush orders will be free. Beyond that will charge you. Something like that. That can help you to improvise your profitability. High sales returns can be a problem. Probably it's because of communication gap between seller and the buyer. Seller asks something, buyer understands something and then sends something and then eventually uh, the buyer says that, sorry, uh, here seller and buyer in the sense, buyer is the customer, right? So he tells you something, we understand something and we send something and then he says that this is not the one that we have wanted and he will return it back and that will incur a lot of cost for us, right? So you take corrective action by finding out the reason, where the communication gap is happening, why it is happening, what is that customer is trying to communicate, what is that we have misunderstood or did the customer communicate in the right way, did he communicate something wrong and therefore then the problem will be on the customer side. So like that you just need to analyze what is the reason and take the corrective action, pretty simple. Another important point that you have to note here is high rush orders and high site visits, they require more employees. So therefore, company may decide to discontinue such service and reassign these employees to other value added activities as well. So this is universal point. This also you can do. So any kind of situation where you have to use more number of employees, you can try to reduce those services by with the help of that, you not only reduce your cost and you can use those employees in some other area where there is value addition. Value addition means up from that you'll be getting some sort of profit, you know, anyways. So this is one point that you have to keep in your mind. Okay. When you have high rush orders and high site visits that requires more employees, right? And what the company can do is that it may decide to discontinue such service. And once it discontinues, all these employees will be what free, right? And you can use these employees in some other areas or you will understand where the real value addition happens. So I've written it as UP. UP means uh, this is a universal point. Reassigning these employees to other value added activities. You can use this in so many other areas as well when you're trying to especially answer a case study or able to understand. For example, uh, business process re-engineering. There also you can use this particular point because of BPR. You can discontinue the services of a lot of employees, but you can use them. You can reassign them to some other area. So if you feel that there is a problem of employee retrenchment, employee retrenchment compensation, if you feel that there will be a lot of, uh, you know, say for example, strikes from employees when you ask them to get out, you know, of employment, in these kind of situation, this can be a solution, right? So like that, there are so many areas where you try to reduce the number of employees. In that kind of situation, you can write this particular point as a part and parcel of your answer when you're answering a case study or a case scenario. That's why I've written this as a universal point. Universal point means you can use this in many areas. So like this, I, I do in each and every chapter and in so many topics so that these are all the kind of tricks that you have to learn so that it will be easy for you to answer what case studies and case scenarios. I hope this is clear. Right? Yeah. Right, fellas, uh, we'll wind up the session over here. Okay. In the next session, we'll finish off the rest of this particular chapter. That is activity based cost management and so on. Okay. So let's wind up the session over here. In the next session, we'll finish off the remind. Thank you. Right friends, uh, so welcome to PKSR classes. Let's continue with where we have left in the last session. I think uh, we have done our revision till here, right? So let's continue with that. Now in this session, uh, we'll finish off uh, the concepts of the rest of the chapter of SAOI, Strategic Analysis of Operating Income. So now we're gonna go for ABM. So ABM means Activity Based Cost Management, okay? So what do you mean by this activity based cost management? See, uh, you already know the concept of activity based costing because we are done with decision making revision. So the activity based costing concept was so successful. It was so successful that after that it got varied applications and from that they have developed so many more concepts. Uh, so one of such concept is ABM. So ABM means it is activity. I mean, activity based cost management means you're going to use the concept of activity based costing, develop it a bit further and with the help of it, you're going to manage the cost. So what do you mean by manage the cost? Trying to reduce the overhead cost or you're able to understand, trying to limit the overhead cost, trying to have more control over the overhead cost with the help of 
activities. See, the logic is very simple. Say, for example, you have something called uh, you know, setup activity, you know, and uh, you have a cost called setup cost. Now, if you have to manage a uh, setup cost, what do you have to do? Simply, you need to manage the setup activity, right? Uh, the number of setups. If the number of setups can be reduced, automatically the setup cost can be reduced, isn't it? So, trying to reduce your setup cost by reducing the number of setups by managing those activities is nothing but activity based cost management to put it very simple in a very layman terms this is the actual meaning of this particular concept are you able to understand this is just a what can i say a rough idea you know of what this concept is all about now let's dig further and then we'll try to understand this particular concept now see here activity based cost management means cost management at activity level which means you're going to manage the activities their cost drivers and through that you're going to manage your cost so ABC supplies the information. That's what I've told you. This is an improvement of activity-based costing. So all the info that you need to do activity-based cost management comes from activity-based costing. So ABC supplies the info and ABM uses the information for various ways of cost control and cost reduction. Got it? Right. Pretty simple. Now, activity-based cost management focuses on cost management at activity level in two ways. What are they? One is strategic activity-based cost management. The other one is operational activity based cost management now what do you mean by strategic abm strategic abm means uh focuses on the effectiveness means doing the right things that's nothing but strategic abm operational abm means it focuses on efficiency which means doing things right whatever you do doing it right is all about efficiency doing right things is all about effectiveness means what sir for example which product to be produced okay you need to produce the right product which activities to be used for producing the product that comes under effectiveness which comes under strategic abm now what do you mean by efficiency then which comes under operational abm better resource utilization to reduce cost and improve profit every resource that you utilize whether it is raw material or it is mishnas or it is labor hours or employee management whatever it is you have to use it in the best way possible that comes under efficiency that is doing things right that comes under operational abm so you got to remember this the activity based cost management that is abm focuses on cost management at activity level in two ways one is strategic the other one is operational under strategic you have this under operational you have this we have seen strategic means effectiveness operational means efficiency that is doing right things over here and doing the things right over here pretty simple so we're done with this let's move on now let's try to understand the concept activity based cost management first of all we'll start with the definition Activity based cost management is a discipline that focuses on the efficient and effective management of activities as a route to continuously improve the value received by customers. This is the keyword. Now, the question is how do we improve the value received by the customers? Very simple by reducing the cost, by adding features without reducing the cost, which means you will add features at the same cost, thereby you improve the value to the customer or you will keep the same features, but you will reduce the cost. That way also you can improve the value to the customers. Pretty simple, right? So this is the definition and a definition in the exam. You have to write as it is. You cannot change that. So what is ABM? It is a discipline that focuses on the efficient and effective management of activities. That activities information is supplied by a ABC. That is what we have seen here. ABC supplies the information and ABM uses the information. So this activities information comes from ABC and then ABM focuses on such you know information that is activities in an efficient and an effective way that we have seen already over here effective way in the sense it is nothing but strategic abm efficient means it is nothing but operational abm that we have seen okay as a root what is the purpose of uh, this efficient and effective management of activities ultimately what are you going to achieve by managing these activities in efficiently and effective way very simple you're going to improve the value that you're going to provide to the customers that is what we have written in the definition over here as a root to continuously improve the value received by the customers pretty simple now how do we implement this abm pretty simple there are three steps step one step two and step three first step cost driver analysis second step activity analysis third step performance analysis now let's try to understand each and every step through this we're going to design and implement abm now step one cost driver analysis what are we going to do in this particular step a cost driver is any factor that causes a change in the cost of an activity we are already aware of the cost driver so many times we have seen okay 
for setup activity, number of setups, for material requisition activity, number of requisitions, for machining activity, machine asked, okay, for inspection activity, number of inspections is the cost of it. So we have, we have seen all those things. Let's take an example over here. Invoice processing activity for that number of invoice process will be a cost driver. Setup activity number of setups will be a cost driver. Done. So that's your first step. Cost driver analysis. Very simple. Just find out the cost driver and then keep that information with you. Right. Coming on to second step. What is that? Activity analysis. Your goal is to reduce the cost and enhance the value. That is there in the definition as well. Okay. You want to improve the value re received by the customers. How do you do that? By reducing the cost or increasing the features. Now, how are we going to reduce the cost and enhance the value that we're going to provide to the customers? Very simple. All the activities here, we are doing activity analysis only now, right? All the activities will be divided into two value added, non value added and non value added activities will be eliminated. Very simple, as simple as that, right? Now coming on to third step. I hope you know what is value added and non value added, right? Just remember uh, any activity for which customer is willing to pay or any activity that adds functionality to the final product is a value added. Anything other than that is non value added activity. Very simple. Right. Moving on to third step performance analysis. Out of hundreds of activities inside an organization, you'll have so many activities, right? Setup activity, inspection activity, material request activity, machining activity, or you're able to understand so many activities will be there, right? Out of that, some significant activities must be identified for performance analysis. Are you able to understand? You identify it depends upon the company. We cannot really say what is significant it depends upon the way uh, a business is being done by a particular company it is customized okay which is significant activity for that particular company is totally uh, you know depends upon the business circumstances of that particular company whatever the business that company is doing and whatever the kind of you know business environment that the company is is in okay anyway but what you have to do as part and parcel of third step that is performance analysis is you got to compare your actual activity rates versus benchmark rates. What do you mean by actual activity rates? For example, you got cost per setup. This is an actual activity rate for you. Let's say it is thousand. You compare that with the benchmark in the industry, which means what your peers are doing, what your competitors are doing. Uh, their cost per setup who are manufacturing similar product like you is say, for example, 1500. In that case, you are a lot better. So in that case, you will make these activities, which means you will do it in house. Suppose if your activity rate is very bad when compared to the benchmark rate, then you'll, you'll better buy it from outside because it comes cheaper rather than you yourself doing it. So this is advanced way of cost management. That is why it is called as ABM. Okay. Anyways, let's try to take an example to understand how ABM helps us to manage the cost. So how ABM helps to manage cost for that. We'll take an example. That is, we're going to take invoice order processing activity. Okay. So cost driver will be what number of invoice processed very simple. So if you further analyze this activity, it has revealed that the slow processing of order is going on, which means the invoice are being processed very slow. Okay. So for that, we need to find solution as per ABM, which means we need to increase the pace of invoice processing activity or able to understand. So what is the solution they have found? They have found that we can give a training program to the employees to improve the speed of processing the invoice thereby this slow, so slow processing of the invoice order will be solved that problem will be solved also you can introduce some computer systems in case if they are working manually to speed up the process either way either way what will happen your so called problem of slow processing of the invoices will be solved and fast processing of invoice will happen eventually right but because of these two solutions what will happen? Your employees necessity will get reduced, especially in the second solution. When you try to introduce the computer systems to speed up the process, definitely whatever the number of employees that you have got right now, uh, will not be required anymore. Right? Let's say for example, if you've got some 20 employees right now who is processing the invoice, right? After introducing the computer systems to speed up the process, maybe you need only five. Then what will you do with the remaining 15? Either you have to ask them to get out, right? Or you can reassign these excess employees to other value added activities. I told you this sentence will be repeated so many times. It is getting repeated again. See here also we have done the same thing. Can you see that over here? 
company may decide to discontinue such service and reassign these employees to other value added activities. Same sentence we are seeing it here again. That's why this particular sentence is very important. In so many situations, you will try to reduce your number of employees to reduce the cost. In that case, either you can ask them to go out, we call it as uh, you can uh, pay them retrenchment compensation and you ask them to go out or what you can do is that you can reassign these employees to other value added activities. Either way. Right? Done. Okay, chalo. Moving on to another example. Now see here. Let's say your total production is 10,000 units and your units per production run is 1,000. Okay which means one time if you start the machine, it will start working and then it will manufacture 1000 units and then it will stop. That is one production run. So it will manufacture 1000 units per run. Total production is 10,000, which means how many runs you need? 10 runs. Okay. 10 runs means machine will start, run for 1000 units and then it will stop. Now I have to again make the machine ready for another production run. Making the machine ready for another production run is nothing but setup. So if you have 10 runs, then 10 times you need to make the machine ready for another production run, which means you will have a number of setups. How many setups? 10 setups only. So how many production runs will be there? That many setups will be there, right? And cost per setup is 5,000. So current total setup cost will be how much? 10 setups into 5,000 per setup. Total cost will be 50,000. Which one? Setup cost right now. So if you apply activity-based cost management here to manage the above cost, what you will do? increase the number of units per production run this is nothing but we call it as long production run long production run means earlier in each production run you were manufacturing thousand units now in the same uh, production run you are manufacturing two thousand units therefore what will happen the time taken to manufacture two thousand units instead of thousand units will be more therefore it will take a lot of time long time that's why it is referred as long production run okay you will see this word in LSA chapter as well, Lean System and Innovation. So now what has happened? You have increased the number of units per production run. Therefore, the revised production runs will get reduced. Earlier it was 10,000 units is the production and 1,000 units is the units per production run. Therefore, you need 10 production runs. But now it's only 5, right? Why? Because you have increased the number of units per production run, which is 2,000 right now. Earlier it used to be 1,000. So therefore 2000 means total production remains the same which is 10,000 right but now how many production runs you will run 5 which means number of setups also will be 5 cost per setup will be 5000 which means now the total setup cost has got reduced to 25,000 from 50,000 this is how ABM will help you to manage the cost here we are managing activities only now I saw what setup activity we have reduced the cost driver eventually right from 10, we have reduced the cost driver to 5. Therefore, the cost also has got reduced. Like this, managing this cost drivers of the activities, thereby reducing the cost or managing the cost. That is cost control or cost reduction is nothing but activity-based cost management. That is what we have seen in the definition as well. Okay. So, this is another example. I hope you can understand better. Right. Let's move on to the next one. Now, we're going to look into the concept of value-added and non-value-added activities. Now moving on to the next concept now, value added as well as non-value added activities. Okay. So what do you mean by value added activities? These are the activities that add value to the customer or which is indispensable to complete the process or any activity which provides essential support to the value added activity. So an activity which adds value to the customer is value added activity. An activity which supports an activity which adds a value to the customer is also a value added activity. That is the importance of this particular sentence. Okay. Any activity which provides essential support to the value added activity is also value added activity. Got the point, right? And here there is another sentence which is indispensable to complete the process. So which means without that particular activity, you cannot complete the process of either manufacturing a particular product or providing a service. Then that will also be referred as value added activity. So to remember this in a very simple way, you guys just remember one thing. Uh, any activity for which customer is willing to pay that is very important you see whether customer is willing to pay or not when something adds value to the customer then obviously customer will be willing to pay that is a logic so if customer is willing to pay then that is value added or in other words if that particular activity adds some sort of functionality to the final product for example if you are manufacturing car okay now in the car as per government regulation you need to have compulsory abs right now anti brake lock system okay now, even though customer feels that I don't want this ABS system or able to understand where you will have sensors on all the wheels, thereby the braking will be better. Uh, even though customer 
is not willing to pay for it but because of the government norm you have to put it as a manufacturer and that adds functionality to the final product which is a car because it betters the braking system right so therefore that is a value added activity that's the way it works so there are two rules one is whether customer is willing to pay or whether it adds functionality to that particular product or not right now coming on to non value added activity very simple work or activity that is not valued by the internal or the external customer when i say internal customer it means it does not add any functionality to the, to the final product external customer means obviously the customer is not willing to pay or it is not adding any value to the external customer for example unnecessary movement of goods is a nva non value added activity unnecessary movement of equipment unnecessary movement of people any type of waste all these are nvas okay Sir, what is the logic behind this particular concept? Why you have to classify something as VA as well as NBA, right? The idea behind the above concept is that not only the final product, okay, the car which you utilize or any other product for that matter, not only the final product or utility of the product, but the entire production process also should be customer focused. Normally, what we do is that the final product that we eventually manufacture, that should be useful to the customer. That will be the intention. But the concept of value added or non value added activities is that not only the final product should be useful to the customer, but also every single step through which we eventually manufacture that final product should also be useful to the customer. Because of this, eventually what happens is that all the inefficiency will be eliminated and thereby the product will be available to the customer in the best possible manner in this in the way in the best cost possible with the help of best features or you will understand all the inefficiency will be what eliminated that's the whole logic so this is possible only by segregating each activity as value added and non value added from the customer's point of view why customer's point of view because customer is the one who is going to buy your product so you see the customer's point of view which means whether customer will be willing to pay for this particular feature for this particular thing whatever the you know activity that you are putting to manufacture that particular product if customer is willing to pay then it automatically is valued of course there are few exceptions one exception i told you here as well that abs or you will understand like that see there will be certain exemptions where uh, it's a rule that has been kept by the you know government and for that even if customer is not willing to pay but still it is a value added activity for you because of government you know norms anyways let's move on to the next one one of the approaches to identify non value added activity is to classify the activities based on the way in which time is spent sir what do you mean by that sir mostly time is spent in the following ways let's have a look into that process time the time during which a product is undergoing conversion activity conversion means from raw material to finished goods the product is getting converted that whole conversion activity whatever the time that you take in order to convert your raw material into finished good we call it as process time and that's absolutely value added otherwise without this particular process uh, you know process time or conversion activity your finished goods will not be ready isn't it obviously so if you want your finished goods to be ready obviously this is a compulsory step so therefore it is value added for sure right waiting time the amount of time that raw material or wap spend waiting for the next operation that is a non value added activity storage time the time during which raw material wap and finished goods are held in the stock before further processing or shipment and that is also a non value added time inspection time the amount of time spent confirming that the product is of high quality or not you try to inspect each and every unit that got manufactured that is also non value added activity right because whether you do inspection or you do not do inspection the way you are manufacturing a particular product is not going to change inspection is only going to identify whether there are any defects in quality or not it is not going to eliminate the quality it is not going to avoid the quality issues isn't it so if you think logically inspection is just going to identify your quality issues it is not going to eliminate your quality issues it is not going to eliminate your defects are you able to understand therefore it's a non valid activity that is a logic basically right next move time the time spent by moving raw material wap finished goods between operations one machine to another machine one process to another process or you able to understand that is also non value added activity next manufacturing cycle time total time required to produce one unit that is value added plus non value added which is nothing but first one is value added which is process time plus 2 3 4 5 is non value added everything put together we call it as manufacturing cycle time generally we call it as mce 
okay that is manufacture cycle efficiency this is called as manufacture cycle time now see here so manufacturing cycle time is nothing but process time plus waiting time plus storage time plus inspection time plus move time in other words va plus nva va is process remaining all is nva right now from this we can calculate something called manufacturing cycle efficiency it is also called as process cycle efficiency which is value added time divided by total time which is nothing but value added plus non value added what is the value added time here process time divided by total time means process time plus waiting time storage time inspection time move time 1 divided by 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 there is a matter and what is the logic here company should always try to increase the manufacturing cycle efficiency which means obviously your proportion of value added time out of the total time should be more the more this proportion is the better it is for the companies which means your value added activity proportion is high right therefore always companies should try to increase their manufacturing cycle efficiency it's common sense right chalo example whether to move to jat or not because if you move to jat what will happen your storage time will get reduced because most of the times you will not have raw metal stock wap stock finished goods stock when it comes to jat there is no waiting time why because in jat you will start manufacturing your finished good only after getting the uh, you know order from the customer therefore your finished goods will not wait once it gets manufactured straight away it will be sent to the customer are you able to understand so therefore if you move to jat what will happen your value added time gets increased or in other words your non value added time gets reduced therefore your manufacturing cycle efficiency may improve if you move on to jat from traditional manufacturing are you able to connect the dots right if it increases mce then the company should go for jat implementation that's what i've told you knowing some important terms this will help you in solving problems okay velocity time number of units produced in a given time say for example 5 minutes is given within 5 minutes how many units are you manufacturing that talks about the velocity okay next delivery cycle time or customer response time it is the average time between the receipt of the customer order and delivery of goods that is nothing but delivery cycle time so you will get an order from the customer from there it starts and till the time you deliver the goods to the customer the the gap between that receiving the order and then delivering the goods we call it as what delivery cycle time or customer response time okay so here there is a simple diagram for you to understand all the concepts now see here we have written five things over here let's try to see one by one customer places order for the product this is the first one that will happen customer places order for the product order received by the manufacturer okay machine setup begins for the order which means you are manufacturing order is done finished goods is ready then order delivered to the customer so step wise 1 2 3 4 5 very easy to understand right now the difference between order received by the manufacturer and the manufacturing setup time is nothing but waiting time so which means the company has received the order but still the manufacturing did not start so that is waiting time the time difference between those two once the manufacturing setup starts till the finished goods is ready this is nothing but manufacturing time where the actual manufacturing is happening fine once you receive the order as a company from the customer till your finished good is ready this whole thing we call it as manufacturing cycle time right this is what we have seen here manufacturing cycle time va plus nva process time plus waiting time plus storage time plus inspection time plus move time this one manufacturing cycle time va plus nva okay try to connect the dots the time between the customer placing the order and company receiving the order is nothing but receipt time and the time between once the finished good is ready within the company till the time it is actually delivered to the customer we call it as delivery time and the time from the moment customer places the order and ultimately when the customer receives the order this is nothing but customer response time that is what i have written over here delivery cycle time or customer response time is nothing but average time between the receipt of customer order and delivery of goods so this is where the customer places the order and this is where the order is actually delivered to the customer so the difference between these two is nothing but customer response time or you can also call it as delivery cycle time so this diagram will give you complete picture 
of all the concepts with respect to this particular manufacturing cycle efficiency. Are you able to get me? Right. Next. What do you mean by receipt time? Here we have already seen the receipt time is nothing but customer placing the order for the product and order received, received by the manufacturer. The difference between these two. So time taken by the marketing department to specify to the manufacturing department the exact requirement in the customer order is nothing but recipient time, right? Or sorry, receipt time. So once the customer places the order, what the act, what actually the customer has asked you to manufacture will be communicated to the manufacturer by the marketing team. So that time gap is nothing but we call it as receipt time. Okay, so receipt time is done. What else? So I gave you some notes uh, for clarification on solving problems. Very important. What are they? Now see here. Sometimes same activity can be value added as well as non-value added. For example, storage is generally non-value added. But if you are storing for liquor, then it is value added. You know the reason, right? Inspection is non-value added. But if it is inspection for ISO certification, then it will be value added. Keep this in mind, okay? Don't get confused. Always storage is not value, non-value added. Okay. It depends upon the situation. So therefore, sometimes same activity can be VA as well as NVA. Normal storage is NVA, but storage of liquor is VA. Keep that in mind. Normal inspection is NVA, but inspection for ISO certification is a VA. Keep that in mind. Very important. In exams, if in a question he gave you waiting time, then there are two possibilities of what that waiting time means. Waiting time between order received by the manufacturing department and the actual production starts. Order received by the manufacturing department and the actual production starts. This is nothing but waiting time, which we already know. Or waiting time from placing the order by the customer to receipt of order by the manufacturing department. This can also be referred as waiting time. From placing the order by the customer to receipt of order by the manufacturing department. This can also be called as waiting time. So it depends upon the question. You have to be careful. Okay. And of course, this waiting time in that if it will be value added, if it is customized product, which you are providing to the customer according to the customer requirements, whereas the same waiting time from the moment the customer has placed the order till the manufacturing department receives the order will be a non value added time provided if what you are manufacturing is a standard product, which means you are manufacturing the same product for thousands of customers. But if you are manufacturing customized product for that particular customer, then even this waiting time will be value added time. Very important. Keep that in mind. And finally, benefits of activity based cost management. It provides causes of the business process cost. Why a particular cost you are incurring. It will explain you the reason. It will provide basis for effective decision making, obviously, by analyzing the activities, by managing the cost, by controlling the cost, by reducing the cost. It provides basis for cost reduction, obviously. It helps to implement ABB. ABB means activity based budgeting. So first you have activity based costing from that you have developed activity based cost management from that you have got one more utility that is activity based budgeting. I hope that's clear. <coughs> right buddies. Chalo. Now next one business applications of activity based management. This is important for questions and case scenarios. So what are the business applications of activity based cost management? It is useful in ABB, obviously activity based budgeting. It is useful in benchmarking as well. Okay. You will benchmark your activity rate with the other companies activity rates. It is helpful in cost production. We know that it is helpful in performance measurement as well. It is helpful in BPR as well. Business process re-engineering. Okay. Just keep this in mind. It will be helpful for you in case scenarios and some questions. Chalo, let's move on. Now we'll be moving on to something called activity based budgeting. Is that budgetary system at activity level activity based cost management means what did we say cost management at activity level. So ABB means what budgeting at activity level means what let's look into the definition. It is a process of financial planning and budgeting and is and it is a reverse of ABC process means first we will make the budget of products to be produced then decide activities required to be performed then decide resources required to perform the activities. If you have understood this, it's okay. Otherwise, I'll explain. Don't worry. It increases accuracy of financial forecast through three elements of activity based budgeting. What are they? Type of work to be done, quantity of work to be done, cost of work to be done. So understanding the above concept with the help of an example. Now see it. Normally what happens is that first always whenever when it comes to budgeting, 
every company in all situations you will always start with sales budget once sales budget is done you will add closing stock of finished goods you reduce opening stock of finished goods you get production budget once you get production budget you will see each unit of your finished good consumes how many kgs of raw metal single raw metal or multiple raw metal whatever it is you multiply with raw metal consumption per unit you get raw metal consumption budget once you get raw metal consumption budget you add closing stock of raw metal you reduce opening stock of raw metal you get raw metal purchase budget in quantity you multiply with purchase price per unit you get raw metal purchase cost budget you add direct labor budget to that you add overhead overhead cost budget to that you'll get total cost budget this is the way you prepare your budget normally but when it comes to abb you gonna do reverse what is that see here first make budget of products to be produced then decide uh, activities required to be performed and then decide resources required to perform the activities what is that see here you'll start with sales budget as usual but you will stop here that's why i've written here stop here right production budget once you know for example let's say there are 40000 units you need to produce here i have written okay 40000 units you need to produce so production budget is ready you started with sales budget you have added closing stock of finished goods you have reduced opening stock of finished goods your production budget is ready now let's say that so called production budget is 40000 units okay production run is 1000 units which means in one run you can manufacture 1000 units which means you need 40 runs so 40 runs means you need number of setups 40 setups cost per setup is 5000 per setup so therefore from this you will calculate setup cost budget or you will understand like that this is only one example like setup cost you'll have so many other things inspection material requisition machining so many so many other things are there like that all the overhead cost budget will be calculated then you will add direct cost budget which is nothing but direct material direct labor direct expense then you will get total cost budget as per abb are you able to understand see one example i've given like that i have gave you setup example over here it can be machining it can be inspection it can be material equation or able to understand it can be anything so this is the way you will fix your budget as per abb i gave you one example uh, same logic will be applied for all other overhead cost as well right Shala. So what else you have got abc in advanced manufacturing environment uh this uh, we have already discussed okay you can just read it yourself nothing uh, special over here you can just pause the video and then you can read this okay just slow slow it down right you can just pause the video and then you can read it nothing important over here or if you have got the hard copy of the power notes you can just read it directly from that right chala now let's come on to the last topic of this particular chapter kaizen budgeting already i hope you guys know the idea of kaizen costing kaizen costing means you will try to reduce your cost bit by bit a very small portion like for example a very small percentage like 0 0.0001 percent over a period long period of time so that in in reality after a long period of time suddenly you will see that you have saved a very good amount of cost that's what we call it as kaizen costing anyways now what is kaizen budgeting it indicates management's commitment to small continuous and organized cost reduction that's what kaizen costing is also but here in budgeting you will implement that particular logic say for example cost per delivery is thousand january month you have prepared the budget now for february month how will you prepare the budget 99.6 percent of january month's cost of january month's cost then the cost per delivery budget for feb will be 996 or able to understand this is not actual cost you see here i've put the arrow mark budgeted activity cost so february month you have reduced it by 0.4 percent again next month you reduce it by 0.4 percent again next month you reduce it by 0.4 percent all these are budgeted cost not the actual cost so that's why it is called as kaizen budgeting because same kaizen costing concept you are implementing in budgeting this motivates the managers to seek out cost reduction that's why it is called as kaizen budgeting very simple there is a problem also on this very simple this logic if you follow the problem also will be done you got the point and finally abc as a decision making tool that is activity based costing it helps you to measure your cost to find out accurate cost per unit we know this already because it helps you to eventually find accurate overhead cost per unit precise overhead cost per unit automatically total cost per unit also will be accurate so if you are a price setter your selling price will be accurate we have seen this already abc also helps you in product line profitability which means which prof product really gives you exactly true profit 
you will be able to identify only because of ABC. That also we have discussed. In decision making chapter revision itself, we have seen this indirectly. I don't know whether you remember this or not. It also helps you in expanding decisions where you want to expand your factory, you want to expand a new distribution center, you want to take that make or buy decision or you want to take a decision whether to expand or not, ABC will help you. So there's a general drive theory sentence, that's it. So ABC as a decision making tool, okay, that's it. So we're done with this particular chapter, okay. I hope you guys have enjoyed this particular revision. This is a rapid, rapid revision, Nana. So uh, one, one and a half hour only we'll spend on each chapter. And that way only we'll be able to com complete as many chapters as possible. I hope uh, you guys are, uh, you know, uh, getting good amount of uh, utility from these revision lectures. Uh, thank you so much, guys. That's it from my side. This week is our classes. Let's wind up the session. Bye-bye. Hello guys, ready? All of you. So now what we're going to do is that we're going to revise lean system and innovation. And after that, we'll go for problems. Are you able to get me? Yes, all of you. If you're ready, we'll start. I'm doing this for you only. Okay. Uh, right. So have participate and then we're going to revise it together. Got it? It's going to take some time because we have a lot of concepts to cover, right? We'll go slowly. We'll revise everything and then we'll move on. I hope you guys remember whatever you have studied. Okay. If you revise, you'll remember. Okay. Chalo. So first of all, before we get to the chapter, important chapter or unimportant chapter? Important, right? Why? Because 10 marks on an average every attempt you'll get from this chapter. Okay. After that, we have seen the bird's eye view. Now, can you please tell me what is the bird's eye view of this chapter? JIT. JIT Kaizen Costing 5S TPM Total Product to Maintenance Cellular Manufacturing Six Sigma BPR Business Process Reengineering. So it's always good to remember what are all the topics we have in a particular chapter. Okay. After that, first we started with introduction to lean system. Okay. First, don't look into the notes. Just let's discuss. Lean system means what? It's all about waste minimization without sacrificing two things productivity quality right and so first of all we need to understand what is a waste we did understand that what is a waste any yeah any step or an action or process which is not at all required to complete the you know production of a particular product are you able to understand successfully yes complete the production of a particular product successfully we call it as what waste after that we have seen that there are se so from that definition we have understood that the yeah the definition of waste is a little bit broader okay so as you can see it is any step or process or action that is not required to complete a product successfully after that we have seen seven different types of waste we categorize them into two one is four into one category three into another category correct four is during the production process and three is after the production process so during the production process what are the ways that we're gonna face first one is over processing are you able to get me which means processing more than what is required in other words we can call it as non-value added activity and you want to eliminate them right generally everybody wants to eliminate them okay next motion when i say motion see both of these are motions only motion waste but this motion belongs to equipment and people. This motion belongs to product. Ultimately, whether it is equipment or it is people or it is product, when you are moving unnecessarily than what is required for the completion of successful product is a waste. So here under this motion, equipment and people have come. Under this transportation means unnecessary transportation of that product, product has come. So ultimately, anything can move. Anything that moves unnecessarily is a waste. You got the point? Next, finally, waiting. So whenever there is difference in speeds of different, different machines, eventually what happens? One particular process can be faster. The other particular process can be slower. So therefore, you will always find WAP stock before the slowest machine, which will be waiting. And that waiting is also what, Nana? Waste. WAP products waiting for next production step is a waste. So all these four happens 
during the production process and there are three which happens after the production process what are they over production over production means what producing more than what is required are you able to understand next inventory having more inventory than what is required so having a stock is not a problem but having more stock than what is required is a problem are you able to understand here also over production means it doesn't mean that probably maybe it exactly should tally with the sales that's not the concept over here according to the calculations that a particular company makes how much should be the production beyond that if you are producing everybody has planned that we should produce 400 units you produce 430 then that 30 is over production that is the logic got it finally defects not getting things right the first time therefore you have to rework on it and that itself is a waste are you able to get me bol re right now one more time tell me what are the seven different types of waste we have got four during the production process three after the production process what are the four during the production process over processing motion transportation waiting correct and after that we have got three after the production process what are they over production inventory defects got the point very easy chalo after that we have seen characteristics of lean manufacturing that is this whole chapter in itself right first it is pull processing are you able to understand i already told you what is pull processing right we have seen a diagram as well there are two ways of producing goods or product one is push the other one is pull so in push model what happens you start with the vendor first of all you will do your research and then you will try to figure out that you have ultimately came out with a particular product which you think that society will need are you able to understand and after that you will start you know having forecast you know that okay this much of advertisement if i do then these many units i can sell if these many units i can sell then this is what i have to manufacture which means this is a what the raw materials i have to buy from the vendor and then you will start buying from the vendor based on your forecasting right your forecast and then the raw metal comes process one will work on that raw metal convert that into wip from there it will send to what it will be sent to process two then it will work on it it will be converted into another wip and then finally it will be sent to process three then eventually you'll get the finished good once you get the finished good this finished good will be pushed into the market by some advertising or marketing by the company that we call it as what nana push model because this guy pushes to this guy this guy pushes to this guy this guy pushes to the market the finished good that's why it is called push model got it so pull model means basically you don't do anything right at the beginning instead the customer comes and places the order say for example in a showroom from there immediately once the order is placed the last you know process or the division will assemble the small wip stock that it has got and immediately it will be delivered to the customer and after that what it will do immediately it will remove the kanban card over here once upon a time this what used to happen before the computerization right and that is a signal for this particular department which is process 2 or you know machine 2 to assemble its output which becomes the input for process 3 to immediately deliver and then immediately it will remove this card and that becomes a signal for p1 and p1 will immediately assemble its output and it will be delivered to p2 and then p1 will quote the order from what raw material or i mean uh, p1 will order the raw metal from the vendor or able to get me so this guy is actually pulling this guy p3 is pulling p2 p2 is pulling p1 p1 is pulling from the vendor that's why it is called as pull model that's why it is called as pull model are you able to get me bol re earlier these are physical cards but now they are replaced by computerized systems but still it is called with the same name now they call it as kanban authorization so this whole lean manufacturing is dependent on what nana pull processing after that we have seen what yeah because when it comes to jat you know there are no stock there is no raw metal stock there is no finished good stock little bit of wap stock will be there then continuous flow of production yeah it's not going to stop because even though it's pull system you feel that somebody is pulling from the outside but they will keep on ordering continuously these guys will keep on manufacturing so if you see it in your plain sight it feels that it is a push model only are you able to understand because in both the cases ultimately from here only na it has to travel 
Are you able to understand? So in general, when you imagine that they are happening continuously, both of them seem to be same. But the underlying structure is different. Are you able to get me? Right? Next. Zero waste time. Because the entire chapter, I mean, the entire intention behind this chapter itself is to what? Exactly. Reduce the waste without sacrificing productivity as well as quality. That's the whole intention of lean system and innovation. And finally, continuous efforts to find ways to reduce what? Process time. That is what we do it under Kaizen costing. Isn't it? Under Kaizen costing, we continuously try to find out ways where we can reduce what? Time or reduce cost or look out for improving some sort of process or efficiency, whatever it is. We always try to do that continuously. Isn't it? Is there a ceiling limit? When it comes to Kaizen costing, no. You just keep on improving for lifetime. Are you able to get me? So all these are characteristics of lean manufacturing. Okay. Then we have seen push model and pull model also. After that, we started with what, Nana? JIT. So what is JIT basically? We have seen the definition already. It is a collection of idea that streamlines a company production process to such an extent that all types of waste, including everything is eliminated that's the whole purpose of this chapter also you want to eliminate all types of waste that's why we started with waste we try to understand that there are seven different types of waste we try to understand what is waste and then only we started coming to jat got the point because the whole intention of this chapter is to eliminate the waste that's what jat also says but when it comes to jat we know that there are two types of jat jat production jat purchasing jat production we have already seen just now that is nothing but this diagram correct where UE a component will be produced only when it is required by the exactly each component of a production line is produced only needed for the next change for example here this guy will produce only when it is needed by P3 when he will know that it is needed by P3 when this card was removed and similarly this guy will produce only when it is needed by P2 when he will know that it is needed by P2 when this card is removed that's can when authorized now everything is yeah, through computer system, they'll get the signal and all that in the form of mail or whatever it is, whatever the kind of ERP systems they've got. Got the point? So that is nothing but this one. Okay, each component of a production line is produced only when it is needed for the next stage. What about JT purchasing? You'll purchase the raw metal in such a way that the timing of receipt of raw metal exactly matches with usage of raw metal. Are you able to get me? Bold and Anna, right. Till here it's clear. My throat is paining actually. Oh, cool. Chalo, ready? Yeah. Now let's move on to the next one. Okay. So now we have seen what is JAT production and JAT purchasing. So there are two aspects of JAT. Correct? After that, now let's try to understand JAT process clearly. So we can explain JAT through the following two processes. Okay. What is the first one? Imp impact one of the JAT will be on the supplier. Impact two of the JAT will be on the production facility that is within our company, within our factory. First, let's try to understand this. What is the first impact on the supplier? In what way it's going to impact? So let's start with impact one due to JAT. So in that step one is our purchasing department staff, they will go to the supplier. They will investigate whether the supplier can supply the requisite materials on the requisite date at the requisite time. Are you able to understand without any failure can he provide us some sort of assurance does he have any sort of previous work experience in this area did he uh, you know join with some other company in the area of JAT where he has to supply more number of times raw metal in a single day are you able to understand and was he able to deliver high quality raw metals which is the most important prerequisites you remember that one of the prerequisite of JAT is what defective free raw materials are you able to understand so whether he can do all these things that will be verified by our purchasing department staff are you able to get me yes once that is done then our engineering staff will visit the supplier factory and then they will evaluate how is his production process what is the quality of his output if if it is of desired quality it's fine if it is not of desired quality then what they will do they will assist them to enhance their quality better because our quality of i mean our output quality depends upon the raw metal input quality which we get from the supplier therefore our engineering staff will go there and they will also provide some assistance what assistance engineering assistance to increase the standard of raw metal because quality of raw metal is better then the quality of the finished goods also will be better 
once you get this certification and this certification one is the certification or approval from our purchasing department that yes this supplier can be trusted he can deliver any number of times at a given place and a given time with the requisite quantity are able to understand and then the quality is also certified by the engineering staff then what we'll do company now will go with the agreement with the supplier and then they will install a system that automatically notifies supplier the time date and place on which the raw material is needed which is nothing but edi where in our company in our factory whichever machine whichever production floor it is in what components does it need on what time what date how many single component multiple components everything will be updated to the supplier on real time basis are you able to understand through edi edi is nothing but electronic data interchange after that the final step is supplier directly sends the material to the production facility suppose fourth floor third machine straight away it will go and land over there there will be no inspection without inspection how all these things are possible because already our engineering staff has certified the quality of the raw metal therefore no need for us to do inspection then if you don't do the inspection how would you know how many raw metals you have purchased when the raw metal comes from the supplier directly to the production floor for that we know the solution that is back flushing we have already learned that we will see that again okay next for this to happen the most important thing is the location of the supplier must be nearer to the production facility because he has to supply many number of times in a single day so this is the first impact are you able to get me and the second impact is on production facility so let's have a look into that now in that we have seen that generally manufacturing companies will have this worry of setup cost setup cost will generally be heavy so they want to reduce the setup cost for that generally what they'll do they'll go for long production run so long production runs means what nana for example suppose your output is 1000 units and your production run is 100 units which means once you start the machine it will manufacture 100 units after that it will stop and then again you need to set it up for another run and that is called we we call it as what setup time and then it will run for another 100 units then it will stop and then you need to set it up then it will run for another 100 units it will stop so that continuous run we call it as production run in one production run it can manufacture 100 units what is the total output 1000 which means how many runs you need 10 how many runs will be needed that many setups will be needed and per setup let's say the cost is 5000 which means the total setup cost right now is how much 50000 now the company is really worrying about this particular setup cost so they want to reduce it are able to get me they want to reduce it so now how do they reduce it they reduce the setup cost by going for long production run so what do you mean by long production run more units per production run instead of 100 units per run they go for 200 units per run in that case instead of 10 runs they need only 5 runs anyway per setup the cost will remain constant so it's going to be 5000 so instead of 50000 it's going to be what 25000 this way we reduce the setup cost but this has got a problem how many problems three problems very good so problems due to long production run first problem is too many products are made too frequently therefore it might lead to product obsolescence and that will that will be a waste right too much inventory means too much carrying cost earlier i was having 100 now i'm having 200 obviously more inventory more inventory carrying cost then more defective products are you able to understand why because if the downstream machine operator that is the next machine downstream machine operator unless he comes and works on the output of the upstream machine operator how will you know how many defects you have made are you able to get me yare that is one thing here the problem is instead of 100 because of the long production run now you are manufacturing 200 So when you are manufacturing 200, automatically the defects will be more. Proportionately, it will increase, obviously, isn't it? All right. And then, before you get communication from the downstream machine after, I mean, downstream machine operator after working through the pile of WIP stock and then communicating you that there has been a defect, you would have again manufactured another 200, correct? Uh, instead of 100. So therefore, defects also will be more. since problem is not identified until more units are manufactured earlier it used to be 100 by the time you identify the problem now it's going to be 200 by the time you identify the problem so now all these problems has to be solved but at the same time our target of reducing the setup cost also should happen therefore we found the solution as per jd what is the solution ana videotape setup 
As per videotape, basically what happens? A recorded videotape of setup work by workers will be examined by industrial engineers and machine users spotting errors and gradually eliminating unnecessary steps. Optimum setup time can be achieved after a good number of iterations. So what they do basically, they ask you to work and they sit, they record each and every aspect of the work. And after that, what they will do? They will analyze each and every steps through repeated iterations, which means doing the same thing again and again. And all the unnecessary steps will be what? Eliminated. So in real life, uh, setup time as high as 90 minutes has been brought down to 15 minutes also. In real life, that has happened. Now that's, it's surprising to hear, but that's how it has happened. Okay. So if you can do this videotape setup, then eventually what happens? Your setup time reduces. Say for example, because your setup cost is proportionate with the setup time, right? So greater the time you take to set it up, greater will be the setup cost. Are you able to get me? Yes. Earlier, let's say you are taking one hour and your setup cost is 5000 per setup. Now, because of the videotape, suppose if you are able to do the same in 30 minutes, then for 30 minutes only the setup cost will be there, which can be what? Exactly. Are you able to understand? Which can be? Half. For one hour, it is 5000. So 30 minutes, it can be 2500, which means now even though there are 10 production runs and 10 setups, but the cost will be 10 into 2500. It's going to be how much? 25,000 only. So you did not compromise on anything else. You kept the production run small, still it is 100 units, but your cost has got reduced. So these three problems are solved right now, correct? Because of videotape. But videotape creates another problem. So what is that particular problem? Yeah, because of the videotape, you have reduced your setup time. So therefore, that particular machine whose setup time has got reduced, it will become faster and the other machines will eventually become slower. So therefore, ultimately, because of the difference in operating speeds of these machines, what will happen? The WIP inventory will get piled up be before the slowest machine. And once WAP inventory or stock gets piled up, it creates two problems. One is, first of all, having a stock itself is a problem because you need to have carrying cost. You need to incur carrying cost, right? Other thing is what, Nana? Too many, too many WAP stock will be manufactured. And in that, if there are defects, as I told you already, unless the downstream operator comes and works upon the pile of stock that we upstream operator has got created, I will not know that there has been a defect unless I know I'll not be rectifying it or able to understand. So by the time he works through this, I would have created even more number of units because still now I don't know that I've created what defects and that's a big loss for the company. Defects is a loss, isn't it? Now again, this problem can be solved in two ways. One, Kanban authorization to cellular manufacturing. Kanban authorization, I already told you how to do that. Very simple. Yeah, suppose machine one, machine two, and machine three. Machine one is upstream, machine two is downstream for machine one. Machine two is upstream for machine three, but machine two is, yeah, that's what, upstream for machine three, but machine two is downstream for machine one. Are you able to understand? So totally I've got three machines, M1, M2, M3. Are you able to understand? So this is upstream, this is downstream, correct. For machine three, this is upstream and machine three for machine two is what? Downstream. Are you able to understand? Yes. All right. So now what happens in uh, Kanban authorization, unless the downstream machine operator authorizes you to manufacture, you will not manufacture. So which means if I manufacture, I manufacture only after getting authorization from the next machine. Therefore, if I manufacture immediately, he'll take from me. Therefore, there is no question of WAP getting piled up between me and him, between upstream machine and the downstream machine. Got the point? This is one solution. What was the second solution? Cellular manufacturing. So here what happens? You break down the entire traditional manufacturing and you convert that into cells. Normally, reverse U-shaped cells, that is preferred. Cell means what? A single operator will operate multiple machines right from raw material stage till finished goods stage. Are you able to get me? Because one single operator in a single cell operates multiple machines right from raw material till finished goods, there is no question of WAP getting piled up. Are you able to get me? So that way we solve the problem of WAP, which has got created because of difference in speeds of machines, which got created because of reduction in setup time, which is because of videotape.
correct huh? so kanban cord is done cellular manufacturing means i already told you so this is the way we took this example what example uh, bread jam example and with that example i clearly explained you like for example this is the cell and you have the bread over here you have the toaster you have the cutting and you have the jab so ultimately our product is bread jam so what happens he takes the raw metal he puts it into the toaster already toasted bread will be cut and it will be jammed and the finished goods is ready and then again he'll take the toasted bread and then he'll cut it he'll jam it so this guy is taking care of three parts over here correct is there any chance of double ap here getting piled up between two mission operations right no why because single guy is taking care of it this we call it as what cellular manufacturing are you able to understand and of course one thing that your ICA study metal has missed is the most important guy in cellular manufacturing setup who is he water spider or mizusumashi okay so what he does he has a trolley he goes to a particular cell and if you don't have raw metal he puts the raw metal if you have finished goods he takes the finished good if there is any spare parts that is required he gives those spare parts components he basically keeps the mission alive he is like blood of this whole setup that makes the setup alive so what are the advantages of cellular manufacturing no need of big missions like in the case of traditional manufacturing you just need what small missions so there is no need of investment also small missions can easily be ready for customization so you can customize and do some different different products and it's easy to maintain it is not costly even a small mission operator with a little bit of training can happily what maintain those small missions are you able to understand not only that like this you'll have multiple cells like 100 cells or 200 cells or 500 cells so if you have seasons or unseasons you can easily switch off some 500 cells you need not keep them operational you can only operate 50 percent of the cells and still you can work there's a lot of flexibility involved and that's why cellular manufacturing is the next big thing in manufacturing in the world got the point bull ray all right so we are done with that as well then after that we have seen some important points for cellular manufacturing benefits due to cellular manufacturing there is no inventory build up obviously because only one guy takes care of everything where is the question of wap getting piled up next since one operator is responsible for all the missions responsibility towards quality increases because he is more excited he is more committed now right defective output can be identified easily because he can easily see right because he is the one who is taking care of everything and because the missions are very small it's easy to maintain since missions are small it is easy to customize them as well that's what we are talking about reconfiguration over here so that you can make a little bit of different products but with the big missions that's not possible for us as per traditional manufacturing because the machine itself would have costed 10 crores 5 crores and something like that got it but if you want this to happen in traditional manufacturing what was your labor doing he was just part and parcel of a big mission and he was doing a small job of operating the mission repeatedly every single day correct but then once the cellular manufacturer has come into picture he has to operate multitude of missions which means multiple missions and not only operate he also needs to maintain it clean it lubricate it tight the nuts and bolts identify the crabs that this and all those things for that definitely he needs training are you able to understand and you as a company should take the responsibility and teach them to perform limited maintenance and uh, without the need of what a maintenance department frequently there will be need but only for complex repairs and how to spot and fix the errors then and there itself are you able to get me care all right also one important point that we have seen after that was these two solutions for WAP problem, which is Kanban authorization and cellular manufacturing can be implemented together, which will be even more stronger. And I explained you with the help of a diagram. Correct. So Kanban and cellular manufacturing should be worked together to achieve extremely low WAP inventory and defects. As you can see, first series of cells, correct where engine is there and then they are manufacturing engines over here in this series of cells and then carry next department where they are manufacturing interiors or suspension just for understanding i just try to keep it simple okay where here you are manufacturing those things right and then next series of cells where you'll be manufacturing body and chassis of the car are you able to understand when this guy orders then this guy will give the interiors and suspension as the input for him and when this guy orders then this guy will give engine and suspension as input for him but that was made based on what 
cellular manufacturing and this entire process works with kanban authorization thereby on one side cellular manufacturing is happening on another side kanban authorization is also happening simultaneously are you able to get me yes kanban authorization means you already know what is kanban authorization upstream machine will not manufacture until you get authorization from the downstream machine so here this is upstream this is downstream for the first one and this is downstream for this one and for this one for series of cells 3 this becomes upstream so unless you get the authorization from this machine this machine will not manufacture unless you get authorization from this machine this machine will not manufacture are you able to get me that's kanban authorization and the way they are manufacturing is by following cellular manufacture so both of them has been integrated beautifully together got the point yes uh, after that we try to learn a very interesting topic what is that vendor managed inventory technique what is this concept very simple you allow your supplier to get full information about your number of units sold number of units in the warehouse or able to understand on real time basis so he will have the access of our information who supplier why are you giving him access because this will help supplier to manage the inventory by anticipating demand and refilling accordingly which means he is going to take care of your inventory completely that's why you are giving him access so hereafter you are not going to manage the inventory for that i told you the logic what is the logic probably he likes he's expert in that particular area just like how uh, there is something called factoring where you try to sell your data asked to somebody because he's he's got expertise in that area where he will start what collecting from the data same logic applies here also probably he is expert in that area when it with, with respect to what inventory management when come back to us so this is called as the vendor managed inventory technique carry it also helps you in achieving target cost why because of that your cost is going to get reduced probably if you do something on your own it will cost you 70 he can do it within 50 because he's he has got expertise and he takes some 10 rupees profit and charges you 60 still it is beneficial for you correct uh, otherwise it would have costed you 70 i'm just trying to tell you in a simple number language you got the point right but if you go for the so-called vendor managed inventory technique there are some challenges that a firm may face in implementing this what are those challenges that should be kept in mind first one entire production process should be detailed to your vendor and integrated how to know material requirement at each assembly stage only if you detail him very clearly then only he'll be able to manage your inventory perfectly or you will understand otherwise once he doesn't know how your manufacturing process happens how much time it's going to take to convert the raw material into finished goods if he doesn't have a clear-cut idea of how your manufacturing process happens then he will not be able to manage your inventory or you will understand that's why you have to give him clear information second since there is heavy dependence to put on the vendor agreement with the vendor with penalty is very important because in case if he does some sort of a mistake and if you go out of stock which means he is not able to manage your stock or he does some sort of a mistake he does some sort of a mistake then you will be the one who will be paying the penalty correct because you will be dissatisfying your customer and things will go sideways isn't it and that loss what we're gonna face there either directly or indirectly we'll try to recover from the vendor and that's why we need to have a penal clause are you able to get me yes and finally even after implementation there should be continuous improvement and leadership support from what top management they should keep on talking with the vendor and see everything is in place you should keep that relationship moving got it fantastic next after that another interesting concept that we have seen what is that due to change from push system of manufacturing to what pull system of manufacturing because it's exactly opposite your entire accounting system also needs change the first change is due to large number of shipments earlier in push system hardly used to get 10 shipments in a year but now you're getting everything i mean a shipment a day which means in a month 30 shipments 40 shipments are you able to understand therefore it's very difficult for the account staff to go through the large pile of accounts payable framework sorry paperwork are you able to get me so therefore what they can do a simple solution could be just ask them to wait till the end of the month and prepare a consolidated report and make the payment accordingly you got the point or even to make the case worse sometimes there is even worse thing that could happen that is there is no receiving payable which means you are not at all recording how many raw metals are coming inside your company directly the order is going through edi from your requisite machine from your requisite production floor where the manufacturing is happening directly to the 
supplier on real time basis and he directly comes and delivers on to the production floor in front of the machine and goes away so nobody is taking note of anything that's happening how many raw materials have come in how many has been consumed blah 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 nothing are you able to understand so therefore it means supplier deliver parts directly to the production floor to the particular machine on specific date and time so in that case how would you know how many units of raw material you have consumed you have got from the supplier maybe some of you might say that okay get that information from the supplier that's not something that is reliable right because we also need to get confirmation from our side so therefore what we do we do something called back flushing we do something called now the next question is what do you mean by back flushing well the answer is very simple in a particular day suppose our company works till 5 o'clock in the evening we wait till 5 o'clock after 5 the working of the company is done okay so what we do is that we send our person we ask him to count the finished goods physically or he will count it and he will put the information into the system which will get it eventually once we know how many finished goods has been actually manufactured you take that information you put inside the system and you multiply that with bill of materials which will tell you how many components or raw materials should have been consumed for the requisite amount of finished goods that has got manufactured now you will get theoretical amount of raw materials that should have got consumed for that you will do some normal scrap adjustment eventually based on that you will make the payment to the supplier are you able to get me that we call it as what back flushing so that also we have seen got the point Anna? so this approach implies that there is no need for suppliers to send invoices also and i gave you a small example this fair and fair whole square cream and this is how a bill of materials look like on a lighter note you got the point so we try to make it a little bit fun uh, funny yeah okay got it bull ray but it's not all good when it comes to back flushing right first of all there are four different types of risk when you go for back flushing in order to find out how many raw metals you should have got consumed it's theoretical only na? it's not real raw metals that you have actually consumed the first problem is your production can be inaccurate then automatically everything will be inaccurate second problem is scrap sometimes can be abnormal you would have made adjustment for normal scrap but not for abnormal scrap then inventory accuracy can be a problem as well so you may not count properly right lot tracing also can be a problem suppose your finished good has got some sort of a problem then you don't know from which raw material lot it has led to the problem presuming that your manufacturing process is correct so that only problem is with the raw metal received from the supplier and tracing back that raw metal where something wrong has happened will become impossible because of this setup are you able to understand yes that's it after that we have seen what features of jat features of jat means ah we know material handling cost is reduced why all the materials are handled by the supplier right labor idle time gets reduced why because now your employees are trained to even operate and maintain the machine thereby they are doing maintenance operations everything as a result probability of machine breakdowns have got reduced which means machines are not frequently breaking down when there is no breakdown there is no idle time for the labor because they'll not sit idle they'll always keep working correct uh, therefore labor idle time also gets reduced eliminate defects asap that i told you because of the pull system definitely we need to eliminate defects as soon as possible and you also know that one of the prerequisite of jat is what nana t q m so automatically defects will go away and of course because of jat you'll be able to respond to customer demands faster because you have reduced your setup time with the help of with the help of videotape exactly right and there are still small production runs therefore you'll be able to manufacture faster and respond faster at the same time by reducing setup time so it's like best of both the worlds you got the point these four are the features of jat that we have seen then we have got something called prerequisites of jat means what these points are compulsory if at all you want to implement jat successfully first one is low variety of goods why only if the variety of goods is low only then we'll be able to maintain that wap inventory limited and then we'll be able to what maintain the quality and consistency we'll be able to assemble them and then deliver just like kfc and mcd unlike our restaurants where they have a big menu card it's very difficult for you to maintain quality are you able to understand right next vendor reliability of course he is the core he is the core right of the entire jat setup good communication the communication between departments as well as from the lower level management and the top level management where these guys can get some ideas which has to be communicated to the top level management and that is important in this sort of a setup which setup pull setup especially jat right 
demand stability jt can be successfully implemented only if your demand is stable if you have a fluctuating kind of demand because we are running on no inventory model it's impossible for us to you know match with those high flexible uh, match with those high fluctuations you got the point tqm i told you already because in jt in pull system of manufacturing after getting the order only we start manufacturing therefore we don't have the buffer or freedom to manage defects so we should be defect free therefore before we implement jt tqm should have got implemented successfully then defect free materials obviously we need that that's why we select the supplier by sending our engineers to ensure that his raw metal is of requisite quality and they are defect free we have already seen that and preventive maintenance that we have just now we have completed total productive maintenance where we have seen that if you do preventive maintenance for your machines your machines will not have unexpected breakdowns plus your machines output quality also will be better are you able to get me so these are all your prerequisites of jt impact of jt we know because of jt waste cost gets reduced we know that obviously isn't it defects are getting reduced you know rework is not happening with respect to many of the products isn't it lot of waste unnecessary transportation of employees are not there equipments are not there products are not there. all different types of waste is getting reduced there is no ore production there is no ore processing bol re ore it also gets reduced we have seen it in the example in case of setup cost even material handling cost is getting reduced because you are not at all handling any material everything is handled by the supplier that is also ore product prices gets increased how your quality has got increased if therefore you deserve a better price obviously because your defects has got reduced okay then we have seen some performance measurements in jat not in jat some famous performance measurements as per traditional manufacturing which will not work in jat you got the point and there we have seen machine utilization rate because in traditional manufacturing we used to buy big big machines like 10 crores 5 crores therefore when you have invested 10 crores in a machine your human psychology will be what uh, we need to ensure that the machine is being used to the fullest therefore machine utilization rate used to be a means of performance measurement system but in jat that doesn't work because here we are talking about small machines next piece rate tracking how many output you will manufacture more than the target that much of bonus for you once upon a time as per traditional manufacturing but now first of all when it comes to jat we will not manufacture unless there is an order so here if you do over production more pieces you are not what rewarded in fact you will be punished actually so this also doesn't work in jat next direct labor efficiency tracking efficiency tracking itself is considered as non value added activity by default he should be efficient create such a kind of system give him some incentive such that even if you don't track him still he'll work efficiently you keep some incentives automatically he'll work there will be motivation yes after that we have seen performance measurement in a jt how to measure whether jt has been implemented successfully or not the performance measurement is good first one is turnover has got should have got increased setup time should have got reduced customer service should have got better because now we are responding faster customer complaint should have got reduced because there are no defects there are no problems quality has got improved ideas generated should be more from the lower level of the management scrap should have got reduced because we know waste will get reduced cost of quality would have got increased because obviously you are improving the quality right obviously cost of quality will increase because quality is not free yes all of you right finally we have seen some advantages and disadvantages due to jat so the plus points are savings in insurance because now you will take insurance of what no stock no insurance no stock no need of warehouse no stock no need of inspection and your working capital gets reduced minus points no stock there is a chance of stock out so because of that you lose some contribution because you have lost an opportunity to sell and sometimes what happens because in jat depending upon the demand you will start manufacturing sometimes your demand can be greater than your production capacity in that case you need to work overtime and then satisfy the demand where you have to pay 50% extra at least and that's a negative point that's a cost and of course increased procurement cost because in jat you going to order more number of times earlier let's say it's going to be 10 orders now you're ordering hundreds of times yes so more ordering cost not only that you have to pay some premium on per unit raw metal cost because of jat why supplier has to supply better quality raw metal he has to supply more amount of times on all this you know sacrificing is he is doing right on our behalf we are not maintaining inventory he has to maintain because he has to deliver whenever we ask then he will be incurring 
मोर वर्किंग कैपिटल कॉस्ट सो दैट ही विल गेट फ्रॉम अस ओनली ना देयर फॉर इवेंचुअली व्हाट हैपेंस रॉ मेटल कॉस्ट विल बी लिटिल बिट मोर प्रीमियम वंस यू इंप्लीमेंट जेटी विद योर सप्लायर गॉट इट स्पेशली दिस कांसेप्ट व्हाट वी हैव सीन द प्लस पॉइंट्स एंड माइनस पॉइंट्स इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर सॉल्विंग प्रॉब्लम्स गॉट इट सो विद दिस वी आर डन विद रिवीजन ऑफ जेआईटी हो गया Hello friends welcome to PK sir classes i hope you guys are preparing well for your uh, exams uh earlier i have posted the important questions video i would like to clarify again that uh, i have posted the questions from my workbook okay and all these questions are from icse study material so if you are my student you already have the answers with you if you are not my students very simple just open your study material you will find all the questions maybe the order will not be the same but all the questions you will find eventually okay so that should not be a problem that way you can get the help out of those important questions and prepare your examination accordingly right anyways the moment i have posted that video in that i have announced that i mean i have told that uh, this particular question is very important the first question which is about strategic profitability analysis of this particular chapter that is a strategic uh, saw a strategic analysis of operating income and many students have messaged me saying that sir this is a very uh, you know complicated topic for us we were not able to you know remember all these formulas it is pretty cumbersome so that is the reason i'm posting this video immediately so i'll tell you one thing no need to study any of this okay whatever that has been given here in your icse study matter all this formula this formula this one okay this one this one this one this one and even this okay that's okay it's just a pro forma of uh, reconciliation okay you need not study any of this are you able to understand i'll tell you why okay we'll try to finish it off in a pretty simple way okay right chalo now see here see the concept is pretty simple listen carefully any variance okay you take any variance whether it is material variance or uh, you know labor or sales or whatever it is any any item any expenditure item or any income item maximum it will have three angles maximum the word that i have used is maximum which means uh, it can be two it can be one as well so there are only three possibilities either it will have one angle or two angles or max three okay they are one is growth perspective or we can say three perspectives as well other one is price perspective growth perspective price perspective and productivity perspective you should remember all the different names for this productivity can also be called as efficiency productivity perspective can also be called as efficiency perspective price can also be called as price recovery are you able to understand growth can also be called as volume growth can also be called as volume perspective okay anyways now having said that now let's try to recollect all the variances that we know definitely it should fall under any of these three categories that's the logic which i've told you correct so which means you take any variance max it should have three or it can have one or two or three correct now let's go with uh, all the variances that we know already for example let's start with material variance okay now tell me so first material price variance it falls under what price recovery let me call it as pr this one price recovery as pr volume as v productivity or efficiency as uh, pd okay anyway so material price variance is nothing but price recovery so this is not a new variance it is the same variance that we going to call it with a different name or you able to understand i'm just trying to make it very simple for you what about material usage variance it is productivity or we can also call it as efficiency correct how efficiently you use your raw materials isn't it next come to labor variance labor rate variance is nothing but is nothing but price recovery right labor efficiency variance is nothing but productivity or efficiency correct come to variable overheads variable overhead expenditure variance is nothing but price recovery variable overhead efficiency variance is nothing but productivity or efficiency got the point next fixed overhead variance fixed overhead expenditure variance is nothing but price recovery again and you know fixed overhead volume variance name itself tells you that it is volume then come to sales variance sales price variance is nothing but price recovery and sales volume variance is nothing but volume or you can also call it as growth are you able to understand okay so it's pretty simple so it means 
what I have done here is that I have put all the variances which we already know and I called it with a different name. That's that's all. The whole concept is that simple. So we, we are just going to see it from a different angle, different perspective. That's all. They are not altogether new. But yes, there are certain new things that you have to remember. What is that? When it comes to material, what we have seen in our general variances, in our normal variances or material price variance and material usage variance, correct? Whereas, if you are solving any question from the perspective of these three variances, what are these three variances? Growth volume, price or price recovery or productivity and efficiency. Then, even for material, there will be something called material growth variance. The moment you see this, you should not get terrified. Sir, what is this material growth variance? Sir, we haven't seen it uh, so far. It's new for us. It's not new. Little bit of common sense. Growth is nothing but volume. So when I say material volume variance, change in volume is nothing but material volume variance. What is change in volume? Very simple. You take budgeted material cost and you reduce standard material cost. What is the difference between budgeted material cost and standard material cost volume? Are you able to understand? What is the difference between budgeted material cost and standard material cost volume? Budgeted material cost is nothing but budgeted material cost per unit into budgeted output. Standard material cost is nothing but budgeted material cost per unit into actual output. If you take the budgeted raw material cost per unit, you multiply that with budgeted output, it will give you budgeted material cost. You take the same budgeted material cost per unit, you multiply that with actual output, it becomes standard. So to put it very simple, the difference is volume, which is nothing but growth variance. Same logic applies to labor also. Suddenly you see and you need to calculate something called labor growth variance. Okay, don't get terrified. Same logic. It is the difference between budgeted labor cost and standard labor cost, isn't it? Again, the logic remains the same. Budgeted labor cost means what? Budgeted labor cost per unit into budgeted output. Standard labor cost means what? Budgeted labor cost per unit into actual output. So the labor cost per unit remains the same, which is budget in both the cases. You multiply that with budgeted output, it becomes total budgeted labor cost. You multiply with actual output, it becomes standard labor cost. Same logic applies to variable overheads as well, which is nothing but we can call it as variable overheads growth variance or variable overheads volume variance. That's it. The entire concept is done. Whatever that has been given in your ICA in those initial pages, the entire concept is done. We have covered everything now. So which means except these three variances, all the other variances are something that we already know something that we have already learned in our standard costing chapter are you able to understand so material price variance is nothing but price recovery material usage variance is nothing but productivity and efficiency labor rate variance is nothing but price recovery labor efficiency variance is nothing but productivity or efficiency variable overhead expenditure variance is nothing but price recovery variable overhead efficiency is nothing but productivity or efficiency fixed overhead expenditure variance is nothing but price recovery sales price variance is nothing but price recovery and sales volume variance is nothing but volume or growth and of course, in addition to the existing variances, which we already know, there are three new variances that is material growth, labor growth and variable loads growth variance. How to calculate that? I told you, which is nothing but difference between budgeted cost and standard cost. There ends the matter. If it is material, budgeted material cost and standard material cost. If it is labor, budgeted labor cost and standard labor cost. If it is variable loads, budgeted variable loaded cost and standard variable loaded cost. That's it. So if you know this, your entire strategic profitability analysis concept is done. That's all. That's it. Are you able to understand? So here in all these formula, you already know the existing formulas, right? Use the same formula. That's it. And only new things that you're going to learn is only these three. For that also, I told you, I just told you the concept. No need to remember any formula. It is a difference between budgeted cost and standard cost. There ends a matter. That's all. For this, you already remember the formula, so you need not learn anything new once you know the standard costing, isn't it? Whichever the methodology you would have followed. Are you able to understand? All right? It doesn't matter because you know the answers for all these variances. That's it. We are done with it. So we can solve this particular sum. Now see, what is this question? Why Limited is a manufacturer of cardboard boxes. An analysis of its operating income between 2020 and 2021 shows the following. You got the income statement. 
then growth component, price recovery component and productivity component and you have got income statement. So this is the pro forma of how reconciliation statement looks like if you are calculating variances from these three perspectives that is growth, price recovery and productivity. So you got revenue, you got cost and you got operating income and they have got reconciled. I told you here itself that any variance, okay, maximum they'll have these three angles if you see them from these three perspectives, growth angle, price angle, productivity angle. Are you able to get me? That's what he has given in this particular question as well. So what is that he's trying to ask? Already he has done the reconciliation. He's again asking you that Y Limited has sold 4 lakh boxes and 4 lakh 20,000 boxes in 2020 and 2021. During 2021, the market for cardboard boxes grew 3% in terms of number of units and all other changes are due to company's differentiation strategy and productivity. Fine. What is that he's asking you? Compute how much of a change in operating income from 2021, I mean sorry, from 2020 to 2021 is due to industry market size, productivity and product differentiation. Right. Already he has done reconciliation of but 2020 income with 2021 income with the help of three things, growth component, price recovery component and productivity component. Now he is asking you to do the same reconciliation of income of 2020, which is 10 lakh 80,000 with income of 2021, which is 14 lakh 42,000, not with the help of these three, which is growth, price recovery and productivity, because that has been given in the question, but with the help of these three market size, productivity and product differentiation, which means this should be replaced with market size, right? Productivity will remain productivity only. In the place of price recovery, we'll be getting what? Product differentiation. So one is market size, other one is product differentiation. Pro productivity remains the same. So which means basically we'll copy paste the same number, isn't it? So how to start the answer? Very simple. You just put this pro forma, operating income of 2020, copy paste from the question, leave some three lines, operating income of 2021, copy paste from the question. Then here in the three lines, what you have to put market size factor will be one line, productivity will be another line, product differentiation will be another line, productivity you already know because that is there in the question 58,000, you put that 58,000 here, copy paste that, there it's a matter. Now we need to fill it up only two, I mean the rest two, one is market size, the other one is product differentiation. Now that is also very easy once you know the logic, if you can see here, he said uh, market size has grown by 3% in 2021 when compared to 2020, correct? So 2020 is how much? 4 lakhs, right? 4 lakhs into, it has got increased by how much? 3%, which means 12,000 units has got increased because of market size, correct? Here, if you can see, there is growth component that is given in the question. Growth means what? Volume. Growth means what? Volume. Total volume variance is how much? 1,40,000. How much is the change in volume? 4 lakhs to 4,20,000, lakh which means totally 20,000 units has got increased. And for that, the variance is how much? 1,40,000. That is a volume change. In that 20,000, 12,000 is due to whom? Market size. So therefore, market size variance will be how much? Take proportionate. 140,000 is for 20,000 units. Then for 12,000 units, it is how much? 140,000 into 12,000 divided by 20,000. Correct? So 140,000 into 12,000 divided by 20,000. 84,000 will be your market size. Done. Now, this can be put as balancing figure also, your answer will be fine, but you will not get marks because we have to show the working, right? So market size is done. So now tell me one thing, use your common sense. Sir, totally the volume has got increased by 20,000, sir, from 4 lakhs to 4 lakh 20,000. In the 20,000 increase in volume, 12,000 is due to market size. What about balance 8,000 that has got increased because of what? Very simple. What should be the only factor? What should be the only factor? Market size is done productivity is done, what should be the only reason? Product differentiation. Like that also you can analyze or when you read the question itself, if you are smart enough, you should observe this number carefully. What is that? Revenue has got increased, favorable, which means you have sold at a higher price. Cost also has got increased. Ultimately, the net effect is favorable, which means you have invested in cost 
to make the product different and because you have made the product different you are able to sell it at a higher price and because you have made the product different not only you were able to sell it at a higher price but also you were able to sell more number of units are you able to understand so when you have seen this you should be able to get that logic which means your total sales has got increased by 20000 in this 12000 you were able to sell extra because of increase in market size which is uncontrollable reason which is not anything special we have we haven't done anything special as a company it's a natural thing outside our control which has happened market size has got increased our sales also has got increased how much to the extent of 12000 but the balance 8000 is due to making your product different therefore people has bought your product so which means what will be your calculation same 140000 into now 8000 units divided by 20000 units so 140000 into 8000 divided by 20000 56000 this will come under which one already we are done with two market size is done which is 84000 productivity is done copy paste which is 58000 so what is left over product differentiation under that this 56000 will come in addition to that this price recovery component is there right which is 164000 you were able to sell at a higher price why because of product differentiation you made the product different that's why you were able to sell at a higher price which means 164000 also will come under product differentiation only totally 164 plus 56 164 56000 220000 answer is done that's it you see it's very simple so only thing that you guys need to remember is that just remember this particular concept any variance will have maximum three angles so when you try to think about any expenditure you try to think this expenditure will it change because of change in growth will it change because of change in price recovery will it change because of change in efficiency like that you keep on thinking then you'll understand okay with respect to that particular expenditure item or income item whether we'll have all the three variances or we'll have any two okay any two it can be or we'll have only one either this or this or this Are you able to understand? So once you know that, you know what are all the variances you need to calculate because all these are the normal variances which we already know, except that now we are calling it with a different name. And these three are the only new variances that you have to take care of it. And then for that particular problem, the reconciliation has to be prepared in this particular pro forma in case if that particular problem comes in the examination. Are you able to get me? So that's it from my side. I hope this particular video has helped you guys and saved at least half an hour to forty-five minutes. says that you don't study all this uh, formula and by heart all those things not necessary okay just follow what i've told you in this video you should be good to go thank you so much guys if you really love this video and the efforts please like share so that many students will get benefited and all the best for your exams guys thank you